Well, hello, and welcome to the OTR Visual Podcast. I'm Mr. H. I'll be your host for this evening. Tonight, we've got another great detective grab bag for you. We've got some of your favorites. We've got yours truly, Johnny Dollar. We've got the adventures of Sam Spade and the new adventures of Nero Wolf. So we're in for an enjoyable evening for sure. But just before we get into the show, I do want to take a minute to tell you about the Johnny Dollar Club. Starting at just a dollar a month, you can help support the channel and help keep us on YouTube. The links for that are in the description below. And one other thing I'll mention is a new item in our Yours Truly Johnny Dollar collection on our Etsy shop. We've got the Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Action Pack Journal. So whether you're recording your Action packed expense account or recording the Action packed events of your day, or writing some action-packed poetry, this is the journal for you. The link for that is also in the description below. Well, now without any further ado, let's get on with our program. It's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy yours truly, Johnny Dollar, the adventures of Sam Spade, and the new adventures of Nero Wolf. And as always, thanks for tuning in. For your listening enjoyment, John Lund has... Johnny Dollar. Roger Stern, Dollar. Oh, hello, Mr. Stern. Got a job for you. Fine. Our company insures a Mr. Barney Rico. Oh, I know that name. He used to be pretty big in the rackets, wasn't he? Yeah, for the past seven years, he's been Mr. Eight Number One Citizen. Our company insured his life for 100000 He was killed yesterday. How? Oh. He was murdered. See Lieutenant Briggs at the 7th Precinct. He'll give you the details. Right. Briggs is an old friend. When can you leave? As soon as I pack a bag. <laughs> Mind if I break in a few seconds to discuss games with you? How many of you, when you were youngsters, ever tried to escape from the world of reality by playing cowboys and Indians or cops and robbers? Today's youngsters have added two more professions to the world of make-believe. Spacemen and G-men. And speaking of G-men, do you know where that name came from? Actually, it was used about 20 years ago by gangsters to describe members of our Federal Bureau of Investigation as part of the Department of Justice and acts as a kind of detective agency whose duty it is to track down those who break our federal laws. The FBI also does counterintelligence work in ferreting out spies and saboteurs. And here's an amazing fact about our FBI men. Despite the extreme dangers of their work, it wasn't until some 20 years ago that they were given the authority to carry guns. With no other weapon than courage, resourcefulness, and determination, they had to track down and apprehend dangerous racketeers and spies. Today, however, you will find that the typical FBI agent may be a lawyer, accountant, or specialist in some other profession but thoroughly trained in scientific police methods and handy with any type of weapon. Expense accounts submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Intercontinental Bonding and Indemnity, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Gino Gambona matter. Expense account item one, $24.98, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. I arrived at Grand Central, went directly to the hotel where I registered and called Lieutenant Arthur Briggs. I caught him on his way to lunch. He agreed to meet me in a small restaurant across from the precinct. Well, good to see you again, Johnny. Well, good to see you, Art. It's been a long time. Investigating the Rico killer, huh? Eh? Yeah. Why don't we order, and then you can tell me about it. But I know what I want. This is corned beef day. Good corned beef, real lean. Oh, that sounds Nancy? fine. I'll be right there, Art. How much is Rico insured for? 100000 The brother's the beneficiary. Uh-huh. Any idea who killed him? No, not yet. It's always tough when a guy's been in the racket, even if he's gone straight for a while. He used to be with a Gambona outfit, wasn't he? Yeah, you know how that Hi, Art. Well, hello, beautiful. Corned beef? Yeah, too. Coffee? Yeah, Johnny? Yeah, coffee. Two beef, two coffee, salad or soup? Just the corned beef for me. Yeah, I don't want salad or the soup. But sure. You putting on weight? You kidding? No, you're getting a little... I'm on a diet. 
Were you kidding? Yeah. Oh, just ask. I don't mind. Gee, that's going to make all the difference in the world. I still love it. All a big fat me? Gee. <laughs> me. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah, getting back to Rico. I was saying, I'm sure you know it. Any time a guy like Rico gets killed, it's tough to come up with the answer. Could be any one of a dozen guys he was in the racket with. You remember him at all? Yeah, he was the one who testified against Gambona. That's right. His testimony sent Gambona back to Sicily. Could have been any one of Gambona's mob, but she's been waiting for the chance. I don't know whether you remember or not, but at the trial, Gambona made it plenty clear that he'd get Rico sooner or later. What's happened to Gambona? He's still in Sicily. Rico did pretty well for himself after he went straight. Yeah, he did fine. Opened a string of barber shops, built himself a nice home. My brother's name is uh, Dave. Yeah, he manages the shop. What did he have to say? Well, uh, he's scared stiff. He didn't have anything to do with sending Gambona to Sicily, but he was in the outfit and pulled out when his brother did. He's in a panic. He hasn't got any idea who killed Barney? Well, if he does, he isn't saying, and I can't say I blame him. Well, after lunch, I think I'll have a talk with Dave. And he's probably at the main shop or at home. Hey, you are. Whoa, thanks. Beautiful. Lay enough for you? Looks great. Well, I'm glad something around here has got too much fat on it. Expense account item two, $3.55, lunch for Lieutenant Briggs and myself. After which, Briggs gave me Dave Rico's home and business address, and I left. Expense account item three, a dollar and forty-five cents, cab fare to Dave Rico's home, where I talked with his wife. She informed me that her husband hadn't returned from work yet and suggested I go to the main barber shop of the Rico chain. Expense account item four, a dollar and sixty-five cents, more cab fare from the Rico house to the barber shop on East 118th Street. It was after six when I arrived and the shop was closed. The interior was dark except for a light coming from a back room. I knocked on the door and waited. I was about to leave when I saw the figure of a man stagger into the darkened shop from the lighted back room. He stood for a moment framed in the doorway, one hand clutching his stomach. I banged on the door again and watched as the man pushed himself away from the door jam and started across the shop. Halfway to the front door, he slumped to the floor and lay still. I stepped back, picked the glass out near the door lock, reached in and opened the door. But by the time I got to the man's side, he was dying in a hurry. Call him, call him doctor, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. Who did it? No. Gumbo. He died looking up at the ceiling and holding his stomach where a knife had cut him almost in two. It was Dave Rico, and he named Gambona as his killer. I called Lieutenant Briggs. That's what he said. I asked him who did it, and he said Gambona. Well, that's crazy. Why? You know Gambona's in Sicily. You sure? Well, sure, I'm sure. I already know that. I keep a close check. Maybe he met Gambona's mob. A lot of them still around. Well, wouldn't he know them? Yeah, he'd know them. But he said Gambona. Well, I'll get a cable off the authorities in Sicily. In the meantime, what if Gambona is in town? deputy arrived, followed by the lab boys, and I went back down to the precinct. Briggs made his report to the chief, and a cable was sent to the proper authorities in Sicily. For the next few hours, we went through the mud and picked out all of Gambona's former associates who were still in town. One of them was a girl. Virginia Barrett. Used to be a steady thing with Gambona, wasn't she? Yeah. She's been a good girl, though. Got a job and stayed out of trouble. Well, worth checking. She sings. Not very good, but the joint she sings in doesn't expect anything great. Where is it? It's over on 34th Street. I've been in it a couple of times. What's the name of the place? Something again. Pirate. Yeah. Are you going to be busy for a while? Yeah. You want to say hello to Jimmy? Yeah, I thought I might. Well, let me know how you make out. Sure. If I run into Gambona, I'll give him your regards. Yes, sir. Do that. <laughs> Expense account item five. A dollar and seventy-five cents for still another cab from the precinct to East 34th Street in the Pirate Den. It was a small place set down below the level of the sidewalk and filled with enough smoke to keep the walls from falling in. Come in. 
I found a table near the back of the room and gave my order to a swollen-eyed waiter that looked like he'd been mixing salad on his apron. When I told him I'd like to talk to Virginia Barrett, he gave me a long look and then wandered off through the smoke. About five minutes later, Virginia Barrett appeared. You wanted to see me? Yeah. Won't you sit down? Ask you to tell me what you wanted to see me about. It's a personal matter. I'll preface it with a drink. You a cop? No. I'm thirsty, but I'm even more inquisitive. Heard from Gino Gambona lately? <laughs> Who are you? Johnny Dollar. Should I know you? No. Well, do you have the drink? Right. Now, what's all this about Gino Gambona? Have you seen him lately? You kidding? I'll say it another way. Have you seen him lately? Look, Gino got sent to Sicily a long time ago. I haven't been out of New York since the day I was born. Okay. But have you seen him lately? Look, mister. I just told you. I haven't seen Gino since the day he waved goodbye from Pier 47. I don't think I want to talk to you anymore. You read about Barney and Rico getting killed the other day? Dave Rico was killed this evening. Not too bad. Before Dave died, he named Gambona. You knew the Rico boys, didn't you? Long time ago. Now you'll have to excuse me. I go on in a minute. I'll wait. Okay, but don't hold your breath. She walked away looking worried and disappeared through a door on the opposite side of the room. I took a beat, then got up and crossed the room to the door and entered. On the other side, I found a small, dimly lit hall, and a rather large, muscle-bound man walked toward me. You looking for something? Yeah. I think you got the wrong view. I'm looking for Miss Barrett. Look in the other room. I have. Try again. Where'd Virginia Barrett go? She's probably in her dressing room, but that doesn't make any difference to you. Oh, you're wrong. Uh-uh. Now turn around and walk back in that room while you got the strength left. Get out of my way. It's like that, huh? Exactly. Okay. Friend, if anyone offers you a job as a bouncer, forget it. I left him lying in a corner and went down the hall, looking on the other side of doors for Virginia Barrett. But Virginia Barrett was somewhere else. I ran out into the alley behind the club just in time to see her climb into a cab on the other side of the street and pull away. Express account item six. A dollar twenty-five for another cab. We followed Virginia to a large apartment house on the west side of town. We parked a half block away. I watched her go in, then I followed. I went up the front steps of the building and looked at the mailboxes. Virginia Barrett's apartment was 203, but the front door had a night latch on it. I picked a name on a box. A Miss Adelaide Jones and buzzed it. Yes? Uh, Miss Jones? Yes, who is it? A uh, flower. Flowers? From the Ashley Forest. Flowers? The gentleman wanted them delivered immediately. Oh, really? Oh, wait a minute. Well, I was in. I found apartment 203 and started to knock. But sometimes when you get impatient, you get careless. I'd tailed Virginia Barrett, but I'd forgotten about the big boy I'd left sleeping it off in the back hall of the pirate's den. Obviously, he knew where Virginia could be found, and obviously, when he came to, he'd hurried right over. Because when I raised my hands and knocked, the big boy barged up the stairs and pointed his gun right at my dinner. Hold it. Oh, why, sure. You're a busy little fella, aren't you? I have to be, or I lose the game. Yeah? It's a treasure hunt. I have to bring back a pound of three-day-old rhubarb... The lapels are three opera capes and uh, a dozen assorted heads. I'd like to contribute. Well, every little bit helps. I can guarantee some broken bones. Now, about Gino Gambona. You never can tell. Go ahead and knock. Who is it? Marco. Well, good evening. What's he doing here? Go on, get in there. Found him in the hall. Gave me some trouble over at the club. He says he's not a cop. Who is it? That guy I was telling you about. Marco's with him. Well. Well, what? That's about all I can come up with. Your name's Dollar? Yeah. You know me? Yeah. Your name is Gino Gambona. <laughs> The 
Did you ever stop to realize that four American coins show us the importance of elections? The first one is the Washington Quarter. It was George Washington who reminded us that on the unity of our government depends our independence, our peace at home and abroad, our safety, prosperity, and our freedom. The second coin is the Jefferson Nickel. It was Thomas Jefferson who said, No government can continue good but under the control of the people. The third coin is a penny, bearing the likeness of Abraham Lincoln, who said, Among free men, there can be no successful appeal from the ballot to the bullet. And finally, the Roosevelt dime reminds us of something Franklin D. Roosevelt once said. Every man and every woman in this nation, regardless of party, who have the right to register and to vote, and the opportunity to register and to vote, have also the sacred obligation to register and to vote. These four Americans, by recognizing the importance of elections, added another page to your political history. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Gino Gambona stood in the middle of the room looking at me with a nasty smile, as though he'd just come up with a particularly funny way to kill me. Gino Gambona, one time Lord of the Underworld. By all rights, he should have been in Sicily, where the United States government had sent him for the rest of his life. But there he was. And there I was, wishing he wasn't. The big man Virginia Barrett had called Marco, shoved his gun in my spine, and prodded me over to an uncomfortable chair. Gambona held the nasty smile and walked slowly over to me. Who are you? Johnny Dollar. Well, the, the, the name don't mean nothing. Who are you? I'm a special investigator for an insurance company. We hold a policy on the late Barney Rico. Mm -hmm. His beneficiary was his brother. I don't know who insured him. Well, it looks like your company don't have to pay off to nobody. Looks that way, doesn't it? Tell me, uh, Johnny Dollar, how much uh, insurance you got? Just a small policy. I'm expendable. <laughs> I'm glad. Dave Rico named you before he died. Oh, really? Well, were you the guy pounding on the front door of his shop? What did you kill Dave for? I thought you just wanted Barney. Well, Dave's last name was Rico. But now, about you, Dollar. What am I going to do about you? Well, I could make a few suggestions, but I don't think you'd go for them. No, 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 no. I don't think so. Whatever it is, boss, let me, uh... Mm -hmm. You got pushed around a little, eh, Marco? I'll make up for it. Mm -hmm. You know, Dollar, it ain't uh, like the old days. Marco was one of my boys in the old days. On his toes, then. You couldn't have pushed him around then. Did you come all the way back here just to kill Barney Rico? No, 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 no. Of course not. I had something to get. And I couldn't trust nobody to get it for me. Not even my... <laughs> my little baby here. Are you, uh, you met Virginia, Dollar? Hmm, briefly. No, I, uh... I guess she's a, she's a singer now. You hear her sing? Let's stop playing around, you know. Mr. Gambona. Nobody calls me Gino, unless I like him. The police know you're in the States. Mm -hmm. They sent a cable to Sicily. But they ain't going to find out nothing that way. I got it all fixed. By the time they really go looking for me, I'll be back like uh, I never left. And who's going to say they saw me here? Money Rico? Dave Rico? You? Gino. Let's get this over with. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Marco. Cool this bum off. Take him for a drive down by the river. Sure. What about stuff? Well, me and Jeannie will pick it up and meet you. Now, get going. Get up. Well, it's a nice meeting you, Dollar. Charles, I'm sure. Come on. Move. <laughs> Followed me out of the room and we started down the stairs. 
suddenly on the upper landing, the most beautiful distraction I'd ever seen, shouted... Hi, you! And Marco turned his head for just a second. Oh, oh my goodness! Thanks. He had a gun! Yeah, he sure did. Well, I don't know what's going on here. I, I thought the man got some flowers for me. Someone called from downstairs and said he had some flowers for me. Uh, you see anyone with some flowers? No, honey. But I'm personally going to buy you a whole acre of orchids. I went back to Virginia Barrett's apartment, but Gino and Virginia had left a few steps ahead of me. I looked out of the window and saw a car pull away. Then I picked up the phone and called Lieutenant Briggs. Marco came, too, on the way to the precinct. And after we arrived, Briggs booked him and took him downstairs to the interrogation room. Where were you supposed to meet, Gambona? How was it? What was the stuff he was going to pick up? You tell me. Two men have been killed, Marco. Not that I know of. You were supposed to meet Gambona. Was I? He said so. I must not have heard him. I'm going to put two men on you every two hours. We won't get tired, but you're going to be miserable. I know the route. Where can we find him? You hear me, Marco? I hear you. Where can we find him? I don't know. Where are you supposed to meet him? I'm not. When did you get into town? I don't know. When did he contact you? He did. You're a liar. If you say so. How did you know where he was staying? As I did. Where were you when Barney Rico was killed? When was he killed? The morning of the 3rd. I was at home. You sure? Yeah. Where were you the morning of the 4th? I don't remember. What's that got to do with That's when Barney was killed. That's the 3rd. Did I? It was the 4th. Where were you? At home. You said you didn't know. I was at home. Both mornings? Yeah. <laughs> Get Gambona, I'm going to have someone for these killings. Well, what's it mean? Then give us an alibi. I told you. Did anyone see? No, no, I told you it was at my place. You said you were at the club. That was this evening. What about the morning of the third? You said the fourth. I said the third. At home. And the fourth. Yeah, yeah. At first you said you didn't know. Now, wait a minute. Lay off. What do you want to know? Where we can pick up Gambona. In his cigarette. Where were you supposed to meet him? Okay. Nuts to Gambona. Nuts to the ten grand. I'm bushed. I can't think anymore. What ten grand? Ten grand Gambona promised me to help him get in and out of the state. Where is he going to get ten grand? He's at a stash somewhere. Where? I don't know. So help him. Even Virginia didn't know. Is she going with him? Yeah. Uh, Gino said he'd come back and get Virginia and the dough. He must have a bundle hidden somewhere. When's the Gambona leaving? I don't know. Don't lie to me. You said you were getting paid to get him in and out of the country. That's right, but I haven't made arrangements to get him out yet. You were going to meet them. Where? Grand Central, by the Oyster Bar, 11.30. Now can I relax, get some rest? <laughs> We got to the oyster bar in ten minutes, and Briggs had stakeouts placed around the entire area. At 11.30, Virginia Barrett and Gino Gambona failed to show. We waited for another hour. Sir William James reports in the information desk. Sir William James. Wait till I get back to Marco. Well, the only reason he'd lie is to give Gambona and the girl enough time to get away. Well, they'll never make it. We've got everything covered. Marco's job is to get them out. If he thinks they've got a chance to make it, he must have already made the arrangement. Yeah, but what kind? Well, we can forget about planes. Take a pretty big ship to go that far. What about some obscure boat? Yeah, yeah, that could be a big payoff to the captain. Look, we can figure Gambona got here within the last week. He couldn't afford to be gone too long from Sicily. He told me he's got it fixed and nobody will miss him, but he couldn't be gone too long. Uh, Taking two weeks both ways by boat. Yeah. He must have planned it to arrive here, get the money and his girl, take care of the Ricos, and get out fast. Let's check the boats that arrived from Italy and Sicily in the last two or three days and see if one of them is sailing tonight. Right. 
We checked the arrivals for the past week and then compared them with current departures. We found one looked like it could be it. An independent steamer, the Atlantic Star, had arrived from Sicily the morning of the 3rd, the day before Barney Rico had met his death, and was due to sail from Pier 16 at 1 o'clock in the morning, bound for the Mediterranean. We piled into a squad car and arrived at Pier 16 at 12.50, where we identified ourselves to the gangway watch and were directed to the captain on the bridge of the Atlantic Star. Hey, hey, what are you two guys doing? Yeah, what do you want? Police, you're under arrest. For what? Where are Gino Gambone and Virginia Barrett? Who? You're both surrounded. You might as well tell us. Yeah, stateroom B. But right now he's probably in the galley. What's he doing there? Hmm, that's the way he signed on. Cook. Does pretty good at it, too. <laughs> We took the captain down on deck and Briggs waved one of his men aboard. The captain was taken off quietly, and Briggs and I moved on to stateroom B. Who is it? Marco! Are you sure to... Oh! Let go of me! Take your hands off me! Now calm down, Jenny. One yell out of you and I'll fix it so you don't get to sing with the prison band. Virginia Barrett went off just as quietly as the captain, and the boat was cleared except for anyone who still might be in the galley. Briggs waited outside the galley door, and I went in, with my hand on the 38 in my pocket. I spotted Gambona behind a long table, stacked with pots and pans. He looked up as I moved in on him. Hey, what time is this tub supposed to pull out? It's after. Hello, Gino. Why, you... I'm so smart to get this hysterical. There I was, face to face with Gino Gambona, ready to take him, single-handed, right where I wanted him. And the next minute, I was buried under a pile of pots and pans. Gino drew his gun, made a dash for the passageway. And that was as far as he got. Johnny? What? What? Here, give me your hand. What happened? Somebody goofed. Gambona was dead. Virginia Barrett and Marco, full name Marco Dandoy, got five to ten years for their parts in the crime. The captain of the Atlantic Star got two years, and Lieutenant Briggs got a promotion. Yours truly returned to Adelaide Jones with the flowers he'd promised her. And all in all, everyone got just what was coming to them. Expense account item 7, $52.88 hotel bill. Item 8, $24.56. Train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $112.07. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Hanley Conrad, Johnny. Oh, how are you, Mr. Conrad? Fine. Are you employed? Not at the moment. How about catching the next plane for Los Angeles? All right. What is it? We insure on Mr. William McEdwards. His home burned down last night and he was killed in the fire. Who do I see? C.H. Anderson, Beverly Hills Chief of Police. All right, I'll call the airport and make a reservation. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. 
People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, World Insurance, and Indemnity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amita Buddha matter. Expense account item one, $193.55. Plain fare and incidentals between Hartford and Los Angeles. I arrived at the Los Angeles airport the next morning, rented a car, and drove it to the hotel where I registered and put in a call to Chief Anderson at the Beverly Hills Police Department. An hour later, we were sitting in his city hall office. Lieutenant Hankins got the call at seven minutes after six in the evening, placed by a neighbor. House was almost completely gutted by the time the fire department got it under control. Hankins found McEdward's body in the bedroom. He'd been alone in the house? Yeah. His wife returned about an hour later, found her husband dead. Swell homecoming. How'd the fire start? We're not sure. Started in the bedroom. One thing's pretty certain. It wasn't an accident. What do you mean? The first cursory examination by the coroner's deputy indicated the victim had burned to death. This morning, we got another report. Further examination at the morgue showed McEdwards had been stabbed. What? Mm Mm-hmm. Also hit over the head. Severe skull fracture. So you think McEdwards was killed first and the fire started to cover the crime? Yeah. That's how I came into it. Ordinarily, Lieutenant Hankins would handle the whole thing. Uh, this murder angle is confidential, Dollar, until the coroner files an official report. Sure. Any suspects? No, not yet. Well, thank you, Chief Anderson. I think I'll go out and talk to the widow. That's all right with you? Sure. Uh, but don't mention the murder angle. I won't. Where's she staying? With her mother in Encino. <laughs> Yes? My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'd like to speak to your daughter, if I may. What's it about? The death of her husband. I'm a special investigator for the insurance company. Well, Mr. Dollar, my daughter's not feeling very well. I know it's difficult, Mrs. Rizzinelli, but if it's at all possible, I'd like to see her. Get it over with. Get it out of the way. Well, who is it, Mom? Oh, she's up. She was resting. Well, who is it? This is Mr. Dollar, honey. He's, uh... Uh, Is it about the... uh... Yes, it is. He's a special investigator, an insurance investigator. Well, come in. Thanks. I was lying down, Mr. Dollar. I'll be in the kitchen. Nice meeting you, Mr. Dollar. Nice meeting you, Mrs. Rizzinelli. Well, won't you sit down? Thank you. You're with the insurance company? Yes, World Insurance and Indemnity. Uh, How can I help? Just answer some questions. I'm sure you've had your fill of answering questions by now. It's all right. Uh, You returned about an hour after the fire. Is that correct? That's right. Where had you been? I'd driven to Pasadena. Bill, he had to work so he couldn't go with me. A few days ago, Mr. McEdwards, that's Bill's father, returned from a location trip to Korea and gave us an antique... An old Chinese Buddha. We wanted to find out about it, so I took it to a friend of ours in Pasadena who collects Oriental art. A Buddha? Yes. Bill's dad found it in Korea and gave it to us as a sort of belated wedding gift. We'd only been married for six months. Uh, When did you leave for Pasadena? Oh, around four in the afternoon. I would have left sooner, but I had to clean house and fix Bill's lunch. (laughs) I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but it's still a little hard to talk about it. Just a few more questions. I'm all right. Did anything unusual happen? Unusual? Well, anything your husband might have said before you left. Anything out of the ordinary that happened? I don't understand. Why do you think something unusual might have happened? Is there something I don't know about this, Mr. Dollar? No, no, it's nothing like that. I'm just checking everything. 
There was a fire. My husband lost his life. Are you considering that it might not have been an accident? I'm not considering anything. I'm just checking. Uh, this Buddha, where is it now? Charlie Wilkins, our friend in Pasadena, has it. He wasn't sure, but he thought that it might be very rare, and he asked me to leave it for a few days. Charles Wilkins? Yes. And your husband's father brought the Buddha back from Korea? Yes. Is uh, Mr. McEdward Sr. in the service? No, he's a production man for international pictures. He was making a documentary film in Korea. I'd like to talk to him. I think he's at the studio now. He lives on Beverly Glen. Well, I'll try to reach him at the studio. Thank you very much for your time and patience. Certainly. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. I left the attractive valley home and drove back to the hotel, where I put in a call to International Studios for John McEdwards, the victim's father. His secretary told me he was at home, but that she'd deliver my message and have him call me. In about five minutes, McEdwards called, and I made an appointment to see him. I drove out sunset toward Westwood Village and turned north on Beverly Glen. John McEdwards lived in a small house in the middle of a lot of acreage. The reason for the acreage met me at the high cars gate. Four giant Great Danes faced me behind the steel fence. Their owner, a tall, wiry, middle-aged man, bounded down the steps of the house and ordered his animals to be silent. Easy, easy. Come on. You, Mr. Dollar? Uh, yeah. I'll be with you in a minute. Come on. Get over there. Come on, boy. Come on. Come on. That's it. My name is Mr. Dollar. Uh, wouldn't it be just as well if we talked out here? They won't hurt you. Come on in. Uh, easy, sir. Easy. Well... Ah, uh, nice doggy. They're all right. Just as friendly as they can be. Ah, uh, well, my gosh, they are. I'm McEdwards. Glad to know you, Mr. McEdwards. Oh, easy, boy. Oh, Sammy, Sammy, quiet. I'm just shaking his hand. Come on into the house. Fine. Sure hate to run into that pack if you weren't around. They wouldn't do anything unless maybe you tried to break in the house or something. There's an article in the paper not too long ago about some guy trying to break in the house. The owner's great dame spotted him going in the window and broke his neck. Broke his neck? Yeah. No, 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 Samson, you stay out. Samson? <laughs> yeah. Samson, Delilah, Cleopatra. I, I call her Patty. And the Duchess. Sit down. Thanks. The Duchess is the mother. She threw 12 her first litter. I, I, I kept three. Well, you didn't come here to talk about dogs. Can I get you a beer? No, thanks. You want to talk about Bill? Yes, yes. Wonderful boy. Terrible thing. I'm just trying to keep busy and not think about it. It's pretty tough. You raise a boy and see him through all these years. Yes, sir. What do you want to talk about? How long were you in Korea, Mr. McEdwards? About three months. I understand you brought back an old Buddha. Yeah. Why? I saw your daughter-in-law, she told me. How's she taking it? Pretty well, I'd say. Yeah, what a wonderful girl. Never thought Bill would get married, but... He sure picked the right one when he did. Yeah. Tough, isn't it? Only been married six months. Tough on Pat. Mm. Tell me something about this Buddha. Well, it, it was funny how I found it. I was helping build a dam. We had to block up a small stream and get the water to rise for a shot we needed. I was digging up some rocks a few yards away from the road, and I uncovered the old Buddha... It was in a box. Nice, neat hole. Your daughter-in-law said she took it to Charles Wilkins, that he thought it was very rare. Yeah. Why are you so interested in the Buddha, Mr. Dollar? Oh, just a casual interest. My company sent me out to investigate the fire, and when your daughter-in-law mentioned the Buddha, I got interested. Your company insured my son's life. That's right. You didn't know Bill, did you? No. Nice boy. Easy going. Never thought about insurance or things like that until he met Pat. Then he settled down. Best thing that ever happened to him. 
Are you sure you won't have a beer, Mr. Tuck? Oh, no, really. Thanks, it's the same. Mr. Those darn dogs. There must be someone at the gate. Oh, it's it's bad. Hi. Hi. Oh, now get back. Come on, come on. Shove them back. Hello, honey. Hi, Dad. Oh. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Hello. Mr. Dollar, I just had a visit from Police Chief Anderson. He came just after you left. That's why you asked me all those questions. He told you? Yes, he did. What is it? Dad, the fire wasn't an accident. What? What? Well, Pat, what is it? What do you mean it wasn't an accident? Would you tell him, Mr. Dollar? If you'd like me to. What is it, Mr. Dollar? The fire wasn't an accident, Mr. McEdwards. Somebody deliberately... Bill was murdered. Oh, honey, honey. (laughs) Mr. Dollar. Yeah. But why? Mr. Dollar, do you think it had something to do with that Buddha? I don't know, Mrs. McEdwards. I'm trying to find out. Friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Even when you're busy working, you can slip a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint in your mouth and enjoy that pleasant chewing. The lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps relieve pent-up tension, gives you satisfaction. As a result, you seem to feel more relaxed and get more enjoyment out of what you're doing. So enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum while you work and at other times, too. Get a few packages next time you're at the store. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. John McEdwards walked me down to the gate and through the Great Danes. Then I drove to Pasadena and met Mr. Charles Wilkins, authority on Oriental art. I can't say absolutely. I'm still doing research, but I believe the Buddha to be the original Amita image Buddha. What does that mean? Well, in Buddhism, there's more than one Buddha. Each may have an earthly life, but there is never more than one in the world at any time. And Buddhas come into being at irregular intervals and only when there is a special need for their presence. In the Mayana system of Buddhism, there are 300 million Buddhas. But the Amita is one of the five Buddhas of contemplation. And the Buddha Mr. McEdwards found is the original Amita? I'm almost positive that it is. I I believe its origin dates back to sometime around 200 B.C. What would you say it's worth? Well, that would depend. To a responsible collector, uh, really no way of telling. Well, let's say you were a wealthy, responsible collector, Mr. Wilkins. Uh, Let's just say responsible. How much would you pay for the original Amita Buddha? Well, if I could buy it for, say, a hundred and fifty, maybe two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand dollars? I would be getting a bargain. I would go as high as half a million if I had the money. Well, Mr. Wilkins, thank you. <laughs> This thing is worth half a million? That's what the man said. Well, now, that's what I call a motive. Yeah. If the Buddha is really an art treasure, then the U.S. Customs Office is going to be very interested. That's their affair. I'm interested in who killed Bill McEdwards. Well, I don't know where this will take us, but at least it's a lead. Only real one I've had so far. We questioned all of the victim's associates, and what we could find out, he didn't have an enemy in the world. No love rivals, no discarded girlfriends, no money troubles, nothing. But he had the Buddha. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, who knew he had it, besides his wife and father? Well, how about the location troupe old man McEdwards was with in Korea? Mm-hmm. I'll check with the studio right away. Yeah. But it's not just somebody who knew he had it. It's somebody who knew the value of it. Somebody who's hep to oriental art, huh? 
Maybe the guy who buried it. Why would anybody stash a prize like that in a hole in the ground? Well, for safekeeping, maybe. There's been a war in Korea. Yeah, thanks for telling me. But say it was the person who buried the thing. Why would he have to steal it? He could just step up and claim his property. If he was the rightful owner. But suppose he stole it in the first place. Yeah. Well, I like guessing games as well as the next one, but it's time I got to work. Where are you going to start? First, the motion picture company, then we'll check all incoming passengers from the Orient last week. Ships, planes, military personnel. That shouldn't take more than a month. You got any better ideas? At the moment, no. Then I want another talk with McEdwards Sr. I thought I'd run out and see him this afternoon. Yeah, do that. If you turn up anything, let me know. Sure. If I do. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I was just finishing some dinner. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, don't be silly. Come on in and have a cup of coffee with me. If you haven't had your dinner, I'll be glad to throw on a couple of chops. No, thanks. I don't get hungry early. Have a seat. Thanks. You want some coffee, don't you? Yeah, that'll be fine. I'm not much of a bachelor. Wife died three years ago, and I still haven't got used to doing things like cooking, keeping house. Usually eat out. You take uh, cream or sugar? Black is fine. Pat was in a pretty bad way after you left, but she finally came around all right. That's tough. Yeah, it is. I wanted to talk some more about... No, oh, darn. Excuse me. Hello? Well, yes, hello, dear. Yes, yes, she worked... She hadn't. Well, she left here about, oh, I'd say about 5.30, maybe quarter six. Well, she might have stopped off someplace. No, 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 don't worry about it. No, she was just fine when she left. Oh, sure. No, oh, uh, I'm all right, dear. Sure, sure, I will. Bye. Funny. Hmm? That was Pat's mother. She isn't home yet. When did she leave here? Oh, about two hours ago. Well, we're all on edge. Oh, I don't think there's anything to worry about? No. She's taking pretty well. When she left, she was fine. I talked with Mr. McEdwards for about another hour. He told me everything he could about the Buddha and his trip to Korea. He looked dead tired. His eyes were beginning to show the strain. I decided to say goodnight and forget the rest of the interrogation until the next morning when the phone rang again. Hello? Eh? What? I'm sorry, I didn't... Yes, that's right. Yes. But, but, but wait. Hello. 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 Something wrong? I'm not supposed to say anything. What was it? I think you're a nice guy, Johnny. Can I trust you? Certainly. They said not to tell anyone, but I've got to trust someone. I, I can't think for myself. Too much has happened. You... <laughs> You won't take this to the police. I can't promise that. Well, I don't think you will after I tell you. I don't know who that was on the phone, but it was some guy, and and he said they've got Pat. What do you mean, they've got Pat? Kidnapped. Now, look, exactly what was said. Good gosh, you, you, you read about things like this, but you you never think they're going to happen. Now, take it easy. Oh, I'm all right. I, I just I haven't had much sleep. I, I can't think straight. Now, the man that called... He said he had Pat, that she was all right for me not to say anything to anyone, or she'd get hurt. He said for me to get the Buddha. And that is it. They said to get it, and they'd see that Pat was returned home safely. What did they say to do with it? Just to get it, they'd contact me. What are you going to do? Get the Buddha. Wait a minute. Let me go. Oh, they might be watching. They'd know I told you about the phone call. They won't do anything to Pat until they get the Buddha. I'll call Wilkins. He's probably in the book. Well, don't you think it'd be better if I went? Yeah, maybe it would. But I'm going to follow you. 
If anything happens, I want to be around. All right, let's go. Wilkins turned over the Buddha while I waited outside his house, watching for anyone who might have followed. The drive back to McEdward's home was uneventful. No single car stayed with us for any length of time from the freeway to Beverly Glen. While McEdwards opened the gates and drove his car into the garage, I parked in a secluded spot some 50 yards away from the house and walked back, where I met McEdwards at the foot of the front steps. You think we were followed? No, I don't think so. Well, I've got the Buddha. What do I do with it? Wait till you hear from them. They said they'd contact you. Yeah. Think I should call Pat's mother and tell her what's happened? No, not yet. No sense in worrying her until we find out what's going to happen. But, Dad... Huh? Good evening, Mr. McEdwards. John McEdwards had visitors, two men. One rather slight, fairly young. The other an enormous man, a good six and a half feet that must have weighed well over 300 pounds. The slight one held a 38 pointed in our direction. Pat started across to McEdwards, but the big man stopped her. Sit down. What is this? Allow me to introduce myself. Alan Sutka. And this is my friend, Don Roach. We've come for the Buddha. I let him in with my key, Dad. I had to... Sure. It's, it's, it's okay. Who's your friend, Mr. McEdwards? Yes, I warned you not to confide in anyone. This is Mr. Dollar. He's just an old friend. How unfortunate for Mr. Dollar. You've gone to a lot of trouble to get this Buddha. Indeed, I have. Nearly five years, to be exact. Now, what is your interest in this matter, Mr. Dollar? Purely professional. Are you a policeman? Not quite. I see. Mr. McEdwards isn't responsible for my getting mixed up in this. I was here when you called and forced him into telling me. As I said before, most unfortunate. Now, Mr. McEdwards, I'll take the Buddha. Not yet, you won't. Oh? Perhaps you don't understand. Yeah, that's it exactly. Which one of you bums killed my son? Killed your son. He was killed, Sutker. The fire didn't work. The police know all about it. Indeed. Come on, Mr. Sutter. Let's get this over with and get out of here. Patience, patience. You'll have to forgive my young friend. How did you know Mr. McEdwards had the Buddha? Its discovery made the Tokyo papers. I did some checking, found out when Mr. McEdwards was returning to the States, flew here to meet him. Why'd you kill my son? I don't mind telling you. Under the circumstances, I cannot afford to let any of you live. Your son discovered Roach here in the act of burglarizing his home. He protested too much. Roach had to kill him. It wasn't premeditated. We assumed the Buddha was in the house. We knew that Mr. McEdwards here had delivered it to his son the night before. Why, are you... Take it easy, take it easy. The dollar's right. Should you get out of hand, Roach will shoot you on the spot. Now, if you don't mind, I'll have that Buddha. Oh, Dad... Without hysterics, if you don't mind. Just one more question. How did you know about the Buddha? Mr. Dollar, I've known about that particular Amita Buddha for many, many years. Another man knew about it also. Unfortunately, he was the first to locate it. His name was Wu Sung, an oriental collector. He discovered the Amita Buddha in a Tibetan temple shortly after World War II and stole it, then smuggled it out of Tibet and into Korea. I followed him. Made him a handsome offer, but he refused to sell. He died under rather mysterious circumstances. But I didn't have the chance to leave Korea with the Buddha. The war. Very astute, yes. The communists suddenly attacked, and there was absolutely no way I could get the Buddha out of the country without someone discovering it. So you buried it? A few hundred yards from Wu Sung's home. I imagine the house has long since vanished from the face of the earth. I bided my time in Tokyo, waiting for hostilities to cease. But, as fate will have it, Mr. McEdwards uncovered my prize. Mr. Satka, you talk too much. I enjoy it, Roach. And after all, what good will the information be to our friends? Come on, let's get the Buddha. Yes. Now, Mr. McEdwards, you will either turn over the Buddha, or Roach will kill you immediately. Give it to him. Here. Thank you. Now, if you'll all lead the way down into the yard, we'll proceed to my car and take a short trip. Oh, Dad. It's all right, honey. Now, if you please. Beautiful animals, Mr. McEdwards. I'm glad they were pinned up when we arrived. They could have caused no end of trouble. They still can! Oh, oh. 
McEdwards had belted the big boy right in his enormous middle. Roach stepped in and swung his gun. As McEdwards dropped, the dogs penned in behind the tall fences went crazy. Samson, the big male, went over the ten-foot fence like it wasn't even there. Before I knew it, I was up to my elbows in great game. Jimmy! Jimmy, let him in! Jimmy, cut him! Hey, Delilah, get back there! Are you all right? Yes, yes, I'm all right. Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Why didn't they go after me? They knew you were helping. <laughs> my face, my face, get a doctor, get a this doctor. This one's pretty bad. My How's face. the big one? Huh. You were right about Danes. What do you mean? The one you were telling me about that broke the man's neck. The fat man ran into the same sort of situation. He's dead? He sure is. Well, that's the way it should be. Samson was my son's talk. Expense account item two, $33.85 hotel bill. Item three and four, $299.75. Car rental, plane fare, and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $527.15. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley's Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps you keep feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day, and we know that you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were James Nusser, John Stevenson, Jeanette Nolan, Sammy Hill, Bill James, Herb Butterfield, Robert Griffin, and Edgar Barrier. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. WBBM-FM, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Philip Martin, Johnny. Hello, Mr. Martin. Got a job for you. Fine. Man named Carl Nelson is insured with our company. He was killed. How? Shot to death. Got a police record. Small-time hoodlum. Beneficiary is a woman named Gilkerson. Maud Gilkerson. Uh-huh. He disappeared. Police think it probably has something to do with Nelson's death. Want to see what you can find out? Sure. All right. Get down to New York as soon as you can. Contact Lieutenant Korchak at 11th Precinct Homicide. He'll give you all the help he can. I'll get right on it. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley Spearmint gum almost any time and any place. 
Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will too. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Columbia All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Nelson matter. Expense account item one, $15.36, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. I arrived at 2.30 in the afternoon and after registering at the hotel, went directly to the 11th Precinct Police Station where I introduced myself to Lieutenant Korchak of Homicide. Uh, how much does your company insure the frog for? The frog? Uh, Nelson. He was called the frog. He, he looked like one. Oh? <laughs> he was insured for 10000 And Maud Gilkerson gets the money. You think she had something to do with the killing? No, I think she knows something about it. Any theories about why he was killed? Nothing definite. The frog was a hood, long record, did time twice, been in every racket from the numbers to stick-ups. Now, you don't generally get anything definite on a killing like this. Some of the boys wanted him dead. Who or why is hard to tell. He's been associated with Ellis Hartje for the past year or so. That's pretty big company. Yeah, Hartje's about as big as it come. Probably got unhappy with a frog and had him eliminated. Have you questioned Hartje? Sure, but just a matter of routine. If Hartje had something to do with it, it's going to be tough to prove. Well, I guess the first thing to do is find the beneficiary, Maud Gilkerson. Well, that's not going to be easy. We've done a lot of looking. Well, I got a friend in town that just might be of some help. Do I know him? Probably, but I'd rather not mention who it is. He doesn't get along very well with cops. <laughs> not many people do. My friend's got a king-size allergy. But for the right people and the right price, he can be very informative. Well, good luck, Dollar. Thanks. I'll let you know if I come up with anything. <laughs> Expense account item two, $2.35, cab fare from the precinct to Skid Row and Hetz Hilarity. A saloon that always looked as though it wanted to collapse when the sun hit it too hard. Inside, I found Wilbur Truitt sitting at the almost deserted bar, sipping muscatel through a glass straw. Ah. Hello, Wilbur. Bucko, you are indeed a sight for sore eyes. And Bucko, my eyes are sore. Pull up a Heppelwhite and rest yourself. Can I buy you a drink? Oh, noble prince, a king among kings. You come in the nick. Can you buy me a drink? If it were not so early in the day and my spine not yet limber, I would bend and kiss your feet. I'll just take a rain check. Innkeeper! A flagon of your best amber tonic. Oh, Bucko, I missed you. Do you realize what with economic conditions such as they are, that your absence has been the bane of my existence? Goodwill is a thing of the past. Wilbur. I once looked upon mankind with a warm smile and a kind heart. But I find it difficult to keep from becoming a complete cynic. People are pinching pennies completely out of shape. Soon the exchequer will be filled with a gigantic mass of unrecognizable copper. Why, a year ago I was averaging as much as 50 cents a day. A whole bottle. Maybe it's your pitch. My pitch? Sir, my pitch is a thing of beauty. An excursus of cogent puissance. A compassionate discourse on human suffering. Okay, My okay. pitch would tear the heart out of Mephistopheles himself. Wilbur. Uh, yes, Bucko. Where can I find Maud Gilkerson? You know why my eyes are sore, Bucko? No. Why are your eyes sore, Wilbur? I had to brave the morning sun. Things had become so desperate, I pawned my dark glasses. Oh, I'm sorry. If things don't improve, I may have to part with my glass straw. The only sure method of deriving substance when in the throes of the shade. Maud Gilkerson is worth a bottle. Granted. In fact, I'd venture to guess that the lady is worth uh, two bottles. Mm, you're probably right. 
of Aquarium. I'm staying at the Yorkshire. She may not want to see you. Tell her I've got 10000 for her. I beg your pardon. Tell her the frog left a $10,000 insurance policy and she's the beneficiary. Good Lord, perhaps I was wrong. There are still a few good deeds left in the world. Sure. I just gave you two quarts worth. <laughs> Expense account item three. $2.60 for a cab back to the hotel where I went up to my room and smoked a half a dozen cigarettes while I waited for Wilbur Truett to call. Around 4.30 in the afternoon, the phone finally rang. Johnny Dollar. Bucko? Yeah, Wilbur? I finally contacted the party. She's not happy. Did you tell her about the insurance? The first words out of my mouth. But it seems Mr. Nelson's insurance is not enough to bring color to her cheeks and a smile to her ashen lips. What does she want? Some insurance of her own. What do you mean? She's hiding because her life's in danger. She has no money to leave town. She'll make a deal with you. Go on. Enough money to leave the country. You said town. A logical progression. The town first, then the country. Believe me, Bucko, her plight is worth considering. What will she give me in exchange for the money? That is her own personal secret. But she told me to tell you it's worth every cent. All right. Go to 107 River Street, the last room at the back of the hall. Tell her Wilbur sent you. Right. Thanks, Wilbur. I put on my hat and coat, crossed the room, and opened the door to go out into the hall. But I didn't make it. There, standing on the other side of the door, about to knock, were two ugly-looking men dressed in loud jackets. Your name, Dollar? Yeah? Mind if we come in? What'd happen if I did? We'd come in. That's what I thought. Then why'd you ask? I make little bets with myself. I want to talk with you for a few minutes, Dollar. Okay. What are you doing in New York? It's a nice town. Want some advice? Not especially. Make a little bet with yourself, you're going to get it anyway. I'm a lap in front of you. Then here it is. When Bert asks you a civil question, give him a civil answer. Okay. Ask me a civil question, Bert. What are you doing in New York? It's a nice town. <coughs> oh! Why, you... Hold it. You'll just belt you again. With a broken arm? <laughs> You're pretty tough, huh? All in how you look at it. If breaking his arm is being tough, then that's the best name for it. Okay. We don't want any trouble. <laughs> that's a funny line. I won't ask you no more questions. That'll save some time. I'm just going to tell you. Lay off a Nelson Kelly. You understand? Yeah. You said lay off the Nelson killing. Good boy. Because if you keep nosing around, somebody will just have to come down and investigate the dollar killing. Understand? Yeah. You said somebody will just have to come down and investigate the dollar killing. Fine, fine. Now that you understand, we'll be going. Nice meeting you both, informally, like this. Expense account item four. $3.25 for another cab that took me down to 107 River Street. The address was an old two-story frame house that faced the water. I went in and walked down the dark hall to the back room. Who is it? Wilbur sent me. What's your name? Dollar. Come in. Are you Maud Gilkerson? Yeah. Wilbur said you'd make a deal. That's right. But I want to know what I'm getting in return. Look, Sonny. Take my word for it. You get more than you're paying for. Now, how much did you bring? I got a couple of hundred. A couple of hundred? That's all I had on me. If you want more, I'll have to get it. Sonny, I gotta get out of the country. This is enough to get you out of town. If what you've got is worth it, I'll send you the rest. Not on your life. When I leave this room, nobody's ever gonna hear from old Mort again. You've got 10000 coming from Nelson's insurance policy. Uh, how long will it take to get it? Well, that depends. First, I've got to report on Nelson's death. I and... gotta get out of here as soon as I can. Another day or so, they'll find me. Well, it'll take at least three weeks before... Three weeks? 
Certainly if I stay here, I'll be buried in three weeks. What are you scared of? Dying. I don't like the idea. I don't blame you. How soon can you get me some more money? How much more? Five hundred. What am I buying? I'm not telling you anything until I get the money. Okay, then we'll just forget it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm not trying to be tough, but what I got is too hot to go around shooting my face off about. How do I know if I tell you that you won't take it to the cops? You don't? Well, Wilbur said I could trust you. That's right. Okay, okay. I'll tell you. But give me the 200 on account. There you are. Okay, thanks. Uh, you want a drink? No, thanks. Mind if I have one? Go ahead. I don't usually take this stuff, but uh, I, I need it. <laughs> oh, Frog left me 10,000, huh? That's right. <laughs> nice guy. Nasty disposition, but he was okay. You didn't know him, huh? No. Well, he's been with the outfit about a year now. The outfit? Boss Hotchie. Alice Hotchie? Yeah. The frog done pretty well for himself. Until lately. Yeah, he, he always worried that hit him in the head. He was always planning they shouldn't. You know how it is with small guys like the frog. You never know when something goes wrong and the outfit sends word to hit you in the head. Frog always worried about getting hit in the head. Ah, but he was smart. While he was alive. Yeah, yeah. He figured as long as he was smart like he was, he'd fix it so hard she would never be able to hit him. Frog was in on most of the stuff Hotchie's been setting up in this town. Not big in it, you know, but in it. And he kept his eyes open. Found out too much and they killed him for it? Yeah, but it wasn't only what he found out. It was what he collected. Collected? Enough evidence to send Hotchie and his boys away for a hundred years. Maybe the chair, even. Did Hotchie know it? Sure. Frog told him when he found out he was hot. He told Hotchie if he got killed, the stuff would go to the D.A. And you've got it. I got it. Why didn't you give it to the D.A.? Well, even if they send Hachi up, he's got friends. I'd be dead before he went to trial. You want another 500 for... And that's dirt cheap, especially when the dirt's liable to be in my face. How long do I have to get it? Oh, well, just as soon as you can. Like I said, I ain't got much longer. You found me, and you ain't got connections like Hachi. Or oh, they'll find me. I'll have the 500 in an hour. Okay, okay. I'll make arrangements. Uh, wait a second. <laughs> Here. What is it? Well, what does it look like? It's a key. You've been okay with me, so I'll trust you. It's a key to a locker in Grand Central, number 415. That's where the package is. Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, it's a real help to chew delicious Wrigley Spearmint gum right while you're working. When you're warm or tired, for instance, a lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor is really refreshing. It helps keep your mouth and throat feeling cool and moist. Chewing on that smooth, good-tasting piece of Wrigley Spearmint makes the time pass more pleasantly, too. It seems to make your work go smoother and easier. Keep a package or two of Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum handy all the time. Enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint while you're working and at other times. That's Wrigley's Spearmint chewing gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> Now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. After Maud Gilkerson gave me the key to the locker in Grand Central, I left the old house on River Street and started back for town. It was getting dark, and there were no cabs in that section, so I headed west for the busy traffic. I'd only gone about a hundred yards when a car pulled away from the curb about a half block behind me. A big black car with the lights off. I thought about the key in my pocket and the evidence in the locker that would send the biggest hoodlum in the country away for life. I had to get rid of the key before they caught up with me. I turned a corner, and there, a few feet in front of me, was a blind man. A beggar sitting with his legs folded and on his lap a tin cup with a stack of pencils. 
Bless you. Thanks. I'm going to need it. Hold it, Dollar. Well, good evening. Get in the car. Get in. In the back seat. You just don't take advice, do you, Dollar? You didn't say anything about taking a walk. I told you to lay off the Nelson killing. Who says I didn't? You dug up Maud Gilkerson. Who? <sighs> oh, I told you. When Bert asks you a civil question... Give him a, a civil, civil answer. answer. Okay. So I dug up Maud Gilkerson. So what? What'd she give you? A lot of double talk. She gave me nothing. I think you're lying. But we let a couple of the boys off to talk to her. They'll find out. What happens in the meantime? We drive around while a goon searches you. Then we go see someone who wants to have a little talk with you. Okay, goon. Search him. Get down on the floor. Is that your name, goon? Get down there. I should have guessed. What? Oh, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Bert drove us around, the goon made me strip down to my socks while he searched my clothes. When he didn't find what he was looking for, he swatted me across the back of the neck, told me to get dressed, then Bert drove us across town to a big apartment house that overlooked the river. Bert parked in the basement garage, and I was led into an elevator that took us to the penthouse. Ellis Harji, the czar of the underworld, looked up from his evening paper. This is Dollar, boss. Did he find more? Yeah. Ernie and Frank are with him. Uh -huh. Well, sit down, Mr. Dollar. All right. Bert told me he and the gun paid you a little visit this afternoon, eh? If you can call that a little visit. The gun get rough? Don't tell me he can do something else. <laughs> You're kind of fresh, huh? I'm ripe enough to know I don't like getting pushed around. Sometimes you got to take a pushing around to understand things. I don't take a pushing around from you or anyone else, Harji. You think you've got a choice? Not at the moment, no. If I want you to take a beating, you take one. I'll make up for it. You ain't making up for anything. Now, you've got to understand, I'm running things, see? You ain't going to say nothing about what happens or what don't happen. So you just try and relax and take what comes, huh? You cooperate. It's going to be nice. He didn't have anything on him. Nothing, huh? I went over him good. He didn't have nothing. She tell you where it is, Dollar? What? You know what I'm talking about. Whatever it is, the frog left for Maud Gilkerson. I found Maud Gilkerson to tell her Nelson left her $10,000. She didn't say nothing about me. Not a thing. She didn't say anything but thanks and get out. He was in with her for about 10 minutes. So it took her 10 minutes to say thanks and get out, huh? Look, what do you think she said to me? That's what I want you to tell me, Dollar. How can I tell you something when there's nothing to tell? I located Maud Gilkerson to tell her that okay, Nelson... Okay, 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 you said that. I don't know what you're so worried about me for. Or an old dame like Maud. What can we do to a big man like you? Make me mad. Nello. Yeah. No. All right, take care of it. Yeah. Now, that was Ernie. Maud, tell him anything? Yeah. She told him that she gave Dollar a key. Is that right, Dollar? She gave you a key? She told him she gave him a key to a locker in Grand Central Station. Is that right, Dollar? She told him the locker number was 415. The stuff was in a locker. Is that right, Dollar? Do me any good to say no? No. The goons searched me. He didn't have no key on him, boss. All right. All right, where is it, Dollar? I haven't got it. Take him somewhere and find out what he done with it. Yeah. Let's go, Dollar. You're making a mistake, Archie. Nice meeting you, Mr. Dollar. The goon and Bert took me back down in the elevator, hustled me into the car, and drove me back across town to a warehouse in the Bowery. In a small room on the second floor of the warehouse, the goon went to work while Bert stood by with a gun. Where's the key, Dollar? I don't know. 
<laughs> I knew the guy that was going to bust my arm. be a whole lot easier if you just tell us. I can't tell you about something I haven't got. <clears throat> oh. The goon worked on me until I passed out. Then he threw some water in my face and started working on me again. Oh, he knew his job. It hurt, but it didn't kill me. When I was coming to for the third time, the phone rang. And Bert left the room to answer it. I knew this was the only chance I was going to get. When the goon leaned over me with a bucket of water, I grabbed the cuffs of his trouser legs and pulled. I staggered up to my feet as the goon started up off his back. I kicked him as hard as I could in the face. Grabbed the heavy bucket and stumbled over to the door. Just as Bert came back from the phone call. Hey, goon. Ask me a civil question, Bert. I tied them up as best I could, then took Bert's gun and the car keys. I found my way out of the warehouse, climbed in the big black sedan, and drove across town to the block that ran into River Street. All the way, I kept my fingers crossed that the blind man with the tin cup and pencils would still be there. Pardon me. Yes? I came by here a little while ago and dropped a key in your cup. Oh, yes, I found it. Uh, uh, here it is. I'd like to buy it back. Buy it? Yeah. Here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I guess I'd better be going. It's beginning to rain. No, it isn't. It's just bleeding out. I wheeled the big car back across town to the 11th precinct and caught Lieutenant Korchak just going off duty. He took one look at my face, mumbled something about careless truck drivers, and sat down to listen to my story. Bird and the goon? Yeah. I left them in a warehouse. They won't stay tied up long. The boys that picked up Maud Gilkerson were named Ernie and Frank. Ernie Phillips and Frank Seller. I'll have them picked up. This key could bust this town wide open. I hope you're right, Dollar. A lot of people have tried to get Harjie. <laughs> now, let's go down to Grand Central. Right. Oh, uh, about Maud Gilkerson. What about her? They uh, fished her out of the river about an hour ago. <laughs> Okay, give me the key. Here. Argy knows about this locker. Ernie and Frank forced Maud to tell them before they killed her. You sure? They called Argy while I was in his apartment. He told me. Ah, let's see what we've got. Huh. A package. Korchak, look out! Huh? I'd seen them just as they came around the corner. The goon was grinning through the teeth I'd kicked out, and Bert had a big lump on the side of his head where I'd nailed him with a bucket. Everyone came out with their guns all at once. Korchak jumped to one side, and I dropped to my stomach while I squeezed out all six shots from the gun I'd taken away from Bert. When the smoke cleared, Korchak was down, but he was smiling. He'd caught one high on the shoulder, but Bert and the goon were through being bad boys. The goon was dead, and Bert didn't have far to go to catch up. The wagon cleaned it up and Korchak and I got ourselves patched up at emergency. They wanted to keep us in for observation, but Korchak had waited too long to get Harji, and nothing was going to stop him from making the arrest. I didn't want to miss it either. Korchak collected a squad and we paid a visit to the penthouse. Think he skipped? Stakeout said he hasn't left the building. Come on, Harjee, open up. This is Korchak, and I got a present for you. Hey, get back. Come on in, Korchak. I got a little something for you, too. You know, I'm kind of glad he wanted it this way. I'll shoot the lock, and then we go in. All right, hit the door. You all right, Dollar? Yeah, sure. Is he dead? He sure is. The 
Expense account items five and six. The $200 I gave to Maud, which they never recovered, and a dollar fifty for the two bottles I gave to Wilbur, who recovered three days later. The contribution to the blind man is on me. Expense account items seven and eight. Seventy-five dollars and ninety-five cents. Hotel bill, train fare, and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, three hundred and one dollars and one cent, and multiple bruises. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley's Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. <laughs> Sam Spade Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Say... Oh, Sam. Now, take it easy. The papers are on the street. I saw them. So did I. There'll be some red-faced editors ducking behind their green eye shades tomorrow. What do you mean, Sam? You don't plan up the score until the returns are all in, F. This applies to presidential elections, boxing matches, and executions at San Quentin Prison. Sam, you mean Willie? I mean Willie. Batten down the hatches and turn over your foam rubber cushion, Wonder Girl, for even now I'm homeward bound with a stride-by-stride account of a 12-hour marathon, which I shall call for obvious reasons, the hail and farewell caper. Transcribed for NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all, starring Stephen Dunn in The Adventures of Sam Spade. I've been robbed. Heffy? Sam? Brought in here this minute. Oh, yes, sir. Have I done something? That's what I was about to ask. Have you been sticking your delightful, freckled-covered, upturned little nose into my schnapps bottle? (laughs) Well, answer me, girl. Sam, you know I don't do... All right, then who? Well, the nervous little man who was here did open the drawer to find a pencil and paper and, and leave a note. Okay, you're clear. Oh, Sam, what about the little man? A good and leading question, F. Shall we attempt an answer? Oh, I'm at the ready, Sam. Shoot. They fill it in to Justice Edward Benjamin, State Supreme Court from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the hail and farewell caper. Dear Justice Benjamin. My relationship with the spindly little man goes clear back to a week ago, Thursday, possibly even before that. But that was the day I first noticed him. I remember it was Thursday because I was having corned beef and cabbage at Schroeder's. With him, it was a glass of water at the next table. He was paying little mind to the menu, having decided to spend the lunch hour staring at me. A couple of times, he put down his glass of water and pushed back his chair as if he were going to come over and talk. But he changed his mind. I put away the corned beef and cabbage and was halfway past the pie when he finally did it. Uh, uh, excuse me, sir. Hello. You, uh... You, sir, are Mr. Spade? I am. The uh, detective, Sam Spade, detective agent? At your service, sir. Now, what can I... I, uh, I, uh, you see, I, uh, do you have a match? I gave him a match, and he thanked me and went out. On Friday, I saw him in Ben's Grotto over a plate of Rex soul. We got just about as far, then he returned the match he owed me. The following week, I saw him four times. Once as I was going into a show, once at the post office, and twice as I was going into my office building. Each was the same. We'd get up to the point where he was about to tell me something, then he'd back down and ask me what time it was, or did I have a horse in the fifth at Golden Gate, or would I lend him a cigarette? Then he'd bustle off as fast as his spindly little legs could carry. And thus matters stood yesterday. Place, my office, time, 1.37 p.m. Sam Spade. Mr. Spade, is this, this, 
This is a gentleman who... who is yeah, it. don't tell me. I know the voice. Now, what is it this time? I do uh, like to see you, Mr. Spade. I must see you. I know. I'll save us both a trip. The it date is, is April 26th. The time is 1.38 p.m. All trains, really planes, and streetcars are leaving on schedule. Most and for the favor to Golden Gate tomorrow, consult your nearest please, bookie. Please, sir. Please, Mr. Spade. Please... Do not jest. This is a matter of life and death. I see. Fine, then. I'll see you tomorrow for lunch, huh? I won't be here, Mr. Spade. Oh, where'll you be? Dead. Dead. Look, look, I'm I, tired of this, I, Mr. I'm Spindley. Dead. Give it to me straight or sign off. Now, what I, is it? you got to listen to me, Mr. Spade. It's, it's most important. It's a life or death. It's a life... Hello? Mr. Spindley? Hello? It almost seemed as if he were in earnest this time, so I didn't hang up. I hustled down the hall to the next office, found another phone, and sweet-talked the supervisor into tracing down Mr. Spinley. It was a pay booth in a drugstore opposite the Park Emergency Hospital. The clerk in the drugstore was just getting over it when I punched in. Spindley had collapsed in the booth and had been hauled across the street to the hospital. On the bed there. Oh, thanks, doctor. Life and death, Mr. Spade. Terrible. You've got to stop it. It's murder. He's been legal muttering murder. like that ever since we brought I him in. Yeah, him. Hop, huh? The legal kind. You see before you an overdose of sleeping tablets. You mean he tried to kill himself? I can't think of an easy way anyone could feed him two full bottles, can you? Pull through? Probably. I gave him a good pumping. Don't let them do it. Don't. Don't. All right. It's All murder. Right. Now, murder. Now, now, Mr. Doe, don't murder. carry on so. But I know who did it, sir. I, I, you must stop him. All right. All I, right. I know who is Take it. Take it easy. I, Boy, he's got a lot of strength for a little guy. Mr. Doe, huh? No name. Yeah, nothing to identify him. Funny thing, that. What do you mean? I'd almost guarantee the man's undernourished, hasn't eaten for days, shabby clothes and so on. Yet look at the roll I found in his pocket. Hmm? How much? Almost $800. Oh, did you find anything else? Yeah, this. Huh? What do you make of it? Oh, front page of the Star Times. It's a galley proof, isn't it? Kind that run off in the linotype room before they start the presses. Yeah. Killer dies tonight. Willie Johnson, hitchhike murderer to enter gas chamber at midnight. Uh, innocent, innocent man. It's, right. it's murder, it's murder. Down you go, Mr. Doe. But, but I know who did it, sir. I know everything. I, uh, everything. I uh, know who. A frame. It's a skillful frame. You mean Willie Johnson? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I know who it was. It was, it was... Hail and farewell, sir. Hail and farewell. Who was it? Come on, Mr. Doe, wake up. Mr. Doe. Yeah. I was waiting for that. Hit him? Like a ton of bricks. He'll be incommunicado over the next 24 hours or longer. Hail and farewell. A broken down actor. Huh? Only an actor would think more of an exit line than an innocent man's neck. You mean you believe he... I don't know what I believe. The guy's been trailing me for ten days, driving himself nuts, tries to knock himself off. It's a cinch he believes it. Hmm. Well, there's no chance of bringing him around before tomorrow. Yes, and Willie Johnson dies tonight. So what happens? So I'm stuck for taxi fare to San Quentin. Believe in him? Believe in Willie Johnson? Yeah, I know you're his lawyer, Mr. Grayson. I'm I... his lawyer because I volunteered to serve you, Mr. Spade. I've been in the law a long, long time. I've defended a lot of phonies. Sometimes you've got to if you want to eat. They all sing the same song. I was framed. Oh, I know all 89 verses. But Willie... Yeah? Willie's song is different. Because Willie Johnson's an innocent man. Willie was framed. Mm. Four appeals... Four appeals, four stays. And we've had our last one. It's folded up now, Spade. I'm going to take the walk with him at midnight. So do something for me, will you? Sure, sir. When... When you walk into a cell, remember you're talking to a man who's going to die in less than eight hours. We're trying to... We're trying to build his spirit up so he can go out with the colors flying, you know? Yeah. Don't give him a lot of false hopes, Spade. Because... Because there isn't any... I don't quite understand, Mr. Spade, sir. 
I told my story so many times. I, uh, I'd like to write something about you for the papers, Willie. Oh. Yes, sir. But all the newspaper gentlemen been here and gone. Yeah, I know. Could you tell it just once more, Willie? Well, all right, sir. It was more than a year ago, I guess you know that. Yeah. I was broke, you know. Mm. Things hadn't been going so well, sir. I was down to my last two bits that night. I walked into Sherry Dugan's. That's the bar on the waterfront, huh? Yes, sir. I got to talking with a fella sitting at the bar there. He bought me beer. Who was he? I never did find his name. I ain't seen him since that night. If I could find him, I don't reckon I'd be where I am, sir. Uh. He had a paper with him. Was reading the classified ad section. You know the part about autos, transportation, so on? Yeah. Well, there was an ad there. I'd say we'll pay $500 plus expenses to drive car to Mexico City with a phone number. Mm-hmm. And the fella said if he were my shoes, he'd call up and inquire. So I did. I inquired. Uh, and I got the job. Mm. Well, sir, about an hour later, I met a man with a car at Southern Mason by the gas station there. And he gave me the 500 and I start out for Mexico City. Who was he, Willie? Never found his name either. We tried too, Mr. Grayson. Me. Never could find him. I see. Well, it, it was raining that night, sir. I remember. It was raining. And I hadn't gotten more than 50 miles south of town, somewhere around Morgan Hill it was, hmm. when a siren blew off behind me. And the first thing I knew, well, they was asking me questions about a girl. A girl named Georgia Lyon. Uh huh. It was her car, it seems, and the, the officer claimed I stole it. They, they made me raise my arms and they, they searched me. And, and the, there was a knife in my pocket, you see, with, with blood on it. Mm. There, and I, I, I don't know how it got there. And the $500, that had blood on it, too. And, and there was blood on the seat. And, and, and when they opened the turtle back, there she was. This Georgia Lyon, I told you. Mm. All Double up there and dead, and they they said I'd done it for the money in the car, and I, I, I guess I just went crazy, Mister Spade, with uh, with this all coming at me at once that way. You see, I, I tried to make a break for it, and I got away. And uh, I know I knew it was a terrible wrong thing to do. I know that. Yeah. What about the trial, Will? Well, sir, Mister Grayson done everything in his power, so, mm. and and so did I. Mm. I. Told the truth as close as I could recollect it, but it didn't make no sense. We never found a man in a bar or the man who drove up in the car. What about the phone number in the ad? Oh, that. That turned out to be a fancy dress shop on Powell Street called, uh, uh, Mason Francine. Mm -hmm. And the classified ad, sir, that, that was the queerest thing of all. Well, what do you mean? Well, Mr. Grayson went through every newspaper in the country for two weeks either side of the night. And there wasn't any such ad in any of them. Uh -huh. So they said I was lying. They said I was lying. I made it all up I, in my head. Not now they're going to kill me for it. Yeah. I don't know, Mr. Spade. I've heard it so long now. Maybe I did kill her. Maybe they're right. Maybe they're right. But there was something in the way he said, maybe they're right. I told you they were wrong. I thanked him and told him I had what I wanted for my story and said goodbye. There was no hope in his face, but no despair either. He knew what was coming and he was ready. And that's all. I hit the homeward-bound commuters on the wrong side of the Golden Gate Bridge, so it was almost seven when I checked in at Cherry Dugan's bar on the waterfront. A girl was sitting three stools down from me, a class-type dame in a black file suit from Magnum's, and a hat that must have set some good-time Charlie back 50 bucks. Not the kind of a dame you'd expect to be sitting in Cherry Dugan's, least of all as drunk as she was. Well, here you are, Jack. Sixty cents. Thank you. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? This is a one-man operation, isn't it? Mm, yes, why? Well, then you'd be Sherry Dugan, huh? <laughs> no, no, I, I bought the joint from Sherry a few months back. Why? Well, I'm uh, I'm doing a story for the papers on Willie Johnson. Tell me, was Sherry here on the big night? Oh, yes, 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 only Willie Johnson wasn't. You could look it up, what Sherry testified. Where is he now? Oh, South America. And there he'll stay. You know why? Why? Sherry has brains. For a man in his shoes, there's no better place right now than South America. Oh? Well, tell me more. He needed a rest the worst way, Sherry did. After all he'd been through. Tending bar can be difficult at times, right, Tim? Uh, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Show me a good bartender and I'll show you a bar and diplomat. And more besides. Mm -hmm. 
Now, well, here's the sherry, wherever he is. Keep running, Sherry, keep running. You know, Sherry's like a dog running away from a can tied to his tail. We all are. Who's we? All of us, all of us, the world. Give me another drink, Tim. Oh, now, listen, lady, I don't think I'd Don't give me you. any lip. This is a first-class wake, isn't it? A send-off for Willie, isn't it? Well... Poor. Oh, God. Marilyn, what are you doing here? Uh, well, just in time, George. You sit down. Sit Come on, we're going home. Take your time, George. Two of the members present, one more, will have a quorum. Pour him a drink, Tim. You want me to carry you out of here? Might be fun. Where's Daddy? He's pacing the floor. Now, come on. You know something, George. You've got a can tied to your tail, too. No use running, George. Oh, you're out of your head. Whatever made you come here? Kind of appropriate, don't you think? Special night tonight. What? Dress, the all fixings. Gonna have us awake. Not here we aren't. Are you coming? Nope. All right. Where, where are we going? Going home. Bye, Timmy. And you, whoever you are. Hey, wait, wait, wait. How about to have a... Hold it, hold it. How much does she owe you? Right, that's 345. Uh, here. It's oh. worth it. Now tell me, who is she? Oh, it's a model. Some dress shop uptown. Oh, like the Maison Francine, for instance? Yeah. How'd you know? That's the hunch. What's her name? Oh, Marilyn Hale. Her old man runs the Star Times, you know, the publisher. Yeah. The guy is his partner, George Farewell. You must have heard of the firm Hale and Farewell. I had, but it was a slightly different reading from the one Mr. Spindley gave me at the hospital. I looked at my watch. Willie was four and a half hours from the end of the line when I took off for the press room at the Star Times. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun and music for you tomorrow evening with the Dennis Day Show. There'll be songs by Dennis and another typical tangled comedy situation, the kind of hilarious mix-up that could happen only to Dennis Day. And now, back to the hail and farewell caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Time, 8-11. I got out of the elevator in the basement of the Star Times building on Mission Street and started looking for the press room foreman, somebody named Joe Fortescue. I finally found his feet sticking out from under a sick linotype, hauled him out, and tried to make him understand what I wanted. Yeah, I know, I know who you mean. I know, a little bandy-legged guy. That... Can't hear you. I tell you, I tell you, it's a little bandy-legged guy. Yeah, that's the guy. Hello, what about him? Come on. Go ahead, you first. Ah, now who is he? Oh, uh, Charlie Forrest, he's not. I know, but that's not what I care. Been off his rocker for a year. Look, you see that picture on the wall over your head? Yeah. That's Mr. Hale, the Iron Fist. Oh? Won't tolerate no inefficiency, you understand? But uh, uh, this screwball, this Charlie Forrest, I personally can him twice, and both times Iron Fist sends him back to him. Yeah. So, so uh, don't make no never mind to me, brother. Leave him come to work, student, all the time. Leave him lay off for two straight weeks like this time. <laughs> Don't make no never mind. Yeah, yeah, now look, I'm up with you now. How long's Charlie been this way? Oh, a year or so. I know just when it started. When Willie Johnson was hauled in on the hitchhiking killing, right? Oh, you've been talking to Charlie, huh? Yeah. Uh, funny thing how that hit him. You'd find him sitting in a corner by himself, mumbling all the time about the guy being innocent. Mm -hmm. What do you suppose Charlie had to do with that? Oh, I don't know. Got real crazy toward the end, you know. Said he was killing Willie Johnson. And you'd ask him with what? And he'd say a linotype machine and a hunk of newsprint. One day he even offered to prove it, you know. How? I don't know. He said he had proof. He said he had the evidence that would save Willie's neck. It in his room. Mm -hmm. 
boy. He was the office trolley. Look, I've got to find out where he lives. They don't know upstairs. I don't know. We don't know downstairs, neither. He moved out of his apartment three weeks back, and don't nobody know where he went. Look, he was in this morning. Picked up a galley proof of page one. Uh, That's right. Yeah. I'll tell you who might know where to find him. Oh, come on, come on. About 10 o'clock, he leave here. Said he was going to look him up. Somebody, uh, Somebody named Spade. Thanks. Sam Spade. He's a detective. That remains to be seen. A message, Sam? A bandy-legged little guy named Charlie Forrest, F. He must have been in around 10, 10.30 this morning. Oh, dear, I didn't get here till 11. Uh, They're still clearing stuff off the tracks from the MacArthur reception. Yeah, never mind that now. Listen, write this down. Oh, oh, where did I find a piece of paper? Hurry up. Here, here, under the ashtray. Yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Call Jeremy Grayson. He's a lawyer, and he's with Willie Johnson in the death row at Quentin. Tell him to get hold of a justice on the state Supreme Court and hold the line open till I get him. You got that? Yes, sir. Is there anything else? No, I'll get back to you in a little while. Sam, wait a huh? minute. Don't hang up. What's the matter? <gasps> this paper I'm writing on under the ashtray. It's a note. Well, go ahead. Mr. Spade, please contact me at once. Charles W. Forrest, Bellflower Hotel, 338 Stockton Street. <laughs> It took 20 more minutes to cross town and 10 on top of that to convince the clerk at the Bellflower I had a right to the key to Charlie's room, which I had not. I tossed the room from the light fixture to the floorboards, covered everything from the window shades to the bathroom plumbing. Result, one batch of dirty laundry, six soggy cigarettes, and two empty bottles of sleeping pills. I was on my way out when I remembered one more thing. It wasn't an accident like in the movies. It was on purpose. I unscrewed the tops of the iron bedposts. Inside number three, I found it. There was a payphone at the end of the dark hallway. Sam, I warned you about this. We've had four stays. They won't come through with a fifth. I've got a fair hold card, Grayson. Did you get the judge? Yeah, Benjamin, State Supreme Court. What'd he say? What I knew he'd say. No evidence, no stay. Tell him I got evidence. It better be good, Sam. It is. A phony newspaper, a copy of the Star Times for the night of the murder with a special page in the classified section carrying the ad that Willie answered. How does that sound? You've got it now? Yeah. Well, for Pete's sake, hang on to it. I'll get back to the judge. Say, wait a minute. Uh, who, uh, who's behind it? It's a long story. I'll tell you when I see you. Hang up. Uh, when you what? Spade. Spade. Hang up or I'll kill you. Spade. That's it. You can turn around now. Well, Iron Fist. We've met. I've seen your picture, Mr. Hale. It flattered me, no doubt. Give it to me. What? The paper, stupid. I haven't read the funnies. All right, Mr. Spade, if you'd rather. <laughs> Iron Fist knew other games besides publishing. He moved up, I went for the gun, which suddenly wasn't there, and he was giving me a fast demonstration of judo for beginners. First thing you know, I was sprawled on the floor, and he was looking down at me along the barrel of his thirty-eight. <laughs> I could kill you, I suppose, but why? Why? He backed off toward the window, spread out the paper, and crumbled it up. No. You know what you're doing with that match, Hale. Shut up. You're burning Willie Johnson at the stake. I said shut up. He touched the match to the pile of papers, watched them flare suddenly, lighting up the entire hallway. He looked like a medieval devil. I'm sorry about Willie Spade, but it has to be, that's all. It has to be. What did you have to do with Georgia Lyon? Nothing. Nothing at all. And her name wasn't Georgia Lyon, really. It was her stage name. No. Her real name was Farewell. Your partner's wife? Why, Spade, didn't you read the testimony at the trial? She was leaving George that night. She'd made a noble decision to walk out of his life and leave him free. For your daughter, huh, Marilyn? That's right. And it was such a tragedy Georgia had to run into Willie Johnson the very night she left. Wasn't it, Spade? <laughs> Wasn't it? He bent over the fire, watched it die down into a pile of ashes. I was looking at something else. A draft from the stairwell behind me had picked up a glowing scrap and set it down at the foot of a sleazy window curtain behind him. <laughs> well, that's it, Spade. The last of Willie Johnson. The last of... I hit him at the knees as the curtain went up in a blinding flash. No judo this time, just an old-fashioned hammerlock. There we go. Come on, give me that gun. No. The fire. I'll break your arm, Hale. I'll break your arm. There. Well, that's better. Now get up. Get up. Hale, stop. Hale. I caught him in the leg as he hit the 
the top of the stairway. He took off like an eagle, lit on his neck halfway down, and toppled the rest of the way like a loose packed sack of laundry. He was dead when I got to him. Score, with an hour and five minutes to play, no evidence, one dead witness, one unconscious one, one killer, an accomplice at large. There was only one way left to go, and I took it. Floor, please. George Farewell's apartment. That's the penthouse. Yeah, is he home? Oh, I don't know what's the matter up there, sir. I, I think something's wrong, awfully wrong. Mm-hmm. He went up there early this evening with a young lady, and the door to the roof is locked at the eighth floor. That's never happened before. Any other way up? Well, you might try the fire escape if it's urgent. It is. So I climbed the fire escape at the eighth floor and went up onto the roof, or rather, into George Farewell's patio. I worked my way through a maze of potted shrubbery around a fish pond with a fountain in the middle. Piano music was coming through a pair of French doors. But before I saw where the music was coming from, I knew it was the radio and not the piano. Because the piano, a 14-foot grand, had George Farewell sprawled across the keyboard with a bullet through his head. I crossed to the set of French doors on the other side of the house. There I saw her, standing up on the three-foot parapet surrounding the roof, looking eight floors down into the street. You're not really going to jump, Marilyn. He did it his way. I'm going to do it mine. Don't come any closer. Don't. I won't. So George shot himself, huh? Why not? Can't go through life with a can tied to your tail. No running away from that. No, there isn't. Well, you're going to jump? Give me time. Oh, you want to do it the dramatic way, don't you, Marilyn? Only 35 minutes left until Willie checks out over at the... And to make it really ironic, you'll want to take off before he does, right? The one person left who can save him. I talked to Willie, Marilyn. He must hate the world. He doesn't hate anybody. Poor jerk. I think he'd feel even sorrier for you, throwing your own life away while you can still save his. You can't run away from this tin can, but you can untie it. You can climb down off that wall and ride over to Quentin with me. You can tell him George Farewell killed his wife. Bet the three of you and the little linotyper made a pigeon out of Willie. Ah. Uh, I held my breath. She swayed, looked down into the street, poising herself. Then she turned round and stepped onto the roof again. Let's go. Congratulations. Yeah. Only George Farewell didn't stab his wife that night. I did. <laughs> Pulled up at Quentin with six minutes to spare. The foregoing Justice Benjamin is submitted in support of the stay of execution granted Willie Johnson and will be set forth in detail in Mr. Grayson's petition for a new trial. Period. End of report. Gee, Willie can say it. What can I say? Well, I have one constructive suggestion. I could say you're the greatest. Finest, most wonderful... Yes, but you'd only be repeating yourself, Tara. The proper line at this moment is, I shall have the report ready for you immediately following the next announcement. Right? Scoot. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Listen to the stars on this Sunday's big show. Jimmy Durante, Ethel Merman, Milton Berle, and Gordon McRae, plus Meredith Wilson and his orchestra. Your MC on the big show, of course, is the glamorous Tallulah. You're invited. Here it is, Sam. Sam? Hmm? Here's the report. Oh, yeah, yeah. What are you writing, Sam? Now, look, how's this? Man of the world, dashing, debonair, cosmopolitan, temporarily at liberty, desires employment. (laughs) Sounds wonderful. Thank you. What does it mean? Uh, All right, we'll drop it down a few notches. Private investigator, accomplished raconteur, will tell troubles to listening public. Nice telephone voice. Contact Sam Spade, 1 East 48th Street, New York. 1 East 48th Street? Yeah, my address during the summer months, Cherub. You got it? 1 East 48th Street, Mm -hmm. New York City. Mm 
Oh, maybe a lot of people will write, Sam. I'm sure they will. Think so? There'll always be a Samuel Spade Incorporated. Will there? Look ahead. Smile through the tears, Sam. I am. The day will come soon again when... When the when... phone will ring and you will say... Sam Spade Detective Agency. Yes, and I will say... <laughs> Me, sweetheart. Buck up, old girl. Stout fella. Stiff upper lip. Good show. Not goodbye, but... Oh, reward, Sam. Hail and farewell. Good night, sweetheart. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Sam Spade was produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn, Lorene Tuttle as Effie. Also in the cast were Junius Matthews, Olin Soleil, Wally Mayer, Sidney Miller, Kathy Lewis, Paul Fries, Ed Max, and Lou Merrill. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Swanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Detective Agency. Hello, hello, hello. Sam? At this hour on this network, you were expecting maybe Mary Margaret McBride? I've been expecting anything, Sam. Well, After all, to have you drop out of sight like that, leaving not a, a ripple on the surface for four whole days. Mr. Livingstone is frantic. Who? Mr. Livingstone, the man you rented the car from, he's, he, he's ready to send out a search party. Aha! Sammy and Livingstone with a reverse twist. It's no joke, Sam. Nothing, huh? You, you have no right to worry me like this. Mm. It's not fair. Where are you? To the only spot on Earth as yet unvisited by the National Geographic Society, sweetheart. The Vale of Takaloma. And don't try to find it on a map because it isn't. Set yourself for my saga of a crook's tour of the hinterlands with just a touch of mysticism, which is why I call it the Rowdy Dowser Caper. All right, Murgatroyd, these will do. Sam, where are you calling from? A tailor shop. I had to leave without my pants. <laughs> For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all, starring Stephen Dunn in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Dum da da dum 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 When you and I were young Effie Sam? Who else? Are you decent? Decent? Well, you said you'd lost your pants, so... Oh! Yeah, how do they look? Well? Isn't it a little early for Halloween? Ooh, you made a joke. You ready, woman? As always, Sam. They fill it in to Constable Ollie Shuttle, North Takaloma, California. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Rowdy Dowser Caper. Dear Ollie... <laughs> On Wednesday, it was when I returned to my office of a fine spring morning to find a note lying on my desk like a big, juicy piece of cheese in a mousetrap. Quote, Mr. Spade, call North Taka... Taka Loma? Three. Unquote. <sighs> North Taka Loma. Where have I... Long distance. North Taka Loma, three. Yes, sir. One moment. Uh... Would you repeat the number, please? North Takaloma, three. North Takaloma, three. I stick you. That is North Takaloma? I'm not kidding. Look it up, girl. Look it up. Yes, sir. North Takaloma, three. Well, she must have found it in the book because soon we had encouraging buzzes and clicks. Six operators later, we had punched our way north to the farm at Slattery Flat. Then we knocked off for lunch while Slim Slattery repaired the windmill that made the juice for the last lap. At 2.07 p.m., victory was in sight. Yeah? Sam, this is Operator Nyan for the tenth time. Oh, fine. Uh, How we doing, Millie? Sam, boy, I am actually ringing North Takaloma 3. No oh, good girl. Hello? 
Hello? Hello, this is Sam Spade. I have a note here. To oh, call yes, yes, Mr. Spade. You were out of town when I came. Perhaps you remember me. Uh, Wendell Wisby of Oak Tree Lane, what? North Takaloma, California. Wendell? I employed you a year ago to find a girl who vanished. The magician. You made the girl disappear and couldn't bring her back. Uh, correct. Yeah. You may well ask, Mr. Spade, how anything could be worse than that. Well, this... This... Is. <laughs> oh, there, Wendell. There, boy. Take it easy. I, I can't talk. I, I just can't talk about it. Fine, fine. Then write me a nice, long letter. Uh, well, you know, I'd this rather... is a long-distance call, and I... No, no, I... no, no, no. I... I am sorry, Mr. Spade, but this has affected me very deeply. Look, you promised you'd lay off the magic, Wendell. Well, What'd you I... do? Misplace half a woman this time? No, I have given up magic, Mr. Spade. I am currently employed as third vice president of the Second National Bank of North Takaloma. All that? Yes, sir. Oh, my star was rising. My future seemed assured, but... Now a shadow has fallen over my good name. Boot it along, will you, Wendell? This is costing me money. I cannot tell you more on the phone, Mr. Spade. You must come at once. It is extremely urgent. I see. Well, frankly, Wendell, I have a feeling I'll be tied up. But I left There's your a retainer under I have your to desk, make, and Well, the chances are I'll... What was that? I just said there's a hundred dollars under your desk plotter for a retainer. I left it when I came with a note. But if, if you have a collection to make, suppose uh, I... Wendell, that is the collection. <laughs> And so it befell that shortly before lunch on the following day, I guided my rented hack across the ford at Clobber Creek, up the high road through Possum Notch, and down into the Vale of Takaloma, where I muscled my way through a flock of geese in the main street and tied up before the imposing stone facade of the Second National Bank. Inside, sitting in front of the door marked Urban Root President, sat a secretary whose facade looked colder and even more imposing than the banks. She was shriveling one of the customers, a meek little milk toast in a salt and pepper soup. But as I informed you, my good man, President Root is extremely tied up at the moment. Oh, I'm quite aware of that, miss. I wouldn't bother him for the world, but you see, uh, I... No, I don't see. I... And since you refuse to state the nature of your business... Uh, did I, I refuse? You most certainly did. Oh, dear me, I didn't mean to refuse anything. It's just that... Well, it's sort of personal, and uh, may I go in? You may sit down until I tell you to go in. Is that clear? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, I don't. I, I understand. I don't mind waiting. Don't mind at all. <clears throat> uh, and now you, sir. What do you want? I have an appointment with Wendell Wisby. Uh, Mr. Wisby is in conference with the President Root. Thanks. Sir. If you'll sit down, I'll. Uh, just a minute, sir. Uh, just a minute. And you must understand, President Root, this is a matter of family honor. Yes. I shall. Oh, hi, Wendell. Oh, Mr. Spade. Now, sorry I couldn't get here sooner, but it's a long haul. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Spade is a friend of mine, President Root, from my solid days as a magician. A very competent detective, I might add. Well, thank you, Wendell. Hey, I see. We, uh, we are indeed fortunate to have him with us in this matter. Good, good. Uh, please sit down, Mr. Spade. Thanks. Uh, you are aware, Mr. Spade, this matter is to be held in strictest confidence. Word must be kept from the depositors at all costs until... But remember, uh, President Root, eh? remember the code of the Wisbys. Should worse come to worst, I shall make good. I shall make good if it takes I me... I understand, Wisby. I understand. Well, mind if I admit I don't. What is it, Wendell? Snatcher. Snatch whom? Uncle Purse. Our former cashier, Mr. Speed. Purse Snatcher. Wisby's uncle. Purse Snatcher. What about him? Everything. He has disappeared. Absconded. That is a harsh word, President Root. I would prefer to say he disappeared until we have further proof. The money's gone, isn't it? How much money? $53,000. From Uncle Purse's accounts. Yeah. It may be he has absconded, President Root, but we must remember that despite the snatcher surname, Uncle Purse is a Wisby. And a Wisby never lived who got away with $53,000. All right, Wisby. He disappeared. Yes, may I ask when he disappeared? Last Friday night, about nine o'clock. Anyone see him go? Almost everyone. His car stalled at Main and Persimmon. Several people saw him trying to start it. Some... He was acting very strangely. Oh, how was that, Wendell? Well, uh, Clem Clobber huh? and Charity Fid and several others spoke to him from the curb, but he wouldn't answer them. He didn't say a word to anyone, which is not at all like Uncle Purse Snatcher. Wisby, man to man. Would you feel sociable with a satchel full of stolen money on the seat beside you? Well, there you have a point, President Root. I can't blame you for the way you feel, President Root. 
But I must continue to believe the best of Uncle Purse until Mr. Spade discovers the worst. No. <laughs> and in that dismal eventuality, please know I intend to pay off the $53,000 plus interest on the installment plan. $5.37 per week for 48 years. Oh. You have my word on it, sir. The word of a Wisby. With which solemn pronouncement, Wendell marched out, closely followed by me. Salt and pepper suit milk toast was still fingering his hat brim, looking hopefully at Miss Icewater for the sign. At Wendell's suggestion, I hustled out to the Snatcher homestead for a word with Percy's wife, a timid little woman with her heart in her eyes, known from one end of the valley to the other as Aunt Wistful. I can hardly think straight these days, Mr. Spade. So full of puzzlement, this thing has left me. Well, of course, Aunt Wistful. <laughs> Have another dipper of cider, Mr. Spade. Oh, get down, not you. No, thanks, Aunt Wistful. First wasn't himself since the well run dry. We had a parcel of dry winters here in the valley, you know, but oh. never for this is the well run dry. First didn't know which way to turn. The pipe ends two miles down the road. Couldn't afford to bring it in here. I see. He took to muttering to himself, saying strange things. Coming home from his work at the bank with a frown on his face. He stayed there all evening. What do you mean, strange thing? Oh, I don't recollect very well. He brought a law book home one night, though, and out of a clear sky, he says to me, Wistful, honey, do you know the punishment for embezzlement is five to ten years in prison? I asked what he meant by that, and he said he thought it might be a good thing for a banker to know. Well, he had something there. It was the night after that. He come home all cheerful. Said he thought he'd figured a way out. Found a fellow to help him. Get down. I had no idea what Purse was thinking. Uh, what fellow? Urban Root, I suppose. Oh, Urban. It's Urban's bank he was fixing to steal from. Mm -hmm. But then I got word from my sister ailing over to Fogger de Gros. So Thursday I left, and when I got back Saturday, he'd gone. Now, did he take his things? Mostly. Funny. He did one strange thing for this time of year. He left his corn teeth behind. Corn teeth? Huh? A spare pair of store teeth for corn on the cob. Oh. The person missing now was summer coming on. Yes, yes, you know. Bless him. You know, ever since spring, I've been after Purse to spade up my flower bed by the window. Mm. <laughs> he did it before he left, now that there's no water to grow things with. I loved him so much, Mr. Spade, in this awful way for marriage to him. Oh, get down! <laughs> Well, I started at Main and Persimmon Streets and worked south, farm by farm. Everyone seemed to have been sitting on his front stoop Friday night because all remembered Purse Snatcher driving out on the south road in his 1919 Winton 6. Up to a point, that is. Somewhere between North Takaloma and Fogarty Grove, I ran out of witnesses. And in Piney Crotch, of all places, the town beyond... They could guarantee Purse didn't pass through because the main drag was roped off all Friday night for a square dance. And thus matters stood on the third day when I limped back to the bank. For some reason, a crowd had gathered in the alleyway next door. Writing it off as a floating crap game, I walked inside, bowed formally to Miss Icewater, then plunked myself down at Wendell's desk. Oh, Shaw, uh, I just found I miscalculated on the interest... At $5.37 per week, I won't have this paid off until I'm 134. And who knows? By then, you may even have a wife and children to support. Look, don't you think you were a little impetuous with that retainer? What retainer? Mine, the $100. $100? Wendell, the $100 you stuck under my desk blotter when you hired me. I hired you? You came to my office while I was out of town, Wendell. You left a note for me to call you. I talked to you on the telephone. Well, didn't I? 
Mr. Spade, something is very wrong. I did not talk to you on the telephone at all. What? I, I thought you were employed by President Root. Well, where is President Root? I don't know. He stepped out some time ago, and there's someone waiting for him in his office. Oh? Do, 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 do. Hi, Miss Icewater. Oh, tell me, pretty mean. Are there any more at home like you? Well, <laughs> no toast. <laughs> But with a difference, the salt and pepper suit had gone. Beret, bow tie, plaid sport jacket with a racing form sticking out of the pocket. Maroon plus fours and wool socks with tassels. He took one of President Ruth's cigars out of his pocket, bit off the end, and lit it. Then smiled, or rather leered, at Miss Ice Water. <laughs> well, honey. I'm sorry, oh, sir. Oh, 23 skidoo, sweet stuff. Uh, President Ruth will be back shortly if you. <laughs> Oh, don't be a back number, beautiful. But, sir, I don't... Ah, 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 Papa love Mama? Well, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> You'll learn. <laughs> Tell Cookie I'll be back, huh? Uh, yes, sir. Anything you say. Live a little, baby. Live a little. <laughs> Toodaloo. <laughs> Golly! Golly, indeed. Uh, Miss Icewater. Hey. Oh. What? Was that? Uh, I don't know his name. A friend of Peasant Roots. Uh, he, uh, he's rather attractive, don't you think? <laughs> Only now, as I went outside in his wake, did I see what had caused the crowd in the alleyway. The first sport model convertible in Tolokoma Valley since Wally Reed came through on location. And the first pink one I'd ever seen. Pondering the new milk post, I walked into the drugstore, found a phone book, and checked all 25 names. North Takaloma 3 belonged to the Atomic Auto Courts and Restaurant, Charity Fid, proprietress. She was riding herd on a griddle full of lamb chops when I pulled up at the counter. How's that again, Sonny? Short, you say? Short. And scalped on top with a fringe of hair like so? Yeah, and a wicked leer in his eye. That's my man. Well, he wasn't wearing no barrack hat nor plaid coat when I seen him. Salt and pepper suit it was. Yeah, I know. Who is he? Well, he didn't register, but they say he's Dowser. Dowser? Hmm. Uh, don't know his first name, do you? Nope. Now, where he come from? Stayed in room six till two days ago. Ain't seen him around since. When did he come here? Uh, let me see now. Uh, codfish balls. Beg pardon? Oh, that'd be Friday night, late. Oh. The funny thing now, think of it, he'd come afoot. Not by the road from Fogarty Grove, mind you, but by the trail over the ridge. Oh, where does it go to, Aunt Charity? Winds up the old clobber place. Banda now. Oh, thanks. I'll be back. You'll I'll... be nothing. You just sit right down where you are and you wrap yourself around this. Ain't no growing boy going hiking over the ridge without supper. Clean it up now, every scrap. Yes, Ma. <laughs> It had been dark about two hours when carrying one of Aunt Charity's best coal oil lanterns, I topped the ridge and looked down on Clem Clobber's abandoned barn, nestling in a grove of ancient oaks at the very foot of the hill. The moon was bright enough to show up the pair of grassy ruts leading from the rear of it down the gully toward the road to Fogarty Grove, a couple of miles away. On general principles, I blew out the lantern, then scrambled down the side hill and up to the barn door. I couldn't make out anything inside at first, and then finally something took shape. A dark hulk in the middle of the floor. Stupid me, I lit a match. It was an automobile. To be exact, it was Purse Snatchers, 1919, Wenton 6. His hat and the tweed overcoat everyone saw him wearing Friday night were lying across the front seat. I held the match higher and bent over for a closer look. Whereupon Spade and the match went out together. <laughs> You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun for you Sunday with two of your favorite families, the Blandings and the Harrises. Mr. and Mrs. Blanding stars Cary Grant and Betsy Drake in the title roles as the proud but somewhat bewildered owners of the famous Dream House. The Phil Harris Alice Faye Show stars Phil and Alice, of course, plus ever-helpful Frankie Remley, Brother William, and delivery boy Julius. Yes, there are laughs this Sunday and every Sunday with the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show and Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. <laughs> Now, back to 
back to the Rowdy Dowser Caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. <laughs> I must apologize, Constable, for succumbing once again to the traditional nemesis of the private eye. But the bald facts are simply that I bent over for a closer look at the Wenton Six and was struck a dastardly blow on the rear of the head. How long I remained incommunicado, I know not, but I awoke presently and with good reason. My pants were on fire. As a matter of fact, the entire barn was on fire, and I was lying in the tonneau of the Winton Six wearing purse snatcher's overcoat. The door I'd come in was a wall of flame, likewise the stalls on both sides. But at the rear were a few square feet of rotten siding that hadn't caught yet. Now, ordinarily, I'd have thought twice, but when your pants are afire, you only think once. So I ran right through it and took a flying header into the creek behind the barn. It was just as well I only thought once, since at this moment the flames reached the Winton's gas tank. Hi. Good laws almighty, what have you been up to, boy? Smoking corn silk behind Clobber's barn. Match got away from me. Well, stay right there till I find my goose grease. No, 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 no. Later, Aunt Charity. How about the key to six? The dowser fella? Yeah. Won't need no key, son. No door open? If he left it open, he's in there now. Barrett hat, plaid coat, and a 25 cent cigar. Help yourself. <laughs> Well. What? Well, hey, Mr. Spade, isn't it? Right, and you're Dowser. Mm. Dowser? Isn't it? Do- uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Dowser. Uh, you can call me Alonzo. Sit down. No, no, I'll stand. Oh? You're lucky you caught me. I was just... Just leaving, so I see. I was detained, as you probably know, over at Clobber's barn. Detained? Okay, Dowser. We'll let that do for the preliminaries. Now, why'd you just try to kill me? Uh, kill you? Well, good heavens, man, I... I did not get careless at a weenie-baked dowser. I just woke up in the middle of a three-alarm fire, and I don't like it. As a matter of fact, I'm a little burnt up, to use the phrase loosely, and I just might kick your teeth in. Now, now, believe me, I haven't been near Clobber's barn since Friday. I had nothing to do with... with whatever happened. Sure, and you had nothing to do with a hundred-buck retainer in the phone call from Wendell Wisby. Well, as a matter of fact, You I... figured with a curious city fellow like me on the premises, urban route might shake down easier. Okay. Bigger apples from the same old tree, right? Yeah, all I did was negotiate a personal loan. Drop it, will you? Root had his hand on the till at the bank. A big hand, $53,000 worth, and Snatcher found out about it. What about you? How'd you get into the act? Uh, the loan. The shakedown. Where's Uncle Purse, Alonzo? Uh, out of town somewhere, I suppose. He. Uh, look, I can't tell you, Mr. Spade. Purse got as far as the road to Clem Clubber's barn last Friday night. Or did he? Uh, no. No, he didn't get that far. You know... I'd begun to suspect as much. How far did he get? I'm sorry, I can't tell you anymore. Root killed him, didn't he? No, no. You saw him. How come? I don't know anymore. Please, come on, let's have it, Dowser. What did he do with the body? Root wore the coat and drove Purse's car out of town so everyone would see him. Now, where's the body? Let me go. Let me go. Dowser! Dowser! He squirted out of my hands like a watermelon seed, leaving me with a plaid coat and took off down the line of atomic cabins toward the atomic restaurant. A nice high knee action for a little guy. And what with my burns and contusions, I'm forced to admit he was widening the gap between us when he rounded the corner of the atomic restaurant, making possibly the gravest error of his career. Aunt Charity was rounding the same corner, coming the other way with an armload of wood. You don't reckon he got himself a brain conclusion, do you, son? I don't know, but he's a weak witness, Aunt Charity, a weak witness. What you got there? Oh, shoebox for $1,500. A <whistles> few odds and ends, and this. Well. Yeah, it looks like an oversized slingshot fork. Slingshot? What do you mean, slingshot? Well, who cares? So he whittles. Where'd you get the idea his name was Dowser? Huh? Driver's license in his wallet. Alonzo P. Scoggins. Who said his name was Dowser? You did. I never said his name was Dowser. I said he was a Dowser. Oh, oh. And uh, what's a Dowser, Aunt Cherry? A guy who finds water for people, that's what. Well, that's nice. If you could... Finds water? Yeah. 
How? Well, I'm no expert, Sonny, but as near as I can recollect, you take this here slingshot for so and then you... Mr. Spade, I I can't go through with it. Get hold of yourself, Wendell. Remember the code of the wisdom. But this sinister revelation has virtually prostrated me, Mr. Spade. And you must remember, it is now over a year since my salad days as a magician. Tut, tut, Wendell. Stout fellow, stiff upper. And further, even at the peak of my career, I was only sketchily acquainted with the field of dowsery. Hold it. Hmm? There they are. Aunt Wistful is sitting on the back porch with President Root. Mr. Spade, I... The I, code of the whiz Wendell? <sighs> yes, sir. Let's go. President Ruth, I just can't tell you how full up of gratefulness I am. Now, now, Aunt Wistful, don't take on so. It's nothing at all. It's... Uh, 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 you remember Mr. Spade, President Root? Wait, wait, wait. Of course. Of course. I, hardly seems any time at all since we met President Root. Oh, Mr. Spade, President Root's going to buy the farm. Isn't that wonderful? Touching. And he's allowing me 10000 on it mm-hmm. against the money per stove. Well, that's a generous offer. Yeah, I thought so. Considering there's no water on the farm. Oh, Pierce said many times it wouldn't be worth $40 an acre for that water. Well? Um... Uh, did you say something, Wendell? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Aunt Wistful, I have great news for you. It may not be necessary to sell the farm. What do you mean, Wendell? We've made a deal here. Uh, maybe the signals are off for now, President Rude. You recall Uncle Purse said he'd found a man to solve his problem, Aunt Wistful? I am now ready to step forward and bring it into the open. I am that man. You! What do you mean, Wendell? Since entering the banking field, I divorced myself from magic and the allied dark arts, Aunt Wistful. So I wish to keep my other talent sub rosa. What are you talking about, Wisby? President Root, I am a part-time dowser. And he just happens to have his dowsing rod along, right, Wendell? Right. I have reason to believe there is water here, if I can just douse it out. Wendell, you're out of your... Shut up. Douse away, Wendell. Douse away. Very well. Now, I hold the dowsing fork before me. Thus... Then I turn thus. Where does it point, Wendell? Let me see. Toward Aunt Wistful's flower bed. This, this is ridiculous. Shut up. Proceed, Wendell. Proceed with the dowsery. One step, two, three, four. Well, the rod's five, pointing down. Oh, right in the middle of my flower bed. Hey, hey, listen, Aunt Wistful. I'll make that 20000 $20,000 for the farm. Cash, see? Not credit. Cash. Well, Hold out. Uh, 25. 25. Uh, 30. Right here is where we dig. Uh, 35. 35,000. Well, this has already been dug up. Looks as if Uncle Purse had dug a hole and then filled it back up. Last Friday night, just before 9 o'clock, right, President Root? <laughs> no, no. You came no, down no. for a showdown on those shortages he turned up. Found him digging the well here and got a better idea. <laughs> Please, no. I've talked to the guy who saw you do it, Root. <laughs> All right. All right. I killed him. He's, he's right here. Yes, he's right here. Which is where you came in, Constable, and since you can take it from here, I shall close, as always, with... Period. End of report. Right. Another triumph, Sam. Another new sphere of effort. No field is safe from my talent, sweetheart. You will please preserve it for posterity during the following 15-second announcement. Scoot. Scoot. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. This Sunday, the glamorous and unpredictable Tallulah brings you another hour-and-a-half broadcast of The Big Show, starring Fred Allen, Judy Holliday, Joan Davis, Frank Warren, and many more. And this Sunday's Theater Guild on the Air production is the Broadway comedy, The First Year. Starring in this Theater Guild presentation are Richard Widmark and Catherine Grayson. <laughs> Efficient girl. Yeah? Yeah, Millie, this is Sam, boy. What's up? Oh? Oh. Thanks, Millie. Well, what is it, Sam? They just relayed a message from Fogarty Grove, F. Wendell is being installed as second vice president tomorrow night at the Moose Hall. Oh? He wants me to come. Oh! 
<gasps> and bring a girl. Are you game, little one? Well, that's one way to get the report to Constable Ollie Shuttle. <laughs> I'll do it, Sam. Good girl. Pack up an emergency ration of sorghum and hominy grits. I'll pull up at your doorstep in the morning at 8 o'clock. Well, I'll wear my sunbonnet and Mother Hubbard. <laughs> oh, good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn, Lorene Tuttle as Effie. Also in the cast were Peggy Weber, Verna Felton, Sidney Miller, Alice Wellman, Charles Smith, and Nestor Piva. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Swanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another Adventure with Sam Spade. Transcribed. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. What? Oh, Fritz, yeah, I thought it was the outside line. Yeah? Yes, thanks, I'll be right down, Fritz. Boss, Mr. Wolf, will you please hurry? You're well aware that it will avail you nothing to hurry me? Why you Mr. Ware be in such a rush today? But the car, it's downstairs waiting. Fritz is all ready. Let him wait. Isn't it enough that I've agreed against my better judgment to leave the comforts of home to go rushing through the crashing traffic of the city? To a dinner, that should be an inducement. Fritz could have prepared a delicious dinner. He has truffles in the pantry. Well, why did you promise Arthur Merle? You didn't have to accept the invitation. Quite so. He's an old friend. Besides, he does set an excellent table. It's just that I don't like the traffic. Traffic? <laughs> I know why. It's that awful oxygen in the atmosphere outside. It's not the traffic. Archie, you're talking much too much. I know, boss. I'm impatient. Would you mind giving me some slight indication that you intend to move from that chair? Just as soon as I finish this beer. Sure you wouldn't care for half a dozen sandwiches before we go to dinner? If we were going anywhere other than to Arthur Merrill's, I'd agree with you. He's the only person in the world I know of, except myself, of course, who has a proper appreciation and respect for the art of preparing good food. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-born mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> We usually refer to this story as the case of the final page. Under normal circumstances, the last page of a manuscript would be absolutely worthless unless you read all the preceding pages. But in this instance, the final page held the answer to a murder. Without that page, we couldn't arrive at the solution. Actually, we didn't even know the problem. Anyhow, I finally got Nero Wolf to the lobby of Arthur Merle's apartment building. Going up. Going up. Up, please. Are you going up, gentlemen? Are you, honey? Certainly. It's my job. Then so are we. After you, boss. When did they install women elevator operators in this building? I've been here for two years. Floor, please. Arthur Merle's apartment, I believe. It's 814. That's right. Are you Mr. Wolf? Uh, no. This is Mr. Wolf. I'm Archie Goodwin. Although the name Wolf would be much more appropriate for him than for me. How did you know he was Mr. Wolf? Mr. Merle came in half an hour ago. He mentioned that he was expecting you. You see, Archie, you rushed me unnecessarily. We practically preceded him here, and we'll probably have to wait interminably for dinner. I just hate to be late. Arthur Merrill has never been on time in his life. He's no more punctual than any other writer. He's never been known to meet a deadline on time. This is your floor, gentlemen. Arthur Merle is just down the hall to the right, 814. Uh, thank you. And uh, by the way, I want to compliment you on your congenial attitude, miss. I'll speak to management. Oh, thank you, sir. Decent of you. Uh, what's your name, huh? Women are usurping everything. Really cost to live here. Merle's really in the chips. Every book he writes sells a million copies. Remember the last time we had dinner with Arthur Merle? I do. Delicious. Mountain quail shot them himself. Yeah, he's quite a marksman. 
Archie, such proficiency as Arthur Merrill displayed in hunting is evidence of a wasted life. Sure, he probably never made over $500,000 a year in his whole life. Well, ring again, don't just stand there. Surely he's expecting us. The elevator operator said he was? Yeah, she seemed quite well informed. If I were a judge of women, which I am not, I'd say she has a line on every male in the building. She can get a line on me anytime she wants. Archie, your insatiable interest in the female seems sometimes to border on the psychopathic. You know a more pleasant way to go crazy? Phooey. This strange as a light on in there. I can see it under the door. Shall I try the door? Do so, Archie. Thank you. Mm, unlocked. Well, at least we can get in. He may be in the bedroom. Probably in the kitchen. I'll just sit here. <sighs> I must forgo the comforts of my own home. I certainly intend to avail myself of the comforts of Arthur Merle's. Hmm. Very much over-decorated. You wouldn't like heaven unless they had orchids and beer. Hmm. Not a chair in the place worthy of the name. Well, I'll try that divan while you have a look around. For what? Arthur Merle, of course. Suppose you have a look in the study. Maybe writing. Have a look, my boy. I am exhausted and thirsty. See if he has any... Boss! Vi- Boss! Good heavens, Archie. Don't shout. Uh, I'm coming. It's Arthur Merle. Look. Slumped over his desk. A knife in his back. Yeah. He's quite dead. You haven't touched anything? Certainly not. I've been around long enough to know that. Well, you just call Inspector Kramer at Homicide. How long do you think he's been dead? I'd say a half hour. From all appearances, yes. And perhaps only ten minutes. I can't understand it. Why would anyone want to kill Arthur Merle? Everybody liked him. Nice man I'd expect such a thing to happen to. The answer is probably a considerable distance from the question, Archie. Inspector Kramer, Homicide. Archie Goodwin, Inspector. Just a minute, Nero Wolf wants to speak to you. I'm sorry. Here you are, boss. Hello, Inspector. Yes? What is it this time, Wolf? Find a dead body on the Grand's tomb? <laughs> I'm sorry you'll forgive any apparent failure to find humor in your little witticism. But I'm at Arthur Merle's apartment. I suggest you come here at once. Seems that Arthur finally met a deadline. <laughs> So, you just walked in here and found Merle dead, huh? We were invited here for dinner. Hmm. Anyone else around when you got here? No. You see anyone, Goodwin? Only the elevator operator who brought us up. Well, Mr. Wolf, since you were in on the ground floor, maybe you've got some ideas. Sorry, Inspector. Had I been able to solve the crime so soon, I would have advised you, Inspector. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it's obviously murder. Obviously. You knew him well? Quite well. Ever know of his being in any trouble? No. Everybody liked him. Arthur Merle, I felt, didn't have an enemy in the world. Mm, Is that so? I don't think anybody pulled this as a little friendly gesture. Don't jump to conclusions, Inspector. That this murder was committed necessarily by an enemy of Merle's. Meaning? It could have been an absolute stranger. A woman? Or a burglar? Or a madman? Or a crank? Or... As far as we know, it could have been anybody in the city, Inspector. Arthur's been dead nearly an hour. And an hour ago, I was in my own home, sitting comfortably in my own big easy chair, drinking a delectable glass of beer. Someone at the door, Archie. Yeah, just a minute. I'll answer that. Mr. Merle? No. Uh, Well, is Mr. Merle here? Yes, he's here. But he's not seeing anyone. Well, he's expecting me. I'm from the Serve Right Catering Company. We're ready to serve for four here tonight. The dinner has been canceled. Oh, but it's been ordered. Breast of guinea hen, cooked in wine and cloves, delicious. It's prepared and waiting. I'm afraid that I must insist on seeing Mr. Merle. Mr. Merle has been murdered. Well, I'm afraid I must... uh, Murdered? Oh, my goodness, but... Well, in that case, I... Yes, good evening. 
Don't you think you might have taken a bit more time with the fellow, Inspector? Why? You might at least have let him serve the dinner. Guinea hen, wine, and clove sounded positively, delectably... Look, I've had dinner. I'm afraid you're too busy, Inspector. So busy that you've just passed up an extremely interesting bit of information. What are you talking about, Wolf? He said he was to serve dinner for four. Well? Arthur Merle, Archie, and myself are only three. Well, who else was supposed to be here? A fourth guest who either hasn't arrived yet or who arrived earlier and left. Oh, I see what you mean, Wolf. Good. In that case, I'll leave you to pursue your deductions from that premise. Archie, will you please stay with the inspector and be of any help that you can? As for myself, I'm going back to my own home, which I should never have left in the first place. <laughs> Okay, that finishes the apartment search, Goodwin. And what have we? Nothing. Except that Merle had over $300 in his pocket, and he was wearing a ring worth a couple of thousand, so it couldn't have been robbery. And I don't think it was premeditated murder. Why not? The weapon. Obviously, if someone had planned on killing Merle, he'd have prepared it better. Used a better weapon than a blunt paper knife. No, as I see it, someone was here before you and Wolf arrived, and for some reason that person found it necessary to kill Merle, and he did it on the spur of the moment. I'm listening. Well, it's obvious. Merle was slumped over his typewriter. The sheet of paper was in it. He'd been working. May I see it? Yeah. Starbreaker. Strange title. Page 189. He was getting well along with his latest mystery. Mm, apparently. Okay. Gregory Thorne slipped the paper into his pocket. It was just an ordinary piece of paper, but Gregory knew its value. Used properly as Greg knew how to use it, it would be worth $100,000. He walked away briskly, and as he... That's all. Yeah, that's all. Must have been right. No, I'd like to read the rest of it. We didn't find any more of it. Any other ideas? No, at the moment we seem to be right where the murderer himself left off. Oh, what is this, open house? Sorry to be so... Oh. Oh, what? I was... I mean, I expected to see Mr. Merle. Is he here? Well, who are you? Cynthia Roberts. He expecting you? Well, no. That is... Uh, come on in, Miss Roberts. Thank you. Maybe the young lady is trying to say that he didn't have to expect her. Maybe she fell free to call without advance notice, Inspector. Inspector? Uh, what did you want to see Mr. Merle about? I... Well, I'm his fiance. Oh. Had dinner yet, Miss Roberts? Why, yes, I had dinner earlier. Uh, when I... were you last here, Miss Roberts? <laughs> Last night, after the theater, Arthur and I were... What's the matter? Is something wrong? I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Miss Roberts, but Arthur Merle was murdered. <laughs> and you say you hadn't talked to Mr. Merle all evening. Is that right, Miss Roberts? Yes, that's right. You didn't have a date with him tonight? Oh, no. Then why did you come here? I told you we were engaged. I just came by, that's all. I see. Any more questions, Inspector? Yeah, none for the present. How about you, Goodwin? Nope. But maybe Wolf. Let me call him. Yes, I guess under the circumstances, we can't very well leave him out. <clears throat> Go ahead. Oh, Arthur, I just can't believe it. Why would anyone want to kill him? That, Miss Roberts, is a question we'd all like to know the answer to. Yeah, Wolf speaking. Archie, boss, I'm still at Merle's. We haven't found out anything new except that Arthur's fiance dropped in a few minutes ago. Did she know anything of interest? I don't think so. What does the inspector plan to do about it? Uh, just a minute. He wants to know what you're going to do with her. Well, hold her, of course. He's going to hold her. Let me speak to him. Okay. He wants to talk to you, inspector. All right. Hello. Inspector, I suggest you let the young lady go. Are you crazy? I haven't got enough suspects in this deal to be letting the hottest one go free. You can't consider her a suspect simply because she knew Arthur. Now see here, Wolf. If you go around arresting people at random, you'll suddenly be tipping your hand to the real murderer, admitting that you don't have a real clue to go on. And just what do you suggest? Find a motive, Inspector. Find a motive. Then if you stumble on a suspect, you'll have some basis for making an arrest. At the moment, I suggest that you let the girl go and tell Archie to stop wasting his time down there and come home at once. So that's the story, boss. We went over that place with a fine-tooth comb. Nothing. There's not a single suspect. The last person to see Arthur alive was the elevator girl. 
Correction, Archie. The last person to see Arthur Merle alive was the person who ended his life. Well, I just can't imagine that pretty little elevator gal. You don't solve crimes by imagination, Archie. Then there's Cynthia Roberts, his fiance. You suspect her? Not exactly, but just suppose she did have a motive. Maybe he threw her over. Wouldn't it have been very clever of her to come back to Arthur's apartment after the police arrived, allegedly looking for him? I thought you were the admirer of the fair to six, Archie. So far, the best you can do is practically accuse the elevator girl and Arthur's fiancé of murder. Well, who else is there? Certainly the fellow who came with the food doesn't count. I repeat, who else is there? The entire population of the city, Archie. Thanks. Well, that's all I get. Oh, well, there was something else. What? This. Page 189 of what appears to be Arthur's latest novel. It was in his typewriter. As you can see, just start at the page. Hmm, Starbreaker. Hmm. Very interesting. What's the rest of it? That's all we found. What? And there was something missing. Archie. Yes, boss? First thing tomorrow morning, get the address of Mr. Morton, who publishes Arthur's books. Then get over to see him right away. May I help you? I'd like to see Mr. Morton. Uh, did you have an appointment? Tell him I'm from Homicide. Uh, ho- oh, yes, sir. Yes? Uh, Mr. Morton, I know you have someone with you, but uh, there's a gentleman here from the Homicide Bureau. He wants to see you. Tell him I work for Nero Wolf. My name's Goodwin. His name is Goodwin. Send him in. Yes, thank you. You may go right in, sir. The large door to your right. Thanks. Come in, Mr. Goodwin. Come in. I understand you're from Homicide. Not exactly. I'm Nero Wolfe's assistant. We're working with Inspector Kramer. And what can I do for you? You've heard about Arthur Merle. Yes, I received the word when I came in this morning. It was a great shock. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Goodwin. This gentleman is Henry Childs. How do you do, Mr. Childs? Glad to meet you, Mr. Goodwin. You're with Nero Wolfe? I'm his, well, his assistant, man Friday. Mr. Childs is a publicity agent. He handled all publicity for Arthur Merle. I've not only lost an excellent client, but a very good friend. Did you know Mr. Merle? Yes, I'd met him a number of times with Mr. Wolfe. Yes, indeed. Arthur Merle was a great writer and a fine citizen. He'll be missed by millions. Mr. Goodwin, when was the murder discovered? Last night, shortly before dinner. Well, what are the police... I mean, what do you think the motive was? Don't know as yet, Mr. Childs. A little early for that. Well, it's certainly a shame. I, uh... I wanted to ask you a few questions, Mr. Morton, privately. I hope you don't mind, Mr. Childs. Oh, no, no, not at all. I was about to leave. I'll run along now, Mr. Morton. Uh, See you again soon, Mr. Childs. Good morning, gentlemen. Well, Mr. Goodwin? You did a lot of business with Mr. Merle, Mr. Morton? I published every one of his novels for the past eight years. And you intended to publish his new one, the one he was working on? Yes, we had a contract. The usual agreement between you. Naturally. Although I didn't know the story, I was always sure that if Arthur wrote it, it was good. Mr. Merle's name on a novel was a guarantee that it would sell a million copies. You don't know what this last one was about. Haven't the faintest idea. We relied completely on Arthur's judgment. Not even any carbon copies, huh? Not that I know of. Why? When Mr. Merle was killed, the only thing missing from his apartment was the novel. The novel? The first 188 pages, all we found of it were a few lines of page 189 in his typewriter. He must have been working on it when the murderer stabbed him. The rest of it's gone. You mean, Goodwin, the the novel's gone? This will cost me a million dollars. Well, it cost Arthur Merle his life. Arthur Merle dead and his novel gone. I can hardly believe it. Well, thank you, Mr. Morton. I hope I've been of some help, although I don't I'm sorry you haven't. But we may call on you again. Before it's over, you may be a great help. Nero Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. I just finished with Morton. He doesn't know a thing. Merle never discussed his stories with anyone, and as far as Morton knows, he never made carpets. I see. Where do I go from here, boss? See Cynthia Roberts. Being his fiancée, she probably knows more about Arthur than anyone else. She may know who the fourth guest was to have been last night. And she also may know what Merle's novel was about. Right, boss. I'm anxious to know what the novel was about, too. I personally don't give a hang what the novel was about. What I want to find out is someone who does know the story. Because I have a hunch that whoever knows that is the person who killed Arthur Merle. (laughs) 
Miss Roberts, I know you want to help us find out who killed Arthur. Oh, yes, of course. I'll do anything. Nero Wolfe and I were invited to have dinner with Arthur Merle last night. Well, I knew he was having friends in for dinner, but I didn't know who they were. Oh, I'm sorry. I hoped you'd know whom he invited. No, he didn't tell me. Miss Roberts, we have reason to believe that there was to have been a fourth person there last night. A, a fourth? The caterer came to deliver dinner for four. Now, the fourth party never did show up, or else came earlier and left after Arthur was killed. You mean someone Arthur invited to dinner might have killed him? Maybe. Oh, there's no one that I can think of who bore any ill will toward Arthur. We're I... convinced that this was done on the spur of the moment. Unpremeditated murder. Arthur Merle suddenly became a threat to someone. Now we've got to find out what the threat was and who was threatened. We'd hoped you could help. I'm sorry. Did he ever discuss his new novel with you? Oh, no. He never talked about his stories until he'd finished them. So his latest mystery contains the answer to an even greater mystery. Unless we find the first, they'll both go unanswered. Mr. Morton? Yes? Nero Wolf speaking. Oh, yes. Your man Goodwin was here to see me. I presume you are interested in seeing Merle's murderer brought to justice? Certainly. Arthur was a close friend of mine. And his death cost you a best sir, I know. Now, would you be willing to help a bit? Why, yes, if I... I prepared a statement for the papers. I want you to call the literary editors first thing in the morning. Here's what I want you to tell them. You got a pencil and paper? Yes. And take this down. Quote, Mr. Carlton Morton announced today that the last work of the late Arthur Merle will be published according to schedule. Fortunately, it was Mr. Merle's custom to furnish his publishers with carbon copies of each day's work Consequently, with the major portion of his... Boss! Boss! Good heaven, Archie. Please don't be so loud. Look here. In this morning's paper, why, that rat, he lied to me, that... that... What on earth are you talking about? That publisher, Morton, he said he didn't have copies of Merle's manuscript, that he didn't know what it was about. And And listen to this. Mr. Carlton Morton announced today that the last work of the late Arthur Merle will be published according to schedule. Fortunately, it was Mr. Merle's custom to furnish his publisher with carbon copies of each day's work. Consequently, with a major portion of his latest work, Starbreaker, in the hands of his publisher, together with a complete synopsis, including the denouement, it will be possible for a ghostwriter to complete the novel. It will be published posthumously in proceeds with... Boss, did you hear that? I did, and it couldn't have been more to my liking if I'd written it myself. Now, excuse me, I want to make a telephone call. Who? Publisher Morton. Yeah, I'm beginning to see. He lied about the whole thing. I still don't see why he'd kill Merle, but on... Hello, Mr. Morton. This is Nero Wolf. Yes, perfect. Now I'll call Kramer, and he and Archie will be waiting for you. Remember now, if anything comes of it, you are to say the manuscript is in the safe in your home, and you steer the party here. Say you've recently rented this place. I hope we'll be seeing you. Yes. Goodbye. Oh, and be careful. Remember what happened to Arthur. The manuscript is in my desk in the middle drawer. What the... D- you mean... Archie, look out of that window. Huh? Yeah? Out there is a city of some five million people. In that five million, there is one who murdered Arthur Merle. Now, we don't know who it is, so we can't go out and put a finger on him. But, Archie, since we can't go to him... We have only one other choice, make him come to us. Will you tell me why we're sitting here in the dark in Wolf's office? Yes, Inspector Kramer. Mr. Wolf promised us a caller. Mr. Morton is to pretend that he's rented this place recently. Well, who's the caller? Can't tell you until he or she gets here. You seem certain he'll come. I'm quite certain. I'm just hopeful. You trying to tell me that Morton killed Merle? You're almost as dense as Archie was. No, Morton didn't do it. Unless Mr. Wolf is very wrong, which is doubtful, before the night is over, Morton will know who did. Then it won't be long until we know, too. Uh, You should get on a quiz program. You're so good at guessing games. Shh. Listen, huh? Someone's coming. 
A great introduction, my dear Kramer. I hope there are two of them. Inspector, behind these drapes. Quick, I'll get behind the screen. All right, Mr. Morton. So far, you've been very cooperative. Just keep it up. I have no intention of doing otherwise. Your gun has me completely convinced, Mr. Child. Get the manuscript. Uh, yes, just a moment. It's in my desk. Wait a minute. I thought you said it was in the safe. A mistake, Mr. Childs. I don't have a safe. Shall I get the manuscript? Yes, but no tricks. You be careful. I'm being exceedingly careful, Mr. Childs. There you are. Uh, Starbreaker by Arthur Merle. Yes, this is it. Thank you, Mr. Morton. Now, I trust that's all you want of me. I'm sorry. I wish that were true. Unfortunately, you see, it's not the actual novel that I want. Oh? My interest in this copy is the same as it was in the original. And that is? But no one should ever learn the content. I take it you know what it's about, then? Yes. You see, Mr. Murrow made the mistake of telling me when I called a bit early at his apartment for dinner last evening. I was forced to deprive him of his life once I learned the storyline of this novel. This story must be kept secret. Why? Most of you people in the publishing business know me as a public relations and publicity agent for several prominent writers. Yes. Actually, I've been as successful as I might in this business. Because a few years ago, I stumbled onto a very neat and foolproof method of blackmail. Unfortunately, Arthur Merle thought of the same thing and based this story on it. If it got out, I'd be exposed and sent to prison. So you can see why I had to stop it, why I had to kill Arthur and why... Now I'll have to kill you, too. Oh, child, for heaven's sake. The contents of these pages condemn me. You know what's in them. Further, I've confessed to murder to you. You don't think I could let you live after that, do you? Child, you're insane. I'm sorry that I must repay you for your trouble in such an ungrateful manner. I'm sorry to do this to you, Charles, but I can't... Child, please, no! Sorry, Mr. Charles. There wasn't time to ask you to drop the gun. All right, Mr. Charles. Get your hands up and stay where you are. Nice going, Mr. Morton. Who are you? That took courage, Mr. Morton. Sorry we had to wait so long, but we had to make Mr. Charles here convict himself. Convict? What do you mean? We've been waiting here for you. Behind the drapes all the time. We heard every word. Mr. Charles, you're under arrest. Police? Yes, Mr. Charles. Only one person could have been so anxious over a copy of that novel. That's the person who killed Arthur Merle for the original. And we heard you confess to that. And that's all we need to convict you. We didn't have any proof until we set it up for you to make a second try to cover up for the first. Fortunately, the setup worked. Setup? Take a look at the rest of the manuscript, Mr. Giles. What? Oh, the front page is there, all right, but look at the rest. Why, the blank. They're just blank pages. You didn't have a copy at all. No, but we certainly got a murderer. Eh, hey, Inspector? Giles! Giles! Stop, Giles! Stop! Well, that's one way to avoid standing trial. Well, Archie, I'm glad you and Kramer got trials. Some beer, please. That was a clever scheme, boss, making him think there was a copy. Yes, in a way, though, I wish it hadn't been just a scheme. Meaning? I wish there had been a copy of Arthur Merle's novel. Why? You never read detective stories? No, but I've jumped up so much curiosity over this one, I'd like to know exactly what that blackmail gimmick really was. Good night, Archie. Ah. <sighs> have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Don Arthur was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production and is directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Evelyn Eaton, Peter Leeds, Lucille Alex, Marna Keneally, Herb Butterfield, and Bill Johnstone. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you the case of the Telltale Ribbon. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. 
There's excitement for you Sunday when talented servicemen compete on The Phil Regan Show. And Sunday on NBC also means another delightful adventure with Cary Grant and Betsy Drake when they star as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings, the proud but bewildered owners of the famous Dream House. The chimes are your invitation every Sunday to Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. Tomorrow for excitement, hear Herbert Marshall in The Man Called X on NBC. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam's Bay Detective Agency. It's me, sweetheart, risen from not one, but two deathbeds. Oh, Sam, I bet not. You wouldn't take that line down. Oh, if you made a joke. Well, you did first, Sam. I did not. Oh, you mean you actually Now, don't pin me down. Anyway, I was present at two dying declarations. Would you believe, Effie, that a man could say something that wasn't true at a time like that? Oh, no. You mean a man would be lying on his deathbed? Oh, Effie, you made a joke. Oh, Sam, now stop it. I don't know what you It's all right, Effie. I forgive you. You can atone by telling me how wonderful you think I am. I think you're... That you may do when I arrive in a trice to dictate my report on the deathbed caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Tell me, mister... How many times a day do you have to comb your hair? Not many, I'll bet, if you groom it right, first thing every morning, with Wild Root Cream Oil. For this famous hair tonic grooms your hair neatly and naturally, and helps it to stay that way throughout the day. Wild Root Cream Oil also relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. With Wild Root Cream Oil, you don't have to keep combing your hair every two minutes. (laughs) That is, unless your gal can't resist running her hands through it. Get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. are asleep in the deep. Oh, Sam, you're a sailor. Captain Sam, there's the brig for you. You got your log book handy, gal? Oh, yes, Captain. So beware. You make it that's awful deep. Be... Oh. Uh, date, June 20th, 1948. Where? Oh, Sam. I have no shame. To uh, Marin County Sheriff's Office, San Rafael, California. Attention, Deputy Woodington from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the uh, deathbed caper. Dear Bill, the uh, dawn came up like thunder out of Chinatown across the bay. In San Francisco, all we could see was fog. But on your side, it must have lifted briefly because somebody named Dan Starbuck managed to find his way to a phone booth, call me, and asked me to meet him at the 3rd Street Pier in Sausalito. I didn't see him when I first got there. I didn't even see the pier. It was too foggy. But in the glow of the neon lights in front of the Viking saloon, I saw a man who seemed to be waiting for somebody. He was a big guy with a good face, but plenty of worry on it. Mr. Spade? Yeah, Mr. Starbuck? Dan Starbuck. Come on down to the end of the pier. I'll explain as we go along. we got to hurry. You act hot. You wanted for something? Well, I'm not yet. What's the caper? Well, it's... My brother's out there on his yacht, the Marguerite. He's dying. When he's dead, they may call it murder. I want to be there with a witness. That's you. In case he has anything to say about who did it. Who did? They think I did. Did you? Well, honestly, I don't know. It happened the night before last. I went out there to see him. We've hated each other for years. We've both been drinking, and we drank some more. Then there was a fight. I drew a blank somewhere. Next thing I knew, it was around midnight. I pulled myself together, went into his cabin. Gordon was lying there with his head all kicked. I realized I 
It was covered with blood, and I was holding something in my hand, big glass paperweight. I dropped it. I got out of there fast and swam ashore. I planned to tell you a different story, but that's it. You want the job or not? You think you'll make a deathbed statement that'll clear you, and you want me for a witness? Yeah, that's it. You got a lot of guts. I'm hired. Good. Uh, Alberson? You down there? Halverson! Who's Halverson? Uh, he's a boatman. He'll row us out. Halverson? Hey, Nils? Danny? Yeah. Is that you, Casino? Sure. Can I do you some favor? Uh, I want to go out to the Marguerite. I can't find Halverson anywhere. Well, I guess I can take you. Are you sure that yeah, you... I'm sure. Uh, uh, Sam Spade, Del Casino. He's the boss of the Marguerite. Glad to meet you. Same. Any front of Danny's. Hey, listen, Danny, you sure you want to go out there? Any reason why you shouldn't? Well, it's up to him. In his place, I would be on a freighter for China, way out there where the fog is more thicker. No, it's all right, you know, I know what I'm doing. Well, uh, your friend, you, you excuse me, your name? Spade. You, pardon me, I better ask. The police don't want you for nothing? Not yet, but don't make book on it. Uh, push us clear, Danny. All right. <laughs> This fog is closing in, but I can still see the lights from the Marguerite. I wish we don't find her. But we did. She was wearing clam diggers, an off-the-shoulder T-shirt, and was leaning against the rail as the dinghy pulled past the police launch and nestled in under the ladder of the yacht. Dell? Dell, is that you? Yes, Mr. Starbuck. Who is that with you? Keep quiet. Dell. Dell, what are they saying ashore about... The... Oh, I, I thought you... You're Mrs. Starbuck? Yes. I'm Sam Spade. I'm from San Francisco. I'm a detective. Your brother-in-law's in the boat. You captured him? He wants to come aboard. He wants to... Why? He's hoping your husband will say something to clear him before he dies. Is there any reason why he shouldn't come aboard? Oh, there's every reason in the world why he shouldn't. The police are in there with my husband right now. Yeah? The doctor says there's a possibility that he may regain consciousness long enough to make a dying declaration. Mm -hmm. if, if he's face to face with Dan, there's no telling what he'll say. I wish Dan wouldn't... My, my husband is dying. Dan? Yeah, what's she say? I don't know, but I think you'd better come aboard. He seemed almost delighted as he swung his weight up out of the dinghy and climbed the ladder. Del Casino, the bosun, followed, wearing a puzzled expression that turned to fear as we entered the cabin. The yellow glare from the lamp swinging overhead was almost blinding to walk into out of the foggy night. The first thing I focused on was the bunk that held the dying man. His head was heavily bandaged, his skin was chalk white, and his lips were beginning to turn blue. The room was tense with waiting. Ranged around him in a semicircle were the supporting players. Two doctors, one family type with a nurse, one police medic without, one sheriff with cigar, one police stenographer, female with pencil and notebook poise, nine-tenths of a widow, and us. At 18 minutes past seven, somebody moved. It was the dying man. The two doctors rushed forward, took his pulse and blood pressure. The scarf. Adrenaline 3 cc, carmine 1, saline solution. Oh. Yes. All right, Sheriff, he's conscious now, but uh, you'd better hurry. All right, good. Ah, uh, Mr. Starbuck, you can hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Take that down. Can you hear me? Affirmative answer. Now, Mr. Starbuck, we have to ask these questions. One, what is your name? Please try to answer what is your name? Gordon M. Starr. You got that? What is your name, Gordon M. Starr? Yeah, that's close enough. Fill it in later. Uh, now, Mr. Starbuck, where do you live? Uh, where do you live? I'm dead. You got that? 1277 Marymount, Pasadena. Hey. Now, Mr. Starbuck, let's try a little harder. Hmm? This is a long one. Uh, Have you been injured? And what was the cause of your injury? Uh, Yes. Hurts, man. You got that? Affirmative. Now the second part. What was the cause of your injury? Head. Huh? 
Hit on head. Uh, do you believe that you're about to die as a result of your injuries and have you no hope of recovery? <sighs> I know. No hope. Uh, uh, now let's get to the point. Who inflicted said injuries? My. Hey, Mr. Starbuck, My. please, you haven't much time, you know. Go away. Doc, is there anything you can do? I'm afraid not. Oh, oh this is ghastly. Oh. Can't you leave him alone? Can't you let him die in peace? What are you afraid of, Maggie? Uh. What are you afraid he'll say? All right. All right, tell them, Gordon. It was Dan that struck you, wasn't it? He was jealous. He always hated you for marrying me. It was Dan. Now, 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 Mrs. Starbuck, I know how you feel, but we can't allow this sort of thing. Uh. Please step aside so we can finish up here. Uh, Mr. Starbuck. Uh. Doctor? Uh, very low pulse. I'm not sure. Dan. Whether... Dan. Is Dan here? Here I am, Gordon. Tell him. Tell him the truth. Do you identify this man, Mr. Starbuck? Yes. He's my brother. Dan. Yeah. You got that? Brother Dan, he's... He's the one. He's lying. Gordon, you know who did it. Why don't you tell the truth? What do you got to lose now? Nothing. Nothing. I'm finished. You, got that? you finished me. Gordon! Uh, Gordon, not yet. Uh, I'll come back. Uh, oh, Doctor, can't you? Can't... He's dead. Well. <sighs> okay, Doc. Dennis Starbuck, it is my duty as sheriff of this county to take you into custody on suspicion of murder. And I must tell you that anything you say may be held against you. You'd better come along too, Spade. Routine questioning, you know. Okay, sir. Well, I don't think we'll need the handcuffs, will we, son? No, I'll go with you. Yes, indeed, son. It's always smart to come along quietly. Yeah. Well, this is the part of the... Hey, Dan, come back here. Hey, Use your hand. <laughs> He only had one friend who was the best friend in the world for a man on the land, the fog. The searchlights on the police launch spun frantically as the craft heeled around in a half circle to head him off. Instead of cutting the fog, the beams from the powerful lights bounced back from it and blinded the men behind them. After ten minutes of that, they gave up. The sheriff had a theory. Uh, don't worry. Between the fog and the currents, I doubt if we'll make it. We'll probably recover the body in the morning. And they did. But it wasn't Dan Starbuck's body. It was the bosun, Del Casino. And he was found in Richardson Bay, adrift in the dinghy from the Marguerite. Somebody had creased his skull with the same type blunt instrument that had been used on Gordon Starbuck. But Dell hadn't lived long enough to make a dying declaration. <laughs> The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. It gives you the advantages that men consider most important. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. That's like the oil of your skin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. <laughs> Back to Caper with Two Deathbeds. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. The police theory of the Del 
Bell casino killing went something like this. Casino had shoved off in the dinghy to join in the search for Dan Starbuck, had rescued him and been maced for his pains. Also found in the dinghy, but not as yet worked into the police theory, were two items. One, a waterproof wallet containing the Siemens papers of one Nils Halverson. Two, a tattoo mark on the right bicep of the deceased. A small heart with a name in it, Maggie. The brand new widow of the same name was waiting in my office when I got there the following afternoon. Hello. Hello to you, Mrs. Starbuck. What can I do for you? Mr. Spade, I I know very little about the ethics of your profession, and... Well, are are you still working for Danny? If you mean, do I know where he is, the answer's no. Oh, I hoped you'd say that. Why? Because I want you to work for me. Need a new bosun? You needn't have put it quite so crudely. No, I needn't. Since your work is confidential, I'll admit I've... I've done a few things that... Well, it's all too true... My first mistake was marrying Gordon Starbuck when I didn't love him. And I should never have let myself fall in love with Dan. I certainly should have known better than to let Dell fall in love with me. What about Nils Halverson? And me? Well, hardly. No. Nils Halverson was employed by my husband for various odd jobs whenever we put in at Sausalito. Mostly he'd row the guests out to the ship. He rowed Danny out the night my husband was killed... At least I think he did. I didn't actually see him. Where's Halverson now? Uh, I don't know. He he goes off on drunks for days at a time, but, but... But I have a feeling that someone has paid him to disappear. He he might have overheard something. Hold on a minute. He... You're going too fast. Are you uh, working up to a confession? Oh, no. It's, it's just that I'm afraid a great injustice may have been done to Danny. After all... Mr. Spade, a man who's dying, I don't see how he could be altogether in his right mind. Do you? The law says he is if he knows his name and address. A deathbed accusation is the strongest evidence a lawyer can shove at a jury. You can't cross-examine a dead man, and most people have the quaint idea that a man on his deathbed is a lot more truthful than he was when he was hale and hearty. Then you think Gordon may have been lying? Could be, or wool gathering, or picking up some of the lines you were feeding him. Oh, I, I was just afraid he might die before he... You, you see, I thought I might shock him into saying yes or no. He, he, he could have said no, couldn't he? Well, make up your mind. Oh, all I know is it's on my conscience now. If we could find old Halverson and force him to tell what he knows. He's a very strange man. He's devoted to me. If, if the police find him before I do, he, he might refuse to talk out of a mistaken loyalty. To you? Well, I, I meant if he thought I had anything to do with the... Well, he's very strange. I told you that. What makes you so sure he's alive? Why wouldn't he be? If I'd been the killer and he'd rode me to and from the scene of my crime, I'd see him secured in Davy Jones' locker. Fish feed, lobster bait, asleep in the deep. Will you work for me? I'll let you know. to get tattooed, but the rest of me was marinated enough. On my head, I was wearing a dirtied-up yachting cap, and the rest of me, I was wearing a pea jacket, dungarees, and sea boots. I was also wearing clamshell number five as I rolled up to the Viking saloon. Well, what did we meet? Uh, Arkevit and Vakta. Uh, have you seen my cousin? Your cousin? Who's your cousin, Prince Valiant? Uh, no, my, my cousin Niels Halverson. Uh, Niels Halverson. Oh, no. You're Niels cousin, mm, are you? Yeah. Well, uh, coming from the old country? Uh, yeah, uh, Minnesota. Uh, by you, Minnie. Well, now, he'll be right glad to see you then. Uh, where, uh, where is he? I'll, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to say this too loud. Yeah. Bend over there. Bend over. Yeah. He's in trouble, you know. Oh, yes. I got him holed up down below. Oh, yeah. Come on, come on. Well, by golly, I sure been glad to be going to see my cousin Niels. <laughs> Niels Halverson. Drop the act and get down there. Hey! Okay, Joe, I'll take over from here. Easy, easy. Okay, Danny, my boy. I got his gun. Well, watch him now, watch him. He's full of smorgasbord. Well, Spade, you're the one person I didn't expect to see. But I'm very glad to. Yeah, I wish I hadn't found you. I wanted to find somebody else first. Halverson? Yeah. He's here. Want to see him? That's what I came for. And under here. Watch your head, low bridge. Yeah. 
Uh, here we are. Where? The boathouse under the pier. Harrison used to hole in here to sleep off his schnapps. Where's he now? Over here. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's going to be a long time sleeping this one off. He'd been missing since that night. Nobody knew he was here till last night. I headed for the saloon when I swam ashore. Joe hid me out here. He could still talk then. What'd he say? I wrote it down here. But it's no help. Let's see it. Well, it's just a jumble of words. Uh, Marguerite. Marguerite. Merry Christmas drink. My beautiful Helga. Row, row your boat. Now throw me back. Row me back. Twenty dollars good and drunk. Mm. Fog rolling in. Good and drunk. Gonna be five days. No business. Oh, my head. Paint the book. All crazy stuff. Twenty dollars. Uh, did you give him twenty bucks to row you I out? I didn't even see him. I swam out. My loving brother wouldn't have let me on board if he'd heard me arriving like a gentleman. Twenty bucks. Did you frisk him? No. I'll have a look. No, I don't... Hey, wait. Uh-huh. Real soggy, but a 20. I don't care. I'm sticking to my story. I swam out there. I didn't give him that 20. <sighs> Maybe you didn't. Maybe you didn't. You gotta believe me. I didn't even have 20 bucks. That's why I Shut got... Shut up. What's the matter with you? What are you gonna do? Come over here, Dan. What? I don't believe a word of your story, and even if I did, it wouldn't make any difference. Well, what are you... Shut up. You're going to stop talking and listen for a while. I stuffed a gag into his mouth and muscled him over to a piling and handcuffed him to it. He didn't even look surprised. He just stood there staring at me as if he'd lost his last friend in the world. But I wasn't looking at him as much as I was listening to those footsteps in the boards overhead. I waited for them to come back. They did. I walked across the soggy planks to where Nils Halverson lay in the shadows. Nils, I want you to answer these questions again. Now, this time, I'm going to take them down. You get lots of $20 and lots of drink. Now then, I know you don't feel so good. You don't have to talk if you don't feel like it. Just nod your head for yes and shake it for no. Okay, Nils? That counts in a court of law as long as there's a witness. Okay. Now, your name is Nils Halverson. Your address is 213 Bayview Sausalito. That's correct, is it? Nod your head. Good. Good. That proves you're in your right mind. You know you were injured. Yeah. You know the cause of your injury. Hit on the head and thrown over the side of your boat. What? Huh? Not from... Oh, dinghy! Well, it's the same thing. All right. Now, you know you're dying. You have no hope of recovery. That's obvious, but nod your head. That's the boy. Now, uh, Nils, on the night of the 18th, around 10 o'clock, after your usual working hours, you rode somebody out to the yacht Marguerite in return for which this person gave you a $20 bill. This person is also the person who killed, who, in, who inflicted your fatal injuries. It is. Now, uh, the name of that person, if you can possibly speak even in a whisper, so there can be no mistake. Can you hear me? Just say it close to my ear. Yeah? Yes. Yes, I got it. That's all. Now, I know you don't write, Nils, but make your mark here. Come on, I'll guide your hand. There. Now we're going to take... Nils. Nils. Well, anyway. All right, Maggie. Come on in and join the party. Uh, don't try anything. The light's on you. I'm a better shot than you, and if there's a ruckus, the whole saloon will be down on us. They're all friends of Danny's, too. Stop there. Toss the gun. Okay. What's the matter, Angel? You look kind of scared. No. Just disappointed, that's all. Don't give up so easy, sweetheart. I always wanted to take a trip around the world. We might go on the Marguerite together. Yeah, yeah, sailing into the sunset, sleeping with our deathbed statements under each other's pillows. Yeah, I see what you mean. I guess it wouldn't work. How much for yours, and what do we do about him? Dan? I'll take care of that. Throw it in with a deal. Okay. But I want it in writing. A little statement to the effect that I can keep under my pillow. Fair enough. 
And all I want from you is a little statement from you to this effect. That you, Marguerite Starbuck, employed Nils Halverson to row you out to the yacht on the night of the 18th, that you there overheard a quarrel between your husband and brother-in-law, and that taking advantage of said brother-in-law's inebriated condition, you sneaked up behind your husband, hit him with a paperweight, and decamped, leaving the murder weapon in Dan's hand. You then started back to shore in the dinghy, and realizing that the only witness who could testify you were aboard that All right, night, all right. All right, I'll sign it. Okay. We'll have plenty of time to put in all the legal decorations later. I'm afraid we won't, baby. You're going to be spending all your available time at Tehachapi and points west. What are you talking you about? You just made a full confession in front of a witness. You heard it, didn't you, Dan? Every word. Oh, if I... Honest. An honest man. Well, I did tell a fib. Now, this is really going to hurt, I'm afraid, Maggie. You see, we didn't actually have any deathbed statement to match yours. No? No. Nils Halverson was a good deal too dead to have made a deathbed statement just now. He's been stiff for 12 hours. Uh, period and a report. Well, Sam, I'll type this right up because then I'm leaving. Wait a minute, Effie. I had to do it that way. Don't you understand? Of course, Sam. I quite understand. But you object, huh? A cruel, ruthless, murdering, though beautiful woman, foiled by a clever ruse, a great acting performance by the greatest private detective of them all. Is that all? You're still leaving? Yes, Sam, I bag the pack. Well, pardon me for having feet. There's a reason, men. In fact, there are five big reasons why more men every day are turning to wild root cream oil for well-groomed hair. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally. Wild Root Cream Oil relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. Wild Root Cream Oil is non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin. Five big reasons why you, too, should join the millions with handsome, well-groomed hair. Why you should step up to your drug or toilet goods counter and ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel and just right for the office or plant. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. Goodbye. Now, wait a minute, Effie. You can't leave like this, not without... Oh, all right. I'll talk to you while I'm putting my hat on. Well, can't you at least look at me? After all, you should give me a chance to justify... Sam, my... apparently you're laboring under an apprehension. Of course I am. Oh, boy, am I glad I picked the last in June and the first in July. What are you talking about? My vacation. Vacation? You just had a vacation a few months back. Well, Sam, that's a year. Well, if you want to take advantage of a legal technicality... Now, Sam, don't say goodbye, man. Well, it... Well, it's customary, I suppose. It's... it's lucky that some of us keep our nose to the grindstone, our ear to the ground, an eye to the future. Huh? Television's just around the corner, you know. Oh, Sam! <laughs> Come here, sweetheart. You look lovely in it. Come here. Have a wonderful time. <laughs> oh, Sam. Oh, Sam. Come here. <sighs> now go on. You miss your train. Uh, where are you going? The Los Sierras. Well, just so you don't go to Canab, Utah. All right, Sam. You know best. Good, good night. Good night, Sierra Sue. Now, who can we get for that part next week? <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to get wild root cream oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get wild root cream oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get wild root right. Away. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. You're invited every Saturday over most of these NBC stations to a one-hour concert by the renowned NBC Symphony. 
Tomorrow's symphony performance features Metropolitan Opera star Helen Trouble as guest soloist. For tomorrow's broadcast, the orchestra will be under the baton of the widely acclaimed conductor, Wilfred Pelletier. For the world's great music, hear the NBC Symphony, brought to you tomorrow and every Saturday. Transcribed. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Yes, who's calling? Mr. John Blake? Well, is this a matter of business? That's fine, Mr. Blake. I'll just call him. Archie, I'm not here. Tell him I'm up in the plant room with the orchids. Uh, I was going to call him to the phone, but he's up in the plant room with his orchids. Uh, What sort of a case is this, sir? Really? Really, is that so? Is it a man or a woman? Oh, I understand perfectly. It's a man. Well, at least that's something different. Yes, sir. Very urgent. I understand. And I assure you, Mr. Wolf will be here waiting for you. The fee? Oh, um... Shall we say about, uh, oh, a thousand? I will not see any client until after dinner. Fritz is having mountain quail on toast. Yes, Mr. Blake, come at once. What were you saying, boss? Confound you, Archie, nothing but business. All the time. What's the problem? I don't know. And at a thousand dollars, considering our bank balance, I'll help him poison his (laughs) great-grandmother. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> What we chose to refer to as the case of the hasty will began, of course, with an urgent phone call from the mysterious John Blake. At the moment, Nero Wolf was seated in his chair, which was specially built for his 300 pounds, and I was giving him a lecture on the importance of money. Archie, that will do. I'm not interested. You will be when you learn you can make no more purchases of beer and Skittles. You passed up two cinch cases now. Each would have meant a healthy fee. Let us hope this Mr. Blake has a nice, fat problem that will take us days to solve. Archie! Yes, sir? Answer the door. Good evening. I'm John Blake. Oh, yes, yes. Come in, Mr. Blake. You have no idea how welcome you are. Archie, show Mr. Blake in and close the door. That draft is unbearable. Uh, This way, sir. Mr. Wolf doesn't care for anything resembling air. Oh, I'm Archie Goodwin. Hey, good evening, Mr. Blake. Mr. Wolf, uh, I have a little business for you. Now, uh, before you say anything, I know you're not a lawyer. I'm not a member of the bar, let us say, Mr. Blake. Of course. What kind of business, Mr. Blake? I have here a short will, which uh, I have typewritten myself. I, I haven't signed it yet. Uh, also, I have here a sealed envelope containing a letter which I want you to be prepared to deliver to the addressee. A will and a letter. Very well. Yes. Uh, Do you know who I am? Seems that I've certainly seen you before. Same here. I just can't place you. Well, I'm John Blake, president of the Plymouth Building and Loan. Oh, of course. I've seen your picture many times. You have a star for the best attorneys in the city, Mr. Blake, and this is most assuredly the business of attorney. Perhaps. But in this particular instance, I wanted an individual who had no interest in me, uh, nor uh, previous knowledge of my affairs. I see. Also, I wanted a person who was, well, uh, shall we say, not too well fixed. Well, you certainly could have... Imagine Mr. Wolf being in need of money. Just why can't your attorneys handle this? You'll know in a moment. But when I leave here, I want you to forget the whole thing uh, for the time being. Indeed. You have said it. Here's the will. You may read it. Archie. January 25, 1951. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I do hereby bequeath all my property, personal and real, including the portrait painting of her mother, my dear deceased wife, Marcia Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments previously drawn. So, simple enough, isn't it? That's all. Now, the pen, please, and I'll sign it. Now then, you sign as witness, Mr. Goodwin. 
You retain the will, Mr. Wolf, and the envelope here, which is addressed to Hillary Brake, my brother, who is now living in this city. Your brother? He's just recently returned from 25 years in Australia. Though Hillary has written me several times, I have not favored him. We've, uh, we've been estranged these many years over, uh, well, a certain unpleasant situation which this enclosed letter will clear up. Are you in fear of your life, Mr. Blake? Murder? No, Mr. Wolf. There was a time, yes, but, uh, well, not now. You will know what to do with the will and the letter, though, when the time arrives. Now, uh, as to your fee, you said, uh, a thousand? Well, we usually receive... A thousand will do. Well, here's a check, all made out. If you're thinking of suicide, Mr. Blake, we must warn you. If you don't care to go through with this, please say so. I'm not planning on suicide, I assure you. We have taken the job, Mr. Blake. <clears throat> and good evening, gentlemen, and uh, thank you for your kind indulgence. Well, that's the simplest little thousand we ever made. I believe, Mr. Goodwin, you're going to be quite surprised. I want you to get acquainted with John Blake's secretary. You have more than earned this thousand, young man. Archie! Archie, is that you? Yes, boss. What time is it? It is 6 p.m. The clock is right in front of your eyes. I'm thinking, Archie, it's very interesting. Very. An entire day has passed since the visit from John Blake. Did you learn anything from Blake's secretary? I did. He left his office late yesterday, she said. His daughter Anita is quite upset because he didn't come home. Check his club? Yup. I didn't talk to the daughter, but I learned that she's engaged to a young fellow named Wilbur Martin. She told the secretary that her father had been acting strangely of late, a bit morose. And what does the daughter feel has happened? Anita's afraid he's been kidnapped. You haven't met nor talked to any other than the secretary? Not yet. And so far, no one's called the police. Good. We must, for the time being, prevent that. What did you learn of Blake's brother from Australia? He's been here only a year. They've met only once or twice since his return. The secretary thinks the breakup was because of their love for the same woman. Hillary became very wealthy in Australia. Very well, Archie. It is time for you to visit Miss Anita Blake at her home. I'd love to, boss. She's a mighty purty gal. Boy. Archie, you can do me a great service. Anything. Be sure to close it tightly as you leave. Close what? The coal chute, of course. <laughs> Awfully glad you could come, Uncle Hillary. Wilbur seemed to think you might know something about Father's disappearance. No, I don't know, Wilbur. Uh, I'm just as nonplussed as you are. When did you see your brother last? Oh, it's been four or five months. Why? Oh, I just wanted to know. What do you two think has become of him? Surely you know his recent actions better than I. Well, at first I thought he'd been kidnapped. Now I'm afraid it's suicide. Oh, I say, really now... Have you been putting such ideas into our head, young man? On the other hand, could have been murder. Indeed. Well, I suggest that the police be called. Hospitals, the morgue, every place. Have you thought of doing that, young man? I was going to. Oh, really? Then what are you stalling about? I'll just step into the library and do it myself. Oh, it can't be, Wilbur. It just can't be. Miss Blake, there's a Mr. Goodwin to see your father. Oh, I'll see him. Thank you, Miss Blake. I'm Archie Goodwin. This is my fiancé, Mr. Wilbur Martin. Mr. Martin, how do you do? What is it you want, Mr. Goodwin? Is your father here, Miss Blake? Why, no. No, he isn't. What is your business, Mr. Goodwin? Why do you want to see Mr. Blake? As a matter of fact, I don't really want to see Mr. Blake because I don't think he's here. I came to see Miss Blake. Just who are you? I'm a detective. Police? Private investigator with Nero Wolf. John Blake has disappeared... I know you're trying to keep it out of the press because you think he's been kidnapped. We have called the police. Oh, what do you think has happened to my father? I think he's dead. Oh, dear. What, why do you think that? Yes. Just what do you know, Mr. Goodwin? Oh, Anita, I want to ask you a few questions. I think it's advisable. Mr. Blake. To... Yes? I, I thought you were done for. That is... I don't think I... Uh... This chap is a detective. I'm sorry about this, Mr. Blake, but curiosity got the better of me. I hope I haven't wrecked things. What are you talking about? You remember the agreement. What agreement? Mr. Goodwin, do you know who you're talking to? 
Why, yes, John Blake. Oh, no, Mr. Goodwin. This is my uncle Hillary, my father's brother. Hillary? Hillary Blake? Yes, my father's twin brother. John and Hillary were twins? Of course. Well, that's news to me. I didn't know that. What did you know about him? Well, now that I look at him, now that I can recall his speech, there is a difference. And now, why do you think John Blake is dead? I've just come from police headquarters. You mean he's been murdered? No. From all indications, he's committed suicide. Suicide? Oh. Are you sure? Poor father. Oh, I was afraid of this. This morning, a hat and an overcoat were found on the East River docks near Pier 9. In the coat was a typewritten copy of a will made yesterday. The hat bears the initials J.B. There was a will? Yes. Could you identify the hat and coat, Miss Blake? Well, yes, of course. Very well. Come in, Sergeant. This is Sergeant Hanlon. Miss Blake, do you recognize this coat and hat? Yes. Oh, yes, I do. They, they were fathers. I... Oh, Wilbur. Suicide. I can't understand it. But the hat and coat are not conclusive evidence. What about the will found in the pocket? Show them the will, Sergeant. Read it, miss. You, you read it, Wilbur? Hmm. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I do hereby bequeath all my property, personal and real, including the portrait painting of her mother, my dear deceased wife, Marsha Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments previously drawn. But no signature. I have the original. Here you are. Where did you get this? Notice the signature of the witness? Archie Goodwin. You witnessed his signature? In Nero Wolfe's office. But Mr. Blake had his own attorneys. Nevertheless, he came to Mr. Wolf to take care of the will. If we hadn't recognized him from his photos in the papers, I wouldn't have witnessed the signature. Anita, is this your father's handwriting? Yes. Yes, it is all right. But this still isn't proof that he's dead, nor that he committed suicide. No corpus delecti. And the body may not be found for days. But this evidence we have here certainly indicates that a body will be found eventually. Maybe not, Mr. Goodman. It's possible they could have... What were you going to say? Nothing. Miss Blake, in a way, I blame myself for your father's death. How do you mean? I had a sort of premonition. It's obvious now why he came to Nero Wolf. Is it? He wanted someone who didn't know him personally. His own attorneys would have been able to see through his plan and prevent his carrying it out. But he made a will... Why did he draw this new one? Yes, that's what I don't understand. Well, I still am not convinced that he committed suicide. Mr. Blake, here is a letter he has to be delivered to you. Oh, well now. Perhaps it will shed some light on the problem. What does it say, Uncle? <clears throat> Joe says, uh, hmm, Hillary, 25 years now, jealousy and bitterness have kept us apart. I know why you stayed in Australia all these years. I know you loved Marcia. She was rightfully yours, but I loved her too, and I couldn't go on without her. I know you've despised us both, and I've uh, pretended to despise you. I had to pretend, because I lied to Marcia. I told her you were engaged to marry a woman in Sydney. Marcia was innocent. I was to blame. Uh, when Marcia died last year, and you wrote that you were coming back, I knew then that your resentment had faded, but I didn't answer you. And I've kept away from you because I couldn't face you. I've told you all this because things have happened, which you will learn soon enough, that have decided me to close my book and write Finney. I uh, have made a new will, leaving everything I possess to Anita. Anita is young, Hilary, and I beg you to watch after her as though she were your own, which, but for my selfishness, she might well have been. Forgive me, Hilary. Mm, well, this... Uh, this certainly indicates suicide. But what does he mean by things have happened? That, Miss Blake, is the motive for which we'll just have to wait. Yes, for that and the body. Well, boss, up here in the conservatory a bit early, aren't you? How are the orchids? Oh, it's a nice sunny morning. Even though it is around zero outside, the sun is fine for them. And behold, Archie. Huh? What is it? The dendrobium's chlorostel. The bird. Be... Yes, indeed. What about it? Showing two buds. Most encouraging. Indeed, indeed so. Boss, I can't take the steam heat here. Tell me, this painting of Marcia Blake, is it large? It hangs over the Blake mantle, about three by four feet. 
Find it most intriguing that John Blake should mention the painting in so short a will. And Hillary, does he seem to offer any suggestion on this problem? He has very little to say. Wilbur has definite ideas, and he's in there pitching all the time. He has a rather unpleasant way about him, though. You have talked with Inspector Kramer? I have. And asked Miss Anita and Hillary to meet you at the morgue to look at the body? Right. And I left Wilbur out of this gathering. This body is practically unidentifiable, huh? In Kramer's opinion, it is. After you're finished down there, I'd like to have a chat with this Wilbur Martin. Okay, but you'll get nothing out of him. I've tried. Archie, you're becoming so conceited. Soon I fear I'll have to uh, fire you. If it were summer, I would forthwith resign. Run along and close our coal chute behind you. Morning, Inspector Kramer. Up early. Yeah, Goodwin. I'd just love to come down to this morgue. This is Miss Anita Blake and her Uncle Hillary Blake. How do you do? do? Good Good morning, Mr. Goodwin. I hope you don't object too much to my joining the proceedings. Oh, I know, Wilbur. I suppose it's all right. Please, Mr. Goodwin. What's happened? There's a body here. Rather badly bruised and cut and in a bad condition, but I think you should look at it. Oh, I... I'm sorry, Miss Blake, but I'm afraid it's necessary. Very well. I'll be all right. No, I'd like to come along. Oh, yes, Wilbur, you must. Well, come on, Miss Wayne. Well, here we are. Wilbur. What do you say, Miss Blake? Now get hold of yourself, Anita. Please, you must. Yes. Yes, that's father. And you, Mr. Blake? It's certainly hard to say. It looks as though it might be John. Was there no means of identification on the body? No jewelry or... Father never wore any jewelry. There was nothing but this suit here. Nothing in the pockets. Yes. That's father's suit, all right. I know. Oh, why? Why did he do it? Come along now. That's all for today. (laughs) Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Wilbur Martin. Ah, yes. How do you do, Mr. Martin? Sit down. Thank you, sir. No, no, no. Take the red leather chair. That's right. So glad you could come. Archie, uh, be of us. Uh, tell me, Mr. Martin, you saw the body? I did. Whether it was John Blake or not, I'm not sure. But Anita feels positive enough. You are skeptical about the suicide theory, eh? Well, yes, I am. Are you trying to cast suspicion on someone else? No. He thinks he was murdered. I do. But not by you, of course. Certainly not. (laughs) But who would know that John came here, signed the will, and gave us the letter to his brother? He must have contemplated suicide, don't you think? Are you positive it was John Blake who signed the will? Hmm. How interesting. You think it was his brother Hillary who came here, posing as John, huh? It could have been. But the man was quite gray and had no Australian accent. Hillary could have dropped the accent for a short while and grayed his hair, and they were twins. It's so enlightening, Mr. Martin. Do go on. After he left you here, he could have killed John and thrown him in the river. And left his overcoat and hat on the wharf. And why would Hillary kill John? Well, I... Well, there may have been several reasons. Maybe because of Marsha. Well, uh, several reasons. Tell me, did John Blake object to your engagement to Anita? No, why should he? I don't know. (laughs) I merely asked. Anita Blake identified her father's handwriting. She identified the body. You still believe it's murder? Maybe she only thought it was his handwriting. You had best be careful, Wilbur. In trying to make a murder out of this, you might place yourself in a most unhappy position. I checked the letter and the will with papers at John's office, and the handwriting is identical, in my opinion. Maybe Hillary is clever at forgery. Maybe. Did you have the experts check the writing? Not yet. Then how can you tell unless you had a bona fide sample of Hillary's writing? Hmm... I take it that you found a sample of Hillary's writing? Some letters from Hillary to John? Yes. I found a package of them. In John's desk at his home. That, Wilbur, is most encouraging. Here they are. Several of them tied together. Some written in 1928 and a couple in 1948. Now, we'll tell you something. We never thought John committed suicide either. You... you didn't? No. And before you go, Wilbur... 
Write your name here on this pad. Very well. Thank you so much. I hope we shall see you tomorrow. Well, I'm surprised, Inspector Kramer, to see you out in such inclement weather. I like the cold spells. Sit in the red leather chair. <coughs> Thanks. Good. Have your experts finished checking the will and the letter? Yep. But not all through with a package of Hillary's old letters that Wilbur found. What's the verdict? If this is forgery, it's the cleverest bit of forgery we've ever come across. My men say the will and the letter you received appear identical with the specimens from John's office. Indeed, the will and the letter then do seem to have been written by John Blake. Yes, but on the other hand, and this is unusual, by comparing this letter from John with a letter Hillary wrote from Australia in 1948, we found characteristics in both men's letters which were definitely similar. Then, Inspector, you feel that Hillary might have written the letter and signed the will. That it was Hillary who came to my office? It's a tough thing to prove, but I think that's being on the right track. Inspector, what about the rest of the package of letters I got from Wilbur Martin? They are still working on those down at headquarters. Uh, what about young Wilbur? Mm, so far, can't see much in him to worry about, but it's a bit early. Archie, phone out to the Blake Mansion and tell Wilbur Martin that we've uncovered the whole thing. And if Wilbur's in on it, he'll be gone before you get there. We can pick him up later. Okay. I'll let you know about the rest of Hillary's letters. Good. We won't phone out there until you're finished. I'll call you as soon as possible. Archie, I want you to look into the affairs of the Plymouth Building and Loan Company. See what you can learn about the actual uh, stability of the company. Okay. Boss, please put on your muffler and overcoat and open a window. A candle couldn't burn in this place. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm on my way. Anita! Anita! What is it, Wilbur? What's happened? I came out as soon as I heard. Well, what's happened? Speak up, man. You haven't heard? You don't know? No, what? Look, look at these headlines. Plymouth Building and Loan Crashes. Wilbur, what does this mean? It means your father embezzled the funds of the company and he has gone to the wall. What? Yes, close the doors. Oh, no, Wilbur, no. I can't believe such a I'm thing. I'm sorry, Anita, but there it is in black and white. Then... This is the motive for John's suicide. Why? Why? Because he, well, he knew he was caught. What else? He could have put the money back, couldn't he? Yes, but maybe he lost it by trying to make more to come up the shortage. I don't think he lost it. You don't? No. Oh, nonsense. He must have. Else why would he kill himself? Maybe he didn't kill himself. Oh, this is awful. Oh, please, please, Anita, you mustn't worry. I know this is very embarrassing for you, but it isn't your fault. Now... Let me take you away for a while. We can run down to Mexico until this blows over. You won't take her to Mexico. You won't take her any place. Just what do you mean? What's wrong with you, Wilbur? You're acting stupid. You... Your father may have fleeced the company, but I don't believe he lost the money. Wilbur. He hid the money, and your uncle Hillary found the hiding place, and he set up the suicide to cover your father's murder. Hillary killed him. Oh, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. Why, this doesn't make sense. I have all the money I need. Yes, you have now. Pack your things, Anita. I'll phone the airport for reservations. You can't leave at a time like this. You won't leave this room. Do you know what can be done to you for threatening people with firearms? I'll call the police. You don't need to call the police. I've just talked to that detective, Mr. Goodwin. He's on his way here. The police have uncovered everything. I know you killed John, and you have the money. Wilbur, you're out of your mind. I know what I'm talking about. Get out of here. Get out. I won't leave. No one will leave till Goodwin comes. <laughs> Archie, come in, Miss Blake. Mr. Blake, Mr. Martin, glad you were all able to accept my invitation. You too, Inspector Kramer. Yeah, I know how glad you are I could be here, Wolf. Please be seated, folks. Hillary was going to Mexico on the next plane and taking Anita with him. Mexico? John Blake stole the money from the company, but Hillary found out about it and killed him. Mr. Wolf, this is utter nonsense. Mr. Blake, Inspector Kramer's handwriting experts have examined the will and the letter left with me. They have also checked them with your recent letters from Australia. Indeed. And your letters from Australia show a definite resemblance, having the same characteristics as the letter and the will you give me. You you mean you think that I signed the will and wrote the letter? Definitely. <laughs> Ridiculous. But there's something else. The will mentions a painting of Marcia Blake, Anita's mother. Archie, where is that painting? Did you bring it? It's here. Uh, bring it in here, Sergeant. Just a moment. I hope you don't mind, Miss Blake. What are you doing to it? Tearing off the paper backing of the picture. Yes, and there you are. There's the reason for the whole thing. Bonds. 
paste it in the back. Thousands of dollars in negotiable bonds. Then Hillary did know about the money. He killed John for all this. He had a need to order the picture to be credited for shipping. I did no such thing. Nevertheless, you didn't kill John Blake. Certainly he did. Look at these two letters from Hillary Blake to John here in America. What are the dates? September and November 1948. Those were supposedly Hillary's most recent letters to John. And look at these letters, June and July 1928. Notice any difference? All are signed by Hillary, but the ones dated 1928 are not at all like the ones written in 1948. Not the least similarity. The ones dated 1928 were written by Hillary. But those dated 1948 were written by John. By John? How do you mean? Carry on, Inspector. You're under arrest, Mr. Blake. Not for murder, because there's been no murder. You're under arrest on a charge of embezzlement. Embezzlement? Oh, but how And you... you, Miss Blake, are under arrest as an accomplice. What? I don't understand. Mr. Wolfe. Wilbur, you yourself unearthed the old 1928 letters, rarely written by Hillary from Australia. The recent letters are not in the same handwriting. They were poorly forged by John in 1948. Furthermore, we checked with Australia and learned that Hillary Blake died in Sydney ten years ago. And this man here is really John Blake posing as Hillary to escape the penalty for looting the company. Anita, it just doesn't seem possible. Anita knew all about it, and they might have gotten away with it if they hadn't come to us, Archie. What a fantastic plan. I'm giving you back your thousand dollars, Mr. Blake, but I'm afraid it won't do either of you much good now. Thank you so much, Inspector Kramer, for dropping in. Well, boss, that was a clever bit of deduction. You really think so, Archie? It was quite a blunder for so clever a man as John Blake. Why did he make the mistake of coming to us? There are many holes in the plans of the criminal mind. He must have forgotten about the 1928 letters or he would have destroyed them. And he underestimated Wilbur's intelligence. And I thought he was a dope too, but he was half right. He really slipped up on the body in the morgue. Inspector Gramer was most kind to cooperate with us in that little act. Anita was too eager to identify the first body she saw. And the painting. You sensed there was more importance attached to it than the fact that it was a work of art. True. Some beer, please, Archie. Coming up, boss? Now, that brings me to an unpleasant subject. What's that? You were talking about resigning. Are you still in that frame of mind? Resigning? When did I say anything like that? Then you're going to be content with conditions as they are? Why, of course. What are you saying? And you don't mind it a bit as long as this dreadful weather continues? Well, not at all. I don't mind what? Going in and out of the house through the coal chute. <laughs> you have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout and produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In tonight's cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Victor Rodman, Louise Arthur, Hal Gerard, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Disappearing Diamonds. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. What? You're expecting Mr. Wolf at your place in three hours? Your place is where? <laughs> yes. Well, I'm expecting Hedy Lamar in 15 minutes. Yeah, but mister, we're both out of luck. <laughs> Archie, what are you babbling about? Well, there's a character on the phone who's laboring under the naive delusion that you're about to make a trip upstate. His name? Finley, he said. In that case, he's quite correct. Yeah, he's quite... Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Finley. Mr. Wolf will be there. Yeah, goodbye. 
I should need some beer, Archie. The bottle opener's in the right-hand drawer. Thank you. What one of us needs is a psychiatrist. You're voluntarily leaving your happy home, exposing yourself to the elements, entrusting your only life to a savage automobile? I am. Oh, oh, oh. somebody's offered you the United States Treasury, huh? Mr. Finley happens to grow orchids. Among them, he has developed a plant possessing spurred labili. I have an opportunity to purchase a couple of the plants, therefore... I don't believe it. But Archie, according to the reports I have received, he has produced a strain of black cypripidium. Oh, well, in that case. <laughs> but, Mr. Wolf, while it's true that black may be the color of your true love's hair, it is also true that black is the color of funerals. <laughs> It's the detective genius who rates the knife and fork the greatest tools ever invented by man. The ponderous, brilliant, and unpredictable Nero Wolf, Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. of the case of the Phantom Fingers actually had nothing to do with black orchids. The first act was played in an old house at the end of an old dirt road. It was short and simple. As short as life. And as simple as murder. Joe, I didn't believe the letters I got. Didn't believe them until now. I've been a lonely man. No wife, no children. Joe, it was all coming to you after I died. There was no need for you to steal from me. All you had to do was wait. Joe, that gun, put it down. No, no, no. Archie. Yes, Mr. Wolf. How much longer? Oh, an hour, maybe. Why? I'm a fool. Yeah, well, payday's tomorrow. I refuse to agree with you. <laughs> Besides, the trip's been fine so far, huh? So there's snow on the road, but... Uh, Fooey. Well, it's nice snow. Pretty soon it'll be spring, and in the spring... If you mention old Tidmas once more, I shall strangle you. Uh, no, no, it's against the law. But you know, if that snow melts much faster, the trees won't look so pretty. Trees? Are they really necessary? Uh-huh. People cut them down and make paper out of them. And they take the paper and make dollar bills. <laughs> Mr. Wolf, we're surrounded by future fees. I prefer the finished product. What on earth is that? Sounds like a river. Indeed. Except there aren't any rivers around here. Hey. Yeah? Up ahead. What? Huh? It's a river. Only it isn't a river. It's wet. Yeah, it's wet and it's got waves on it. Had to start raining, too. Nature. Fooey. road behind us is covered with water. We just have to keep going onward and upward. Would you like to recite Excelsior to me? Why, sure. Shades of night were falling fast when through an alpine village passed... An idiot of your caliber, no doubt. Oh. <sighs> An infernal engine has died. No, no, the road dips up ahead. And where it dips, there's a junior Mississippi growing up. Splendid. Not so splendid. We can't go back and we can't go forward. Why not? They didn't build this model to swim. No foresight. What do we do now? Well, we could abandon the car and, uh... Walk, are you mad? Are you seriously suggesting I indulge in a foot race with the flood? Yeah, well, not seriously, but, uh... Oh, you've decided to give the car a swimming lesson? No. There's what looks like a cow path leading off the highway. To your right. Maybe it's a road. We progress. We now follow the footstep of the cow. Ah, it is a road. An old dirt road. Not only that, it goes up. Is that good? Theoretically. We might get above the water that way. And if the theory fails? Mr. Wolf, how are you on the Australian crawl? Hey, there's been another car on this road before us. You can see the tire tracks in the mud. Interesting. An indication that there are other maniacs about. I myself would not have chosen this particular spot to picnic in. That's well, not that. 
There's somebody lying on the road. People have peculiar habits. Ignore him and drive on. Uh Uh-uh. Hold on a moment. Mr. Wolf, you better come out here. My madness has its limits. The answer is no. Serious, Archie? Very serious. Oh, very well. Uh, oh, my Good heavens. Oh. Yeah, he's still oh, alive, but... but uh, the man's being shot. He's uh, mumbling. Uh, Joe. Uh, he's Joe. yelling for Joe. Be still. Uh, don't forgive stealing. Uh, don't... Uh, uh, uh. So much for that. Pick him up, Archie. Put him in the car. Might be bad for him to be moved. No. There is nothing that can be bad for him. He's dead. Is this blasted road leading anywhere, Archie? Well, it seems to be a clearing up ahead. Maybe... Hey, it's a house. Splendid. I'm not so sure. It's perched up on top of a cliff, surrounded on three sides by nothing. On the side facing us, there's a deep ravine and a small wooden bridge. An island in the air. Hmm. Yeah. High enough to keep above water, maybe, but... Now, that bridge doesn't look too good. Rain may have weakened it. I have no choice, Archie. I have no intention of being drowned in these barbaric surroundings. The bridge, Archie. Okay. Hold on. Dude, the thing's collapsing under us. I'm a mendum, sir. Well, if it doesn't, 37 blondes are going to be wearing black... Correction, 38. I forgot the one in Gimbel's bargain basement. Hey, made it. The bridge will never be the same, though. There's a car ahead of us in front of the house. The car from which our friend, our dead friend, was thrown. Only one set of car tracks in the mud along the road and here... And all we have to do is walk in, ask for the owner of the house and... uh... Possibly, possibly not. Archie, go through the corpse's pockets. Oh, that's not cricket. Yeah, all right, all right. I'm going through. There's not much on him. Handkerchief, silver, driver's license. The name was uh, James Miller. Address Garner Lane. Walden. And I've got an idea this is Garner Lane, Mr. Wolf. In which case, someone named Joe was looking after the house for him, committed theft, and murdered Miller. Miller's body was then dumped on the road in the hopes that the floods would wash the body away. No one at the house seems to have noticed our arrival. No. Nope. Well, let's go in and ask for Joe, huh? Very well. Uh, oh. Uh, mm. uh, hard. With the bridge down, there's absolutely no way of getting on or off this bridge. Except for a mountain goat. I don't know any mountain goats. <laughs> I used to know a plain goat once, though. Indeed. Yeah, he ran at the fifth of Jamaica. Stop mourning. I never mourned her. Also, I never win bets on horse races. <laughs> That's why I continue to work for you. That is also why you had better ring the doorbell. Okay, okay. Nobody's going to break a leg rushing to open the door. I suppose you try it. I have it more than enough of the weather. Is that polite? Besides, the killer may have some more bullets in that gun. Are you afraid? Sure. Fui, the door, Archie. But old Dr. Tidmouse would say, well, never mind. Mm. Hey, somebody was careless leaving the door open like that. On the other hand, does a spider ever shut its web? The answer is no. Are we flies? Yes. Out of my way, Archie. There are lights up ahead. Must be the living room. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, sure, sure, you're excused. Uh, do you live here, sir? Do we... No, don't you? Of course not. This is very strange. I came out to see the people who live here, or the person. I found the door open and no one about. I've been sitting in this corner now for a long time. Oh, it's a pity no one offered you a plum pie. Then you could have stuck in your thumb. You saw no one enter, sir? Uh, No one at all. Uh, I didn't want to go any further. It would have seemed like prying. Perhaps you had better come along with us. Well, uh, all right. You know, this place, it has an evil atmosphere. It certainly has. What it needs is fresh air. Hooey. 
This would be the living room door. A job it. It is. Looks as pretty as a picture. At the... Oh. Hello. Well, just think of it. Five minutes ago, you know, I didn't know you existed. And you didn't know I existed. And now... Archie, uh, your existence would have a sudden end then that you keep quiet. Uh, excuse us for intruding, Miss... Intruding? Uh, oh, but I really should ask you to excuse me. You do not live here? I wish I did, but... You see, I've been out walking. I live maybe a whole oh, mile from here, and then when the flood began, I, I thought I'd come in here and stay for a while. And you found? An empty house. That's not what I found. <laughs> As old Dr. Tidmouse has often said... Go through the rest of the house, Archie. Go through the rest... Yeah, well, never mind. I'll, uh... It's on. Somebody's walking. Coming downstairs. I'll go and see. Hey, you! Hey, hey. Come on into the living room. Meet your guests in one of several pieces as you prefer. You what? Ah. Hiya, folks. Ah, who's at last? That's very funny. I think I'll laugh. Uh, uh. May I ask why? Because this here ain't my dump. I was just casing the joint. I mean, I was just taking a stroll. Through the house? I'm eccentric. Oh, clever. However, I think you'd better stay. Why? Because you may turn out to be the owner of this house after all. I rather think introductions are in order. Well, I'm Peg Shirley. Yeah, my name is Wagner. Joseph Wagner? Uh, Lewis. How about you, Stroller? Cragen. Sam Cragen. Hmm. Peg, Louis, Sam. Mr. Cregan, while you were strolling upstairs, did you notice anyone else about? No. There was no one outside when Archie and I entered. The bridge is down, effectively cutting us off from further visitors. We may assume, therefore, that we are the only people in not about this house. Yeah, it's cozy, ain't it? Which further means that one of you three is a murderer. Am I? Am I? Oh, what are you saying? The murderer is the person who owns or lives in this house. All three of you denied being that person. Conclusion, one of you is a liar. Why well, well, I, I, I that? How dare I? I hardly expected a full immediate confession. However, we are absolutely isolated here. No one is going to come or leave until we have a killer. You know, you can't really keep us here. The flood can and will. Remember, the bridge is no longer. So you see, just the five of us alone. No one else inside the house, no one outside. Therefore... <laughs> Correction, Mr. Wolf. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's a branch or something tapping against the door. Unlikely. Archie. Okay, I'll go see who or what it is. Oh, hey. Who uh, in oh, the room is that? I got him. Somebody shut the door. Yeah, all right, I get it. Uh, a disreputable and unwashed gentleman. Head badly hurt. Is he conscious, Archie? I, uh, I don't know. He's mumbling something. Legs pushed off. Fell from the ledge. Uh, He's passed out. I guess he was trying to say that somebody pushed him out on a ledge. The side of the cliff, maybe. He must have regained consciousness and crawled to the house. Where'll I put him, Mr. Wolf? Bedroom, I suppose. We'll need first aid. We can't get a doctor. Cregan, where are the bedrooms? Yeah, one right up at the head of the stairs. And don't ask me how I happen to know. We shan't, Archie. Okay. I'll need somebody to help me carry him up without shaking him too badly. Cregan? Okay. Uh, let's go. As for the rest of you, Mr. Wagner, Miss Shirley, I suggest we return to the living room. But I don't see any reason why we should take orders from you. One of you is a murderer. I include Mr. Cregan, of course. Oh, but that poor man wasn't dead. Not for lack of trying. However, I was not referring to him. You mean... You mean someone else has been killed? Precisely. That is why I hope we should not hear another knocking at the door. It could only be a corpse. Archie. And Cregan. Yeah. The injured man? Still out. Probably got a concussion. Uh, did he say anything further? Well, he babbled a bit. I don't know if... Uh, we should assume we're among friends, Archie. Exactly what did he say? Well, he was pushed over the edge of the cliff because he saw Miller killed. Ah, did he also see who? No, passed out before he had a chance. He's an old tramp, Mr. Wolf. He was bumming his way through the country when he saw the murder. 
He must have decided on a touch of blackmail and receiving a confession instead, which may last for hours or for days. <gasps> Somebody's playing with the lights. Some fool. Yeah, the switch was over this way. Ah. Yeah, lights are on again. Whose idea was that? I had nothing to do with it. Me neither. Miss Shirley, why did you scream? Oh, well, someone brushed against me in the, in the darkness. You were standing? Uh, near the table, this table. Archie? No, nothing on the table except a bunch of keys on a ring. Hey, something screwy. Why should a guy put the lights out just to deposit a bunch of keys on a table? Obvious. Without doubt, those are the keys of this house. Possession of them would have disclosed which of you lives here and which of you therefore killed Miller. It's late. I shall sleep down here, lacking an elevator to transport me upstairs. The elevator's lacking. Yes, the rest of you should be able to find bedrooms upstairs. Good night. Good night. Archie. Yeah? Follow them upstairs. Spend the night awake. Okay. Good heavens, Archie. On yeah, my way. What's cooking up here? Uh, somebody's playing with the lights up Strike a match. Get on half die. I got a flashlight. Oh, yeah. oh, here it is. Light switch. You know, this putting out of lights is getting to be somebody's bad habit. Now, all three of you seem to be okay. Stay here. Where, all right. where are you going? Tramps room, right here at the head of the stairs. Think of all your good deeds while I'm gone. All right, downstairs again. What, again? Oh, dear. What happened? Well, it was more than a bunch of keys this time. Oh, that knife. There's blood on it. There should be. I just pulled it out of a man's heart. Wow. Well, Mr. Wolf, one of these three babies doused the lights, popped into the tramps room, deposited the knife in his chest, and popped right out again. The knife you're holding? Yeah. Tell it in your view to wrap a handkerchief around the handle. Well, whoever killed the tramp didn't have time to fool around with gloves, so... There should be prints on the knife handle. Satisfactory, Archie. That's mild enthusiasm. Archie, on that desk, an ink pad. Yeah. Miss Shirley, mm -hmm. you carry face powder, of course? Yes, I do. Archie will need it to bring out the prints on the knife. He will then fingerprint each of you. Compare your prints with those on the knife, and we shall have a murderer to hand over to the police. Archie, will you begin, please? Here they are, Mr. Wolf. Three cards labeled with Miss Shirley's name, Cregan's, and Wagner's. Their respective prints are on each card. Good. I have a knife here. Several quite distinct prints on it. It should be child's play to, uh... Hmm. Archie. Yeah? Take your own prints and mine. What? Do as I say quickly. Yes, sir. All right, give me your thumb. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Now mine. Thank me. Yeah. Yeah, there's something wrong. Something wrong and deadly loose in this house tonight. Well, there's a card with your prints and mine. Thank you. <clears throat> now you got five cards all together. So I have. Uh, Archie. What now? Take the ink pad and a fresh card with you. Where am I going with him? Upstairs. But, Mr. Wolf, there's nobody upstairs except the corpse. Precisely. It is his friends I want. Oh, this is so oh, ridiculous. I'm so over with. Uh, tired of this. Archie. Yeah, I got the dead man's prints. Will all of you please sit? All right, but it's... Good heavens, young woman. Be careful. We want no accidents. I'm sorry. I caught my high heels in the rug. Archie, the card with the corpse's prints on it. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. Mm. You know, I've had quite enough of this nonsense. Have you, Mr. Wagner? Yeah, and so have I, Mr. Wolf. Also, I don't think you know what you're doing. Perhaps not. However, I have something rather interesting to tell all of you. There is no one in this house besides yourselves, except, of course, for the dead man upstairs. There is no one on the rock on which this house stands, except for another dead man in our car. Look, we already know all that. Bear with me. We may rule out secret passages, unusual hiding places, or anything of that esoteric and childish nature. We may also rest assured that no one has come to or left this house or rock within the last few hours. Well, that means we're kind of hermetically sealed here, huh? Meaning also that whoever was here when the tramp was killed is still here. Still here in this room. Correct, Archie. Now then, I have checked the dead tramp's prints against those on the knife. 
Theoretically, suicide was possible. However, the prints do not match. That guy was in no condition to kill himself anyway. True. And I checked Archie's prints and mine against those on the knife. No similarity. Oh, but no one suspected either of you. Thank you, but I had to be thorough. That left only the three of you. I compared your cards and the prints on them with the prints on the handle of the knife. And? I want you to remember one thing very clearly. We are the only living people in this house or on this rock of land. No tricks are possible and may be ruled out. All right, so what? This. The prints on the handle of the knife that pierced the heart of the man upstairs do not match his prints or the prints of anyone in this room. Uh, well, no, well, mine wouldn't match. Would you mind saying that again? He doesn't have to. In those cards, Mr. Wolf has the prints of everybody here. And yet none of them match the prints on the knife handle. But, well, in that case, who or, or what killed him? Why, there must be someone else in the house. I give you my word, there is not. Hey, you thinking about ghosts or something? Ghosts never leave fingerprints. I, I, I've got to get away. I can't stand this. Me too. Come on, lady. But I, I'll come along with you if you don't mind. Mr. Wolf. Let them go. The bridge is down. They can't get far. Okay. I don't get it. Get what? Well, the fingerprint business. And who killed Miller plus the tramp? The identity of the killer, Archie, is quite obvious. It is? To who? To whom? Who's whom? <laughs> That's a joke. Yeah, I'm stalling for self-respect. You know? Uh, of course I do. I have no conclusive proof, however. I had hoped the fingerprints would be of assistance there, but they proved to be phantoms. I'm still smarting about the other thing. You know, it's at times like this that I almost agree with you about my intelligence. Lack of intelligence? Yeah, well, don't rub it in. Don't rub it in. Just go ahead. Yeah, well, maybe you better rub it in. From now on, you may refer to my brain in the negative. In the... Negative? Bless you, Archie. What I've just done, I don't know, but can I have a raise? No. I'll take it back. You can't. Get the others in at once. Mr. Wolf, you now have the appearance of Mr. Wolf being surrounded by several dozen bottles of beer. What have I done? You've explained the fingerprints, Archie. Hurry. I don't want to keep the killer in suspense. <laughs> I don't like this. Archie. They're all here. Yes, but they're all making a noise. Stop them. Miss Shirley, Mr. Craig, and Mr. Wagner, will you please shut? Uh, uh, Mr. Wolf, they have. Thank you, Archie. Now then, I have known for some little time which of you killed the tramp and Miller. I lack proof, however. And you... you have it now? I will admit for a while I was flummoxed by the negative evidence of the fingerprints. They seem to indicate that the tramp was murdered by a phantom. However, the word negative itself has solved the minor problem. Minor to who? To whom? Never mind. Shh. Archie, what is the salient feature of a film negative? Well, I suppose it's the fact that the darks are light and the lights are dark. Huh? Precisely. A reversal, then, of the actual appearances. Now, are there any similarities between filmed images and fingerprints? Oh, in a way... You could call the worlds and hollows that determine the individual characteristics of a fingerprint the lights and darks, eh? You could. I shall. Miss Shirley, yes. would you help in an experiment? Well, of course. Thank you. Archie, I want you to take Miss Shirley's fingerprints once again. Okay. Pad and card. Here you are, Miss Shirley. All right. Archie, I... quick. Huh? Grab her arm. I, I got it. Well, Usually I don't have to be coached, but... Let go of me. What are you trying to do? Miss Shirley... You already had pressed your fingers on the ink pad once. Why were you about to do it a second time? Well, I... I just wanted to make a better impression. Fury. Archie, wipe some of the ink off her fingers. Oh, but then it won't be any good. It'll be very good, Archie. I've well, done it. And take the print. No, no, let go of me. Maybe I never hurt women if I can help it, but right now I won't be able to help it. Mr. Wolf wants your prints all over again, so down on the knight's white card. No. Hey, thanks. Will you let me have that card now, Archie? Sure. In the meanwhile, hold on to Miss Shirley. A pleasure. Indeed? Would you continue to think so, Archie, if I told you that Miss Shirley's first name is not Peg, but happens to be Josephine, for which the diminutive is Joe? Glad they're fixing the bridge. 
I was beginning to think we'd be here forever. Louis, we have been. <laughs> you know, if those black orchids have been holding their breath waiting for you, they're going to be red in the face. Hey, hey new breed, red orchids, huh? Ah, uh, Jim, must you talk? Well, it's fun. Also, you've been holding out on me about the case. I surrender. Okay. You know, when we compared the new prints of Josephine with those on the knife, you could have knocked me over with a sash weight. They were identical. Naturally. She stabbed the tramp. Yeah, but what was the fingerprint gag? She merely loaded her fingers so heavily with ink that she falsified the markings. She filled up the hollows and walls with ink. The result was that ridges became hollows and vice versa. In the same fashion that a photographic negative falsifies lights and darks. You got that when I mentioned the word negative? It works, huh? Try it sometime. Yeah, the very next bank I rub. <laughs> but you said you knew who killed Miller and the Tramp even before you exposed the fingerprint gimmick. How? We knew Miller's murderer lived in this house. Had been stealing from him and so on. Uh -huh. Stealing what? Cash, of course. He, as the girl admitted, was an eccentric... Kept his money on the property. Cregan had probably heard of it, hence his casing of the house. Yeah? Our problem, therefore, was to discover who lived in this house. All three suspects denied it. Josephine Shirley told us, as you may remember, that she'd gone for a walk and then been driven by the flood to this house where we found her. Well, that's what she said. It could have been. No. Because, as you may also remember, she tripped at one point over the living room rug and mentioned why. Sure. Sure, she said she was wearing high heels. Uh-oh, because out in the country there are no pavements, so girls don't go for a walk in high heel shoes. Therefore, she hadn't gone for a walk. Therefore, she was lying. Therefore, she killed Miller and... <laughs> I should have noticed those heels myself. You should have, Archie. Your trouble, I suspect, was that... Uh... You didn't notice the feet for the legs. <laughs> you have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Gerald Moore as Archie Goodwin and G.G. Pearson, Howard McNear, Tim Graham, and Eddie Fields. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Vanishing Shells. There's a full serving of laughs on the menu at Duffy's Tavern tonight with Archie the Manager, played by Ed Gardner. Archie's colleagues in comedy are Miss Duffy, Clifton Finnegan, and Eddie the Waiter. This Sunday, the big show comes your way once again on NBC. And just listen to a few of the stars who'll be with you. Fred Allen, Jack Carson, Mindy Carson, Ed Archie Gardner, Ed Wynn, and many, many more. And of course, your MC will be Tallulah Bankhead. Listen Sunday for The Big Show. Ladies and gentlemen, that phone bell means exciting adventure. Hello? Hello. The handsome young man answering Hello. the phone is Archie Goodwin. The mountain of a man engrossed in deep thought in the oversized armchair is Nero Wolfe. Hey, boss. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf. There's a guy on the phone wants us to take a case. Seems that someone was mad at a guy who was mad, and now this guy on the phone is mad, wants us to find out who did the killing. What do you say, Mr. Wolf? We need the money. <laughs> Hello? Yes, Mr. Wolf says he'll be happy to take the case. Just present yourself and a check for $2,000 at 601 West 35th Street at 11 o'clock. Mr. Wolf can't wait till you get here. He's dying to go to work. Goodbye. <sighs> Greatest detective in the world. The only trouble is... He is... Yes, listeners, Archie is so right. He is the greatest detective in the world, and the fattest, and the least energetic. 
is Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you over this NBC network in a new series of adventures by Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight, it's The Case of the Beautiful Archer. Well, that's a good title. And it was a good case, too. It began in the consulting room of Dr. Raynard Townley of the Townley Sanitarium, uh, skipping a jump north of Nyack, New York, when a very lovely young lovely glared across the desk at the good doctor. Shall we pretend you don't know who I am, Dr. Townley? How could we possibly do that, my dear Diana Lawrence? Twenty-three years old, daughter of one of our better-known sculptors, Michael Lawrence. You were born in Johannesburg, educated in London and Paris, and live at present a hundred yards from here in your father's cottage on Berry Hill Lane. How's that? It's intended to be staggering, isn't it? You take no cream or sugar in your coffee, were winner of the Women's National Archery Tournament for 1947, and have an exceedingly high temper. Let's stop the nonsense. You have an inpatient here named Willard Garth... Well, Willard Garth happens to be my fiancé. Yes, he has mentioned the fact during his analysis. And, um, well, has he by any chance mentioned his reasons for suddenly refusing to see me during the past five weeks? He didn't have to, Miss Lawrence. Well, what do you mean? I mean that I recommended he give you up as a bad job. What? Well, I suppose you had some purpose in saying what you did. Of course. I'm the boy's doctor. Uh, you think you're in love with Willard Garth, I know. But actually, you're infatuated with the Garth millions. You take a lot on yourself, don't you, Doctor? I consider it important to relieve Willard of all painful external pressure. You've done well for Willard, Dr. Townley. Relieving him of me? I think so. Now, let's see you relieve yourself of me. You, uh, purchased the gun for this occasion, Miss Lawrence? Yes. And what exactly do you hope to accomplish with it? A quick and complete reversal of your decision about me. I'm not as easy to handle as Willard is, you see. And if you intend to ruin my life, then I intend to end yours, here and now. The phone is ringing. Let it ring. Hmm? Just as you say. It's the house phone, Miss Lawrence. It may be Willard, you know. Oh, Willard? Yes, he uh, usually phones me from his room at about this time every day. Oh. Well, all, all right. Answer it, but be careful what you say. You're in command, it seems. Hello? Oh, why, hello. I thought it would be you, Willard. Look, my boy, Diana Lawrence is here. I've had a talk with her, and I've reconsidered my opinion. Yes, yes, I'm quite serious. If you're at all sensible, you see her regularly and plan on a marriage as soon as you're discharged. Yes. Oh, you do? Very well, I'll see if she'll talk to you. Uh, Miss Lawrence. Yes? Uh, do you want to speak with him? Uh, give me the phone. Of course. Here you are, and I'll no, take this what gun. You... There we are. Now, stand away, Miss Lawrence. But, 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 but Willard, Willard's on the phone. Willard's not on the phone. No one was on the phone. The ring came from the push-button bell under my desk here. Oh. Sometimes I find it convenient to interrupt my consultations with a phone call. Oh, you... You smug, deceitful, self-sufficient... Murderer is a vexatious business. You'll be grateful to me one day. All right. Give me my gun and let me go. The gun, I'm afraid, stays with me. Here in this Majolica cabinet. I'd scarcely feel justified in trusting you with it. And now... With your permission, or without it, the interview is ended. Later that day, the phone in the Lawrence house on Berry Hill Lane began to jingle. And this time, it was no phony. Hello? Diana? Yes? Willard, darling. Diana, darling, it's Willard. Imagine... Has the doctor let you use the telephone just as if you were a great big adult? Oh, I've got to see you, sweetheart, and, and I didn't call you to argue. Love, beauty, understanding, that's what matters, isn't it? Isn't it? Do I hear the overtones of a change of heart? Oh, Diana, what's happened wasn't my fault. He poisoned me against you. Then why don't you walk out of that amateur nut house and stand up like a man? I probably shall, Diana. Now, please. 
please listen to me. He's letting me have the limousine tonight from 8 until 12. I want us to go for a ride and, and talk and talk and talk until everything is clear. Clear as a bell, my baby. Don't tell me he's trusting you to drive. Oh, no. No, one of the handyman here will show for us. Oh, say you'll come, Diana. Will you? Say it. Say yes. Say you will. Well, yes, Willard. I'll be glad to. Oh, eight o'clock, then? Eight. Oh, bless you. Bless you, my angel. <laughs> Oh, so that's it. You want my father's money. That's what you love, not me. Willard, the chauffeur will hear you. It's the way Townley says it is. He's right. He's right. Oh, why did I let you talk me into this? What a fool I was to have come at all. You're sick inside, Willard. So utterly, hopelessly sick. Oh. Oh, so now I'm... I'm hopelessly sick. Yes. Yes, you are. Oh, you, you're trying to confuse me. Take advantage of me. Wind me around your finger. Just because I love you too much. That's it. That's my illness. Of course, I see it now. You. You're the thing I must get rid of. You with your beautiful, beautiful face and your twisted values. You're at the bottom of all my agony. Wait, 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 wait. I'm saving myself. I'm saving myself. Once you're dead, the sickness is ended. I'll be safe. I'll be safe. Wait. Willard. Dr. Townley? Yes. Come in. Mr. Wolf's been expecting you. Come in, Dr. Townley. Come in. Have a chair. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. I'm so happy you've agreed to take this case. Have a glass of beer. Oh, no, no. Uh, never at this time of the morning, thank you. Well, doctor, the newspapers check with what you told me. The girl and young Garth went out for a ride in your limousine last night. The car was driven by one of your handymen. Uh, that's right. Haynes, his name is. And they never came back. Young Garth was found dead in the car with two bullets in him. The girl was gone and also Haynes, the handyman chauffeur. Huh? Correct, sir. Have you any idea where he could be? No, sir. And the young lady, tell me about her. She's Diana Lawrence, daughter of Michael Lawrence. The sculptor? The sculptor. She lives with him in a small cottage near my sanatorium on Berry Hill Lane. An extremely aggressive and self-centered female with more than a slight flair for violence. Your description might easily lead me to suspect her of this murder, sir. Well, I'm aware of that. And I don't think you'd be far off the mark. As I told you on the phone, she tried to murder me yesterday morning. Hmm. The police have made no headway in locating her? No. The homicide division has contacted her father, but uh, he's remained quite noncommittal. He simply says that uh, he's sure she's incapable of killing a fly and that he hasn't laid eyes on her since 8 o'clock last night. Highly suspicious behavior. She was unquestionably in the car with young Garth when he was murdered. Hmm. And she wasn't alone in the car with him. You were uh, referring to Haynes? Yes, but he can't be found either, remember? It appears that he failed to list his address on his job application. But somehow, Mr. Wolf, I'm quite sure he'll show up this afternoon. Somehow, Dr. Townley, if I were you, I wouldn't be quite so sure. We must begin by facing the initial problem of locating our suspects. Archie? Yes, sir? Get out the car and drive up to the house on Berry Hill Lane. And then? There you will ask Mr. Michael Lawrence to be sensible enough to cooperate with us in finding his daughter. And if the answer is no? I recommend, Archie, that you flatly refuse to take it. Mr. Lawrence was no simple baby to handle. He was in a studio when I walked in, chiseling on a statue of a boy and a girl, both wearing less clothes than the law allows. And before I got a chance to state my name, he commenced giving me a free lecture on the marble work of art. She's good. Really good. She's practically superb. The Ariadne. The what Ariadne? The girl in the statue. Oh. That's Ariadne. Tragic nymph of Greek mythology. Don't tell me you're not familiar with Apollo and Ariadne. All right, I won't. The Apollo, on the other hand, is unfinished. 
The face, you see, it, uh, <clears throat> it lacks something. The passion of yearning, Olympian desire. And yet, you know, the two figures have motion. Like your daughter? Eh? Your daughter, Diana, she's got motion also. As I hear it, she's been in motion ever since she murdered Willard Garth last night in the back end of a limousine. <laughs> so you're another flatfoot? Uh, not exactly. I'm paid in private by Nero Wolfe. Nero Wolfe? Yeah. You don't mean that a creditable man like Wolf thinks Diana killed young Gar? Well, he'd like to talk over the possibility with her. How laughable. Look at that face. Is there anything of the murderous in a face like that? In a face like what? Oh, I'm sorry. Diana posed for the Ariadne, you see. And the likeness is exact. You think a girl of this type, classic, sensitive, civilized, could descend to the clumsy, brute level of murder? Well, it's... It's a little hard to imagine. There. Even you agree with me. On the other hand... Shall we discuss the other hand over a cup of coffee? I'm quite exhausted. If you insist. I do. Sit down and inhale the atmosphere of culture at its source. There's a pot warming on the stove. Pot of what? Coffee or culture? <laughs> well, wait and see what he means. Ah. Oh, could never ignore a phone call. Knows might be something important. Yes. It's Diana, Father. Oh, uh, oh yes, Diana. It's it's all over the papers. Yes, I know. Well, I I don't think they'll find me where I am, and I'm staying here until things quiet down a little. Where are you, honey? Uh, what did you say? I said, where are you? You said, honey. Daddy, you never call me honey. Uh, I know it's because I'm excited. Where are you, sweetheart? You mustn't let anybody find out. Not a soul in the world. Where are you? Well, you know where Tyne Pike turns off to the left beyond Bartsville? Yes. Well, I'm... Call me later, Angel. But, Father... Oh. Oh, get that motorman's number. You will live, my friend, but not long if you don't control your curiosity. You With that mallet you hit me, what was the big idea? Do you really have to ask that question? Why don't you try to trick my daughter into disclosing her whereabouts? The police are pretty interested in her whereabouts. Then let them find her. But you can't be surprised, my friend, if I choose to protect Diana's interests. <laughs> So he's working on an Apollo and Ariadne, is he, Archie? Who cares about Apollo and Ariadne? The point is how he worked on my gourd. That, of course, was unfortunate, my boy, but... You get that piece? Mm Mm-hmm. Hello? Inspector Kramer. Hold it. For you. Here. Thanks. Yes? Wolf? Ah, how are you, Inspector? I hear you're in on the Garth killing. Not very deeply, I am afraid. We are still trying to locate the Lawrence girl. Well, you can forget about that. Yeah? Yes. We've already located her and released her on a habeas corpus. That sounds interesting. Her father had a lawyer on our heads before she was in here ten minutes. Too bad you couldn't have held on to her. Oh, I don't know. I'm not so sure we want her. Why not? Well, first of all, it's not likely she did it. No? No. Ballistics stated that the bullets that killed Willard Garth were not fired from point-blank range. And she was sitting beside him on the back seat. I see. Also, we found the murder weapon in the grass near where the limousine was parked. And she admitted it was hers. That sounds like a poor reason to release her. Well, the point is she wasn't in possession of the gun when the killing happened. At least so she says. No, who was? The doctor. What doctor? Townley. The guy who runs that sanitarium. According to her, he took the gun away from her for safekeeping at noon yesterday. There was a little more talk between them, something about fresh cigar ashes that were found in the dashboard ashtray of the limousine. After that, the boss hung up and exerted himself enough to put a call through to the Townley Sanatorium. I'm afraid the doctor is very busy just now. So am I, and my business happens to be highly important. Well, I'll say you called, Mr. Wolf, and I'll ask him to contact you just as soon as he has a free moment. Do you happen to have a free moment, miss? Why, well, yes, sir. Could you spend it by telling me if that handyman, Mr. Haynes, is being located? Why, yes, as a matter of fact, he has. One of the staff just found out where he lives, Mr. Wolf. Well? He has a little cottage at 206 Dockside Road. That's out near Sheep's Head Bay. Thank you. Archie. I'm going someplace, I suppose. You are? You're going to Sheep's Head Bay. (laughs) 
Hello there. Hmm? Looking for a guy I can't find. Oh? Yeah, his name is Haynes. Stopped at the cottage up there, but there's no one there. And I saw you here on the wharf fishing, so I... What did you say his name is? Haynes. H-A-I-N-E-S. Oh, oh, Haynes. Yeah, Yeah, do you know him? Well, there's a fella named Hines used to fish out here. No, 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 not Hines. Haynes. Couldn't be Huntingburg? No, it couldn't be. The name is Haynes. H-A-I-N... Haynes! Haynes! Give me a hand here, man. (laughs) Well, what do you know? <laughs> Funny, huh? That guy seems to think my name is Haynes. Yeah, so do I. You do? Yes, I... <laughs> I got back to our house, soaked to the skin and minus Haynes, and just in time to see the boss in the exhausting process of walking across the room to answer the phone. Hello? This is Dr. Townley. You called me. So I did. About the murder? More specifically, about the statement from Diana Lawrence that you removed a firearm from her possession yesterday morning. Uh, That's quite correct. It's here in my Majolica cabinet. Is it? Of course it is. I suggest you check. Just a moment. Uh, Mr. Wolf. Yes? I'd like to see you at once. Gun, I suppose, has vanished. But how did you know? Because it is at ballistics, Doctor. It turned out to be the gun that killed Willard Garth. I... I see. Do you? Yes. I understand everything now. It's all so crystal clear. Just how crystal clear? I'm quite certain, Mr. Wolf, that I can put my finger on the killer. Then I think it would be well if you came here immediately. No, I'm afraid it's impossible, sir. Uh, there's an important operation scheduled and I simply cannot leave. What do you suggest? Well, is it outside the realm of possibility that you come here? Is it, Mr. Wolf? Hello, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf? When my boss has to leave the house, it's a major tragedy. Sometimes he rages, sometimes he curses the whole detective business, lock, stock, and barrel. And sometimes he keeps very quiet and grips the side of the car desperately and tries not to inhale any fresh air. This was one of the quiet times. Just go slowly, Archie, but get there as quickly as you can. Oh, you don't want a chauffeur, Mr. Wolf. What you need is a magician. Keep your eye on the road and don't strain yourself to make superfluous witticisms. Why don't you try relaxing a little? I hear there hasn't been a man-eating tiger sighted on the Sawmill River Parkway in the last 500 years. Your liberty is out of order. Don't try to make light of a deplorable situation. Here's the sanatorium. And there's Dr. Townley coming to meet us. It's terribly nice of you to have come, Mr. Wolf. I've heard about your aversion to traveling, and I appreciate your going to the trouble. Don't mention it. Oh, Archie, help me out with my other arm. There we are. Now, calm down. You're all in one piece. I think you'll find the trip highly profitable, Mr. Wolf. You'll consider it time very well. Hey, hey, what's the matter? What is it? What happened? He's been shot. It's hardly likely there wasn't a sound. This kind of shot doesn't make a sound, boss. What do you mean? Better take a look for yourself. There's an arrow in his back, and he's dead. We remembered that Dr. Townley had said Diana Lawrence had won the Women's National Archery Tournament for 1947. The Lawrence house was visible through the trees a hundred yards away. So we started for it and the sculptor's studio. There's no one around. So this is his lady's effort, Apollo and Ariadne. Yeah. Done a little work on it since I was here. The Apollo's face is more finished and... Hey, boss. Yes? You know, somehow or other, Apollo looks a little familiar. I wouldn't be surprised, Archie. I think if you examine it closely... Ah, our our host. You remember me, don't you? I met you once at a dinner party at your house, the time they opened the new museum on 67th Street. Of course, of course, Mr. Lawrence. And to what do I owe the honor? It's not much of an honor. Dr. Townley has been murdered. No. I am afraid Mr. Goodwin is being accurate. He's been murdered with a bow and arrow. And what does that mean to you, Mr. Lawrence? I'm sorry. I've been a fool. 
An awful fool. You can't blame yourself too much. If you'd cooperated with the police instead of looking out for your daughter's interest, the man would still be alive. But I assure you... Where's the girl? She should be here now. She phoned me a while ago and said she was coming by for passage money to Rio. You were looking for me? Lost. Diana, put the gun down, Angel. And tie a rope around my neck? Might I inquire if your plan is to kill us all, Miss Lawrence? Oh, what would yours be if the world was after you for something you didn't do? Wouldn't you be willing to risk persuading a jury of that? Thanks, no. I'll skip that chance. Father, Father, get me the money. Diana, sweetheart, don't make me a part of your murders. That's asking too much of love. Do, don't you know I'm not guilty? No, no, Diana, I don't. <laughs> Leave that gun away, Diana. Hey, looks like I walked in on the nose. That's him, boss, the guy who soused me. Take a little of your own advice. Relax, Archie. What do you want here, Mr. Haynes? I want to give up and try to straighten out this little deal. Mr. Lawrence... Yes? Here's your money back. You got a right to call me a welcher. I promised I wouldn't give evidence against the girl and you paid my price. But enough is enough and right here and now I'm unloading. Just what does this mean? It means I saw her do it. <gasps> oh, you, you stupid lying rotten. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Grab her, Archie. Grab her. Get the pair of them out of here. <laughs> What can I say to myself now? What can I do? I'm sorry, Mr. Lawrence, but it's not necessary to eat your heart out. Many fathers before you have done their best and failed. But I had a special duty toward Diana. Special duty? Yes. I... Well, you see, you'll find it out sooner or later, so I'd best tell you now. I'm not a real father. I adopted her nine years ago when she was 14. I see. And I should never have done it. I realize now that I wasn't equal to the task. Well, 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 all's not lost yet. They may not convict her, you know. Eh? Yeah? I said they may not convict her. But how could they fail to convict her? She killed Garth, didn't she? Did she? She shot him. But the gun was in townless possession. She could easily have stolen that. She could have broken into his office later. It, it wasn't locked. What wasn't locked? The Majolica cabinet were... I mean... I believe you mean what you said, Lawrence, the Majolica cabinet. For the life of me, I can't see how you could know whether it was locked or not, unless you had the experience of opening it. Could it be that you went looking for the gun yourself after Townley said he had confiscated it? That you killed Townley with a bow and arrow which you handle as well as your daughter because he was just on the point of telling me that you knew where the gun was? And that you were the likeliest murder suspect? You must be mad. Oh, sir, not I. <laughs> but you are mad and more than a little. You hated Will Edgar. It was you who were making the marriage impossible. You loathed him, and in the end, you killed him. How could I have killed him? I'll tell you a little secret, Mr. Lawrence. The police found cigar ash in the dashboard tray of the death car. <laughs> Chemical analysis showed that the ash was from an El Adoro cigar. What have you got in your left hand, sir? In my... Uh, an Elidoro cigar. And in my right hand, a derringer. Powerful and admirable little weapon, Lawrence. I suggest you show proper respect for it by dropping all this here and now. You don't wish to hear me say the rest, that you were horribly in love with Diana, your own adopted daughter, in love and hopelessly, eternally frustrated... You begrudge me the triumph of accusing you of having bribed Haynes to let you take his place at the driver's seat of the limousine and further bribed and threatened him into putting on his show of merry pranks and false confessions to confuse us all beyond measure. You said I loved Diana. Would I do all this to her if I did? Oh, but of course, as love as yours is really hate. You were content to see her dead rather than relinquish her. Like all miserly, small-hearted men, you would rather kill the thing you love than muster the generosity necessary to seeing it attain happiness. That's enough out of you. I should think it was much too much. It is. Archie, my boy, I'm grateful to you, both for coming back into the house when you did and for being such a good shot. Hope you remember that next time you feel like insulting me. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what's with that cigar ash routine? Who told you the ashes in the limousine were from an Eladoro, boss? I never heard anything about that. 
<laughs> As a matter of fact, neither did I. No one could possibly have determined the brand by any chemical means in existence. I knew that, you see, and I took the long chance that Lawrence didn't... Oh, uh-huh. but I still don't get the mainspring of the deal. How did you know he was in love with Diana? That, uh, that was genius, I have to admit it. You see, it all hinged on the statue of Apollo and Ariadne. According to the Greek myth, Apollo fell deeply in love with the nymph, but because they were of different worlds, he was condemned to pursue her always and never to catch her. Well, what's that got to do with the price of eggs? Isn't it perfectly obvious? Didn't he tell you that Diana had posed for the Ariadne? Yeah, but I still don't... And you yourself remarked on the fact that the finished Apollo looked somehow familiar, didn't you, Archie? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Boss. Don't you know why that was? You mean that... I mean that Michael Lawrence unconsciously revealed the true state of his heart. He didn't intend to, I suppose. But precisely and accurately, he chiseled the features of the tortured god in his very own image. Oh. And speaking of torture... Yeah? Will we be home in time for dinner? Oh, boss, you can't be that hungry. Oh, yeah, I am. Good heavens, Archie. Do you realize that I haven't eaten since lunch? You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story by Peter Berry was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin and Gigi Pearson, Ted Von Els, Bill Johnstone, Peter Leeds, and Jay Novello. Next week, stay tuned for Nero Wolf Transcribed. Later this evening, the unique Mr. Monty Woolley stars once again in the new comedy series, The Magnificent Montague, the delightful saga of an embittered Shakespearean ham. After many triumphant years on the stage, The Magnificent Montague now portrays Uncle Goodhart, the hero of a radio serial, and his trials and tribulations are 30 minutes of delightful listening over most of these NBC stations. And today being Friday means another visit to Duffy's Tavern, where Archie the manager presides over another sparkling session of mischief and madness. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means adventure. Hello? Hello? The young man answering the phone is Archie Goodwin. Yes, this is Nero Wolf's office. The mountain of a man in the oversized armchair staring at Archie with a beady eye is Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf is in. Mr. Wolf is always in. Would he stay in until... He would. Archie, what on earth? Boss, she sounds blonde. Phooey. Don't believe I can tell over the phone? Okay. Excuse me, miss, but are you blonde? Oh. Go ahead and laugh. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Wolf will see you. Goodbye. I did not say. No, but you will. Besides, she wasn't blonde. And I want you to see red. Oh, Archie, you better think of some new ones. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chair-born genius, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. It's the case of the girl who cried wolf. In the old brownstone house on 35th Street, my boss, Nero Wolf, with all his 300 pounds, sits at his desk from which he runs his world. We have been patiently waiting for the lady client. Then there's a knock at the door, and I admit her. A beautiful, frightened, and red-headed girl. Mr. Wolf? Mr. Nero Wolf? Not by 160 pounds. I'm Archie Goodwin. Oh, yes. 
I spoke to you on the phone. I'm... I'm Mary Dunning, Mr. Goodwin. I was wondering if... He's in. He's always in. Come on. We'll try getting him to admit it. This is Mr. Wolf. Miss Mary Dunning. How do you do, Miss Dunning? Here, take this red leather chair. It's a nice match for your hair. You know, as old Dr. Titmouse has said to me, beware of a red-headed woman. But I never could believe Thank them. you, Mr. Goodwin. Your business, Miss Dunning? Do you mean what I do or... Or why I've come to you. Both of you, please. Well, I'm Mr. Stevens' secretary at the Tolliver Ecological Foundation. Our offices are down on East 12th Street. Um, uh, ecological? Fear research as to factors operating on plant and animal development and survival, Archie. Animal development, huh? Miss Dunning, the foundation has several agricultural research projects throughout the country, hasn't it? That's right, Mr. Wolf. And Donald Stevens is executive director... Or was until... Was? He's disappeared. It's been three days now. He's not been near the office, nor his apartment. No message or... Apartment? Stephen's been living alone? He's a bachelor. He's engaged to Laura Tolliver. She's a cousin of the original Tollivers. But she doesn't know where he is either. Have you come to me on Laura Tolliver's account or on behalf of the foundation? Well... Well, neither, Mr. Wolf. I'm just worried and... And I'd heard of you as one of the finest private detectives in New York. You heard of me, Miss Dunning. We see that you're here. I still fail to understand why. (laughs) But I've told you. Mr. Stevens has dropped out of sight. And there's another thing. The last time I saw him, he had a caller with him in his office. Caller? Male? Female? I don't know. We're in a converted old brownstone house and... Well, the way the offices are laid out, I don't see all the people who come in unless they make a point of coming to my desk. Mm Mm-hmm, I see. All I know is that Mr. Stevens stepped out for a moment, looking either scared or angry, I couldn't be sure which, and asked me to see if there was a policeman at the corner. Which corner? (laughs) Archie, continue, Miss Dunning. Well, I started to go, and there were low voices arguing from the inner office. And then Mr. Stevens called me not to bother. Then what? He said I could go ahead and take my lunch hour then. So I did. And when I came back, he was gone. Leaving no message? Leaving no message. And you've neither seen or heard of him since? I've tried all over. By phone, going out myself. Miss Dunning, has Mr. Stevens been in the habit of making extended business trips? Well, once in a while to our research stations in Pennsylvania or New Jersey or up in Vermont... But not without letting me know. I have to make out his travel vouchers. Has there been any recent travel at the foundation? Trouble? Financial trouble? Personal trouble? No, there's been no trouble. Miss Dunning, you're wasting my time and yours. This is a problem for the police, if there is a problem. Oh, oh no, Mr. Wolf. I'd have gone to the police, except... Well, if there should be an innocent explanation, it didn't seem fair to the Foundation to risk the unpleasant publicity of... I said for the police. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. It's your say-so, but when a girl walks in here and asks... The young lady can depart by the use of the same rather trim legs that carried her here, Archie. Oh, now look, boss, just because I look at... Miss Dunning, I can think of a dozen reasons that might take your bachelor director out of town for a few days without the formality of explaining his actions. Then... You won't look into this? Despite Mr. Goodwin's frowns, no. Should Mr. Stevens not turn up tomorrow or so, I suggest you advise the police or whatever attorney acts for the foundation. There is such a person, of course. Yes. Jonas Dowd is counsel. He's also a coat trustee. Consult him, then, by all means. But you don't seem to understand. If you'll excuse me, I'm overdue for an important conference with my cook. We have just received a shipment of truffles from France. Well, of course, if Mr. I... Mr. Wolf, if you ask me... Precisely I... what I've refrained from doing, Archie. Would you be good enough to escort Miss Dunning to the door? To the door, Archie. Good night, Miss Dunning. Good night. Good night. And thanks, just the same. Look, Mr. Wolf, it's your shop and you can get as surly as you please. But can you give me one excuse for that high-handed brush? One thin shred of an excuse? Miss Dunning was sitting in this chair... The girl was lying, Archie. Lying? How can you say that? At least twice. And possibly from the moment she opened that undeniably pretty mouth. Now, if you would excuse me, Archie, I have an appointment with a truffle. (laughs) 
You say you have a surprise for me, Archie. Enough to yank you three inches out of that chair. Remember the girl who was here last night, Mary Dunning? You see, man, waiting to let me forget her. Huh? Well, I took off on my own this morning to check up on that foundation setup. Good, Archie. I ventured a small bet with Fritz that you would. All right. See if your bet included this. I found Stevens down there right in his office. Missing executive director? Yes, and the missing Mr. Stevens claimed he had just been in a business trip. Delayed getting back because his car had been smacked by a hit-and-run driver in New Jersey. Now, here's the payoff. He even tried to make out that he'd been thinking of calling you in on a problem. The hit-and-run accident? No, no, something about the foundation. But I didn't waste time letting him cloud it up for us. The point is... Archie, that... you brought him here, of course. Stevens? No, he's still down there. We'll want to grab him before the day is out, but I had something more important to run down first. It took me three calls on the way up here, but you can take it as confirmed. We've still got a disappearance case, and this one you're not sitting out. Indeed. And who has disappeared now? Mary Dunning. Stevens is back, but Mary's gone. Not at the office, not at her rooming house, and none of her clothes are taken. How'd you get going? Put a police call out on Mary? Back to 12th Street and get Stevens out of that office and up here as fast as you can. I'll phone him. You are on the way. Hello? This Donald Stevens? Yes, this is Donald Stevens. This is Nero Wolf. I understand you've been thinking of consulting me. Well, as a matter of fact, I have, Mr. Wolf. I started to explain to Mr. Goodwin, but... Uh... Are you alone there at the office? Why, well, yes. As it happens... Be careful. I don't think your car smashed up as an accident. I've just sent Mr. Goodwin to ask you to come here. Meanwhile, I'd suggest... Oh, excuse me, Mr. Wolf. There seems to be someone coming in now. Wait, Mr. Stevens. There hasn't been time for Archie to get there yet. Excuse me, Mr. Wolf. Don't... Just hold the wire a moment. Wait, Mr. Stevens. Uh, come on in. I haven't had a chance yet. Oh, what? No! No! Oh, no! <laughs> And that's all Inspector Kramer has been able to make of it, Archie? Not to hear him tell it, but that's all he's got. Stephen dead and the girl still missing. Did you find anything helpful at the office? I think the murderer started to tear up some account books and project ledgers, but I must have scared him away when I rang the bell. Couldn't have been more than three or four minutes after the shooting when I got there. But you saw no one? Hmm. The murderer can cover a lot of ground in three or four minutes. You, uh, naturally, by accident, since it is mildly illegal, you had a good look at the dead man? A very good look. Not to mention his pockets. Anything particular? Well, there was a half-eaten package of lifesavers in the left-hand trouser pocket. What's particular about that? The flavor was lime. I hate lime. Foy. <laughs> Archie, I uh, called Jonas Dowd last night. The foundation lawyer? Yes, he set up the original charter under which Donald Stevens operated with an annual fund of $90,000. Ecology has its attractions. 90,000 attractions, to be precise. It indicates a possible reason for Stevens' murder. He was in sole charge of that money. Somebody donated 338 caliber bullets to him. Hardly a token of appreciation. Perhaps not. However, the shooting followed the attempt to stage an automobile accident. Archie, I've sent Saul Panza on an errand for me. Saul, huh? He's expensive. True, he's the best man in the shadow job there is, but... You've got something, huh? Possibility. An angle I can't handle? Apart from your natural preference for curves, you're more than working up here in New York. Finding Mary Dunning for a starter. Or, uh, her body? Or her body, as it may be. Is that what Saul's on, picking up a line on Mary? Among other chores, Saul's is buying me some special groceries at the city market. You frown, Archie. I glower. But okay, play it cozy. You can send Saul off to Stockholm for smorgasbord for all I care. I'm still asking, what about Stevens and what about Mary? Where do we start? I'm expecting Laura Tolliver, the heiress, and the son of Jonas Dowd here within a few minutes. Jonas Dowd himself proved as difficult to pry from the office as... Uh... As you generally are from this one. Oh, good for old Jonas. Wait a minute, though. You said a son was coming. Would that be Peter Dowd? It would be. Could I trouble you to pass that second bottle of beer? It's your third. Stop auditing me, Archie. You reacted to the name of Peter Dowd. May I ask why? 
Kramer is ahead of you on that pitch. He's had Peter Dowd downtown already. And learn? Playboy, used to be in love with Laura Tolliver, now in line to take over Stephen's tidy 20000 a year salary as executive director. Take over free. Peter Dowd's no ecologist. He's got more important qualifications. His old man and Laura Tolliver are co-trustees under the Tolliver will, and the director can be anybody they name. Archie, you sound prejudiced against young Mr. Dowd. Yeah, that's what Kramer said. I'm just naturally suspicious of anybody who stood to pick up 20 grand a year, plus a whack at the 90,000 a year in house money, just by throwing three thirty-eight caliber slugs into Stevens. Particularly after getting rid of Mary Dunning to clear the way. The police still have no leads on Miss Dunning? A for effort, Z for results. Now, the way I see it, boss... Leg work now, Archie. Guess it's later. You might try Miss Dunning's landlady again for one, and try Peter Dowd's apartment. Now? Yes. I'd say go along and keep after the missing girl. Instead of sifting through the names in Stephen's appointment book you were asking about? It's two legs of the same animal. The names may help on the girl. Now, Archie, on your way. Come in. Mr. Wall? Yes, come in, Mr. Oliver, Mr. Dowd. Sit down. Yep. It's good of you both to come. Miss Tolliver, I'm profoundly sorry of your loss. You were to marry Mr. Stevens, as I understand it. Yes, three weeks from today. I was trying to warn poor Stevens just as the murderer came in. But he evidently knew his caller well enough to feel no alarm. The uh, police told us that, Mr. Wolfe. We've just come from Inspector Kramer's office. I know, Mr. Dowd. Did you gather the inspector meant to see you again? Why should he? How could anyone think that, well, that, that Peter could have anything to do with this, this horrible business? I see that you have no doubts about Mr. Dowd here, Mr. Oliver. Easy, Laura. Yes, Mr. Wolf, I, I gathered that Kramer was interested in me. He's got a man outside here watching us now. You're alert, Mr. Dowd, or... Or what? Or aware that Inspector Kramer may have grounds for keeping you under surveillance. Look, Mr. Wolf, I didn't come here to be put through the jumps again. First Kramer, and now you. I'm acting for the Tolliver Foundation, Mr. Dowd. I have been since your father retained me last night. Well, why jump on me, then? Young man in my age and weight, the chances of my jumping on anyone are about as likely as, uh, well, as unlikely as to expect that you are not still in love with Miss Laura Tolliver here. Mr. Wolf, we haven't admitted that, that we... Miss Tolliver, Miss Tolliver, your concern a moment ago at the possibility that this young man might be charged with Stephen's murder... Now, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. Climb back on me if you want, but let Laura alone. If you're trying to... to, to make... I'm no longer trying, Mr. Dowd. You both confirmed the point for me. All right. I am still in love with Laura. And I think Laura's known ever since she accepted Stephen's ring that, her, well, that their engagement was a mistake. What are you going to make of that? Did Stevens know you hadn't given up on Laura? I told him twice. I even went down to the foundation just... Just when, Mr. Dowd? This morning while I was telephoned Stevens, for example? I... I I haven't been near the foundation office for days. I, I've... Well, I, I've been out of town. Mr. Wolf, you've no right to twist and turn everything Peter says. I do love him, but I... Laura. Oh, that's, that's the first time you've come right out with it since... I'm sorry, Peter. I've wanted to tell you a thousand times. But, well, you kept going away on all those trips, and I never knew whether it was for some other girl or... <clears throat> Mr. Dowd, Miss Tolliver, could this tender exchange be postponed till you two find yourselves alone? Go ahead, Mr. Wolf. Ask anything you want, as long as I know it's all right with Laura here. Roundly spoken, Mr. Dowd. May I ask about Mary? Ma What's Mary Dunning got to do with this? I'm glad you're aware of the Mary I meant. Well, well, I, I, I've met her at the foundation, of course. We've all heard she's missing. You couldn't suggest where she might be. How would Peter know? Let's return to Mr. Stevens. Can either of you explain his three days' absence from the city? Well, I've been out of town myself. Mr. Oliver? He could have been inspecting any one of the research plants. He didn't tell me, if that's what you mean. Stevens said this morning he had been wanting to consult me. You can't suggest why? Well, no, I can't. About foundation business or personal business? Three thirty-eight caliber bullets kept Mr. Stevens from making that clear, Mr. Oliver. Mr. Dowd's father is sending me over some material, but as yet, it's not in my hands. Are you familiar with the personnel at the research stations? There aren't any more than four or five project managers. Halsey in Vermont, Schwartz in Pennsylvania. Excuse me. 
You hear the wolf? Archie. Yes, Archie. You can take it back about Mary Dunning. If she's a liar, she's just gone to a lot of trouble to make it look good. Dead? No, but knocked out with chloroform and stuffed in a closet in a man's apartment. And uh, guess whose apartment? Spare me your charades, Archie. Peter Dowds. That's where I'm calling from. Is he still with you? As it happens, yes. You better hang on to him. There's been another development. Inspector Kramer's got hold of a man named Schwartz. The Pennsylvania project manager. Right. Schwartz was at the foundation office this morning, and he says Peter Dowd was going in as he came out. When? Within minutes of your call to Stevens. Kramer's on his way to your place now to pick up young Dowd. Any uh, instructions? I'd like more company. Well, the ball game is all wrapped up, isn't it? I'd still like more company. Right. Mary and Schwartz? If you can get them here. And Archie. Yes? Get them here. I'll have that fifth bottle of beer, Archie. Seventh and quota for the night. And when do you get around to calling in Mary and our friend Schwartz? In a moment, Archie, in a moment. After all that scramble to get him here. I've been studying these project reports that Jonas Dowd sent over. Fascinating field ecology. I know. The factors playing on the development and survival of living organisms. Too bad poor Stevens didn't figure on a factor named Peter Dowd. Archie, I'm ready for Mr. Schwartz now. No, Mary? I'll risk you in the next room with Miss Dunning for the time being. Okay. One Schwartz coming up. Oh, come in, Mr. Schwartz. Mr. Wolf? How do you do, Mr. Schwartz? My apologies for this long wait you've had. And I'll try to make our business brief. Yes, sir. Mr. Schwartz, you managed the Tolliver Agricultural Research Station in Pennsylvania for some time. Two years. I am not sure I didn't once enjoy a shipment of mushrooms that came from your place. You've experimented with Maya Arenaria. Maya Arenaria? Yes, of course. Yes, so we've done some work with mushrooms. They were excellent. Uh, by the way, I understand you saw Mr. Stevens just before he was shot down. If I'd stayed ten minutes longer, he might still be alive. May I ask the purpose of your call? I was delivering the monthly reports. No special trouble you came to discuss? No, sir. You met Peter Dowd coming in at the foundation as you were going out. How did he look? In a hurry. How so? He just pushed past with his face turned away. You're sure it was he? Yes, I had seen him at the foundation maybe two or three times before. Were you aware that Mr. Stevens and Mr. Dowd were both apparently in love with the same young lady? I'm a research worker, Mr. Wolf. I wouldn't know about Mr. Stevens' personal affairs. Just an hour ago, before Inspector Kramer took him from here, young Dowd admitted that he'd been there today. I didn't think I could be mistaken. But he said only because Stevens had phoned him to come. Were you there when that call was made? No, there was no call to doubt while I was there. Hey, excuse me, Mr. Swartz. Yes, Nero Wolf speaking. This is Saul Tanza. Yes, Saul, you're still... Yeah, on. still down here at the city market. Looks as if you were right. Indeed? One of their trucks just pulled in with a load of full crates. Top quality produce. I'll uh, try not to wince when you send in the expense sheets. Any other confirmation? Internal revenue records show no taxes paid on income by the Tolliver Foundation. Thank you, Saul. Phone any information as you get it. You'll forgive me again, Mr. Swartz. Archie! Yes, boss? Would you ask Miss Dunning to step in now? Coming up. Come in now, Miss Dunning. Good evening, Miss Dunning. You've quite recovered from the chloroform? Mr. Goodwin's been helping me. He's been rubbing my forehead, and I'm... Spare me any further details. Miss Dunnings, would you mind telling me again how it was you came to find yourself in Mr. Dowd's apartment? Well, it was a phone call that got me to go over. It was a man whispering. He didn't give his name, but he said if I came to that address, apartment 4C, I could learn something about Mr. Stevens. You went to apartment 4C, and then? That's really all I know. Just after the door opened, before I could see him, this coat was thrown over my head, and then he must have given me the chloroform. It was Peter Dowd, of course. Dowd? Who else could it have been? It could have been Mr. Swartz here. Mr. Wolf, you're joking. Am I, Swartz? Joking or drunk? Why should I... Uh... For the ancient reason, Swartz. Money. For the racket you had and wanted to keep. Racket? Mr. Schwartz was in... Swartz is no more of an ecologist than Mr. Goodwin here. A moment ago, he accepted Mara Arenaria as a mushroom. It happens to be a common clam. 
common on nearly any beach, rare in inland Pennsylvania. And Stevens knew I didn't go in for all that Latin stuff. I could understand that you might be useful without it, Swartz. But to get away from your station operations, you fake the scientific knowledge you never had. All right. Suppose I am more of a farmer than a fancy scientist. Our job at the research station is to raise vegetable crops, isn't it? As you worked it, Swartz, of course. You turned an agricultural research project into a commercial farm. All expenses met from tax-free funds and not a cent of return shown for the produce sold. So that's why Saul Panzer drew the rutabagus run. Stephen had the innocence of a specialist interested in his own field only. But even Stevens finally began to get on to those doctored reports of your sports. And when was it the Internal Revenue men began asking questions? Look, Goodwin, is this fat guy out of his mind? You had to get rid of Stevens after the last inspection trip. Were you even counting on taking over his job after Peter Dowd was put away for Stevens' murder? Merely if you'll just explain to this lunatic... Watch it, Archie, watch it. I've got his gun. Droidly done, Archie. Now, wait a minute. This is a thirty-two, and it was a thirty-eight that did the murder. Mr. Wolf, that's my bag. You can't... Take this pistol from it, I have, my dear. This extraordinary effort you put me to of actually leaving my chair to secure this weapon, we'll add that to the score against you. Mr. Wolf, if you aren't too tucker to answer, that gun from Mary's bag. It's a thirty-eight. It may be the one used on Stevens. But Mary couldn't. She didn't. If ballistics tells us that this is the weapon, then Swartz must have passed it to her for safekeeping till it could be planted in young Dowd's apartment or car or whatever. I didn't have anything to do with it. Miss Dunning, you had to do it more than you know. Do you realize that if Mr. Goodwin hadn't found you at the Dowd apartment when he did, that you might not be alive at this moment? You were the one person who knew Swartz's crime. Mary, don't listen to him. She's listening, Swartz. Miss Dunning, you thought the chloroform scheme was directed solely against Peter Dowd. And so you let Swartz talk you into it. Mr. Goodwin tells me the door of that closet was sealed with scotch tape. I didn't know that. Schwartz actually tried... Your chloroform sleep was meant to turn into a permanent one, Miss Dunning. And I was trying to cover for him. All right, here it is. Schwartz planned it all. He did try the hit and run, and he did shoot Stephen. He's a liar. Mary, you've been juggling those books since... Say the details for Inspector Kramer, Schwartz. There's guilt enough to be divided between you and guilt enough to burn you both. You're being noble and not rubbing it in. Don't I merit a full explanation? Archie, I'm concentrating on truffles. Do we dig out a bird or shall we have them in an omelet again? Mr. Wolf, look, I've got a white flag up and I'm asking. All right, Mary and Schwartz wanted Stevens out of the way. And all right, they tried to hang it on Peter Dowd. But why'd Mary come here and try to get you into it in the first place? As far as she knew that night, Archie, Stevens wasn't to get back to New York alive. Swartz hit and run ambush in New Jersey was supposed to take care of Stevens on his way back from Pennsylvania. By luck, Stevens survived the accident, and Swartz had to follow him here to finish him off. Yes, but I still don't see why... Mary came here to establish her innocence by pretending to seek our help. Oh. And she thought to keep suspicion from Swartz by creating the imaginary figure of a threatening caller at the office several days before her. She knew Stevens meant to consult me about Swartz, and she could guess Jonas Dowd would call me in eventually. Well, Stevens said he wanted to consult you that morning when I... That morning when you couldn't hear Stevens out because you were seeing him as Mary Dunning wanted us to see him. Oh, a trick operated with two vanishing acts to explain, Stevens's and Mary's. There you have it, Archie. And both fake. A straight business trip branded a run out or a snatch only by Mary's account, and then the chloroform act at Dowd's apartment. You have it in full. Mm-hmm. Except how you knew she was lying to start with. Point one, the girl offered no fee, no prospect of a fee. Mm-hmm. Stay at that. Could anyone claim knowledge of my reputation, Archie, and still seriously expect that I would take an arduous labor for the love of it? <laughs> oh, I'm ashamed of myself. Point two, she told us of a caller coming to see Stevens. Of Stevens asking her to fetch a policeman, then changing his mind. 
When asked to call a policeman, what woman's curiosity would be satisfied by being told not to bother? <laughs> How utterly brilliant you are. Mm, yes. Archie, a bottle of beer. All right. And now back to a serious problem, you know. I think they see a compromise on these troubles. Between bird and omelette? Archie, why not both? Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Charles O'Neill was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Charlotte Lawrence, Howard McNear, Mona Keneally, Lamont Johnson, and Herb Butterfield. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Slaughtered Santa Clauses. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just keep your dial tuned to NBC later as Archie the manager and his delightful friends cook up another mad and merry session at that remarkable restaurant. From Hollywood, it's time now for John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Chet Graham, Johnny. Who? Wake up, boy. Chet Graham claims New York Mutual. Oh, hi, Chet. How are things? Bad. Johnny, I have to make a little trip out to the coast on a phony claim. I'll be gone about four days, but I need someone to hold down my office while I'm away. Can you do it? Oh, that's not my line, Chet. You know that. Well, make it your line, Johnny. Somebody has to be here. Look, you can live in my apartment. You can use my tickets to wish you were here. You can even take my girl if you want. New York's swell this time of year. Can't you get anybody there? Oh, everybody's got the flu or busy or something. When do you want to leave for the coast? I'd like to get out on the noon plane today. Well, I can be down there by 11. Good. We'll probably miss each other, but just walk right in the office and make yourself at home. I'll call you from L.A. Have a good trip. Uh, By the way, what does your girl look like? Even your best dream was never that good. Just leave her phone number on your desk. John Lund, in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to New York Mutual Underwriters Limited, Rockefeller Center, New York City. Attention, Mr. Chester Graham, claims and adjustments. Dear Chet, you probably read some of this in the Los Angeles papers, but they don't have the whole story. Maybe they'll never get it all. I hope not. I found out part of it, stumbled into the rest of it, and I'm trying to forget all of it. The following is an accounting of expenditures during your four-day absence and my investigation of the James Clayton matter. Expense account item one, $14.35 transportation Hartford to New York, where, as per your advice, I walked in your office, sat down, and made myself at home. And where, 15 minutes later, I had a caller. Mr. Dollar, is it? That's right. The girl at the reception desk said Mr. Graham was out of town and that you were taking his place. Yes. Please sit down. Well, thank you, but I don't have time. I'm Miss Stebbins, Dr. James Clayton's nurse. He asked me to see you. I see. He gave me these policy numbers. He said that your company wrote these policies and that he'd like to talk to one of you. Well, certainly, Miss Stebbins. He can come by any time. No, you don't understand. Dr. Clayton can't get away from the office. We're terribly rushed, and I really should be getting back myself. He's there all alone. Well, do you know what it's about, Miss Stebbins? I... no. The doctor's been acting strangely all day. He had me cancel all of his outside calls, and then he sent me here. He said to explain that it was very urgent. I'm... I'm very concerned for him. The tall, pale brunette girl in the crisply starched uniform and cape was certainly concerned about something. She bit her lip, forced out a wan, unprofessional smile, and started to cry. 
I pretended not to notice all this as we got on the elevator and went down into the street. However, ten minutes later, when we arrived at a suite of offices in the Pelroy building, I had to notice Dr. James Clayton. He met us at the door. Most of his costume was medically correct, white coat and carrying a stethoscope in one hand. But in the other, he brandished a thirty-two Ivor Johnson. The safety was off. Oh, oh, it's you. Yes, doctor. This is Mr. Dollar from the insurance office. Claims investigation? Yeah. Oh, fine. Uh, Jane, this would be a good time for you to get some lunch, don't you think? Well, doctor, I have all of those lab reports to... No, go ahead, Janie. Like a good girl, I want to speak with Mr. Dollar alone. Of course, doctor, if you say so. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Sit down. Very fine girl, Jane. She's worked for me a long time. Very fine. Do you always meet her at the door with firearms, doctor? Oh, oh, this. Well, all I can say is this is a ridiculous mess. My life's been threatened by a man who has definite homicidal tendencies. This, I, I, I don't even know how to load it. <laughs> I look foolish, I suppose. A threat on your life, doctor, comes under the heading of police business. I know that very well. And I would go directly to the police, only... Well, it is a delicate matter. You seem dubious already. No, I'm just curious. Go on, please. <clears throat> well, several months ago, I attended a patient named Florence Harmon. A thorough examination disclosed that her poor physical condition wasn't based on any organic disorder, but rather upon an emotional instability. Now, this I finally discovered was brought about by her marriage to an erratic, ruthless, ill-tempered man, Benjamin Harmon. I could only advise that she divorce him immediately. Well, that's somewhat extreme, Doctor. Are you always certain of advice like that? Well, in this case, there's no other answer. I approached Mr. Harmon on the subject last night at his home. I explained that Mrs. Harmon's health, her very life is in jeopardy. And more is involved here than keeping intact a union which has nothing but legality as a binding force. I see. But uh, Mr. Harmon doesn't care for semantics, huh? Uh, he attacked me. If it hadn't been for the assistance of Mrs. Harmon and a servant, he might have choked me to death. When I left, he threatened me. Then you should have called the police. Yes, yes, I thought of that. But look, if, if you approached Harmon in the right manner, Dollar, he might discard his ideas of violence. Well, you're the expert on homicidal tendencies, but the best thing I can see for you is to prefer assault charges and have him locked up. I know all that, but it's for Mrs. Harmon's sake. Please understand, she's been through a shattering ordeal... Look, Mr. Dollar, would you, would you go see him and talk to him? If you think he means it, really, then I'll call the police and prefer charges against him. The Harmon residence was in Westchester, a story and a half colonial with all the trimmings. There was a 51 Cadillac in the open garage and a 52 Ford station wagon in front of the house. Yes? This one didn't have a white coat or stethoscope, but he had a gun. What is it? Mr. Harmon? I'm Harmon. What do you want? Mr. Harmon, my name is Dollar. And Dollar, I... huh? Get out of my way! Oh! Here, Mr. Dollar. Drink this. Easy now. Oh. Take it, please. Oh, you had quite a blow. Try a little more. It should make you feel better. What was... Oh, you you can bring suit against him, against us. You can do anything you want to, Mr. Dollar. He's just ungovernable. He could easily have killed you. You, uh, Mrs. Harmon? Yes. Your husband think I was the ice man? Oh, I don't know what he thought. I, I just heard him yell at you, and when I came to the door, you were lying there, and he'd taken the station wagon and left. Why, last night, he even attacked my personal physician and threatened to kill him. I don't know what's gotten into him. You'd better sit down. Uh, it's getting better. Where'd he go? Heaven only knows. Mad. That's what he is, Mr. Dollar. Mad. He's liable to do anything. I'm... I'm scared. I'm scared stiff. I called Dr. Clayton, who promised to notify the police. It was about a quarter to six when I got back to his office. A broad-shouldered man in a tweed suit was in the reception room. Hi. You Dr. Clayton? No. Hey, uh, don't I know you? I was thinking the same about you. Uh, wait, Dollar? Yeah. Tom Bassman, Central Division. Oh, sure. How are you, Tom? Fine. Hey, you must be the one. 
Why? This Dr. Clayton called downtown about a threat, said his insurance company had advised him to report it. That's right. Well, where is he? Well, he should be here, Tom. What's his nurse say? I rang the buzzer. No one around at all. What's this all about? A man named Benjamin Harmon threatened the doctor's life. I met him myself. He's carrying a gun, and he looked dangerous to me. I just came from his house. He's still there? No. I better phone in and get a pickup out on him. When the doctor shows up, I'll get a complaint. And... Oh, hello. Hello. Why, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Miss Stevens. Dr. Clayton here? This is Sergeant Bassman. We want to see him ourselves. You're a police officer? That's right, miss. I heard him talking to you on the phone. Is anything the matter? Just want to see him. Well, goodness, he sent me out to pick up these things. He was here when I left. Oh. What? Perhaps he had an emergency. Well, is there any way we can find out? Well, if he had one, it would be right here on the pad, because I always have to know... Oh. That's funny. What? He's on an emergency call, 1213 Alessandro Street. Can I see that, please? Uh-huh. There's no name on this, Miss Stebbins. Do you recognize the address at all? No, I don't. The doctor just wouldn't take a random emergency call unless it were very unusual. This might be unusual. Dollar, how bad off did you think Harmon was? Mad. Had a gun. Crack me. Plenty rough. Mm -hmm. This is in the warehouse district. Think we better go down there? I think so. have to be that vacant lot over there. This one's 1240 and the rest belong to that warehouse. Yeah. Tom. Hmm? That car. MD on the license plate? Yeah. It might be Clayton's. Yeah. Uh, it's Clayton's car, all right. He must be around here somewhere looking for 1213. Yeah. Well, let's have a peek. I see. He's had it. Is it Clayton? Yeah, that's him. Some emergency this was. Yeah. Turn to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. On weekends, it seems everybody takes his car out on the highways. Some drivers are less experienced than others. They either speed or poke along with a whole stream of cars behind them. Both types are a menace to safety. Whatever you do, be moderate, be obedient to all traffic laws, be careful, use your head, and don't take chances. <laughs> Our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. An hour of questioning in the neighborhood turned up two people who recalled hearing the shots. And one man remembered seeing a man who answered Benjamin Harmon's description loitering in the vicinity of a nearby bar earlier in the evening. Obviously, Dr. Clayton had been lured to his death by the murderer who had telephoned him, pretended to need a physician, waited till the victim appeared, and then shot him down. Expense account item three, $11.65. A good dinner, three martinis, tip, and thinking at Toot Shores. After which, I strolled over to the Pelroy building. Expense account item four, five dollars even. Bribed watchman. Uh, I shouldn't be doing this, you know. Might lose my job over it. I appreciate it. But since you're from the insurance company, I guess you're all right. Just looking around is all. Too bad about the doctor. Nice fellow. Very. What do you think you'll find? A policeman been here till almost an hour ago, poking around. You know if they found anything? Sure. Well, what? Doctor's emergency kit. Heard him say he didn't take it uh, with him when he went out on that emergency. Yeah, don't be too long. The business.
business about the emergency kit started me thinking. I opened Clayton's file drawer and skimmed through every patient's name from Abbott to Zabrowski. He'd been a thorough man and from all evidences operated an efficient medical office. However, he had no medical history in his files on Florence Harmon. There was nothing to indicate that she had ever been a patient of his. On the other hand, there was an entry a year before which showed that he had examined, treated, and discharged Benjamin Harmon as a patient. I think these two developments supplied me with all of the curiosity I needed for a while. Nurse Jane Stebbins' home address was duly noted on Dr. Clayton's phone book. Oakdale House. Surprisingly enough, on Oak Street. Special rates for nurses, room 210. Oh, Mr. Dollar. How do you feel? Not too good, Mr. Dollar. I just got home a little while ago. They kept me down there pretty long. Do you want to come in? Thanks. I don't want to keep you up. It isn't much of a place, is it? I mean, I haven't straightened it up for days, it seems. I'm sorry. Things like this aren't easy. I know. Don't apologize to me. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Have they caught Mr. Harmon yet? No, not yet. Uh, Miss Stebbins, you worked for Dr. Clayton a long while, didn't you? Five years. Then you should be able to tell me who he was going to marry. Marry? Well, I didn't know. I have no idea. He'd already made arrangements for a honeymoon. Honeymoon? Look. Reservations on the Ile de France for next April. I found them in his desk drawer. Confirmed to Dr. and Mrs. James Clayton. Well? What difference does it make? I don't know. Seems strange that you've been with him for such a long time and didn't know about this. I... Or did you? All right. What about Mrs. Harmon? Well... Look, Miss Stebbins, things are wrong all the way down the line about your doctor's death, about what happened before it. It'll come out sooner or later. I suppose it will. It's awful to say this, Mr. Dollar, but Mrs. Harmon was the only one Dr. Clayton saw socially. And she, of course, is married. Of course. And the good doctor advised her to get a divorce. He meet her when Mr. Harmon was a patient of his? Yes, that's right. They became friendly. But Mrs. Harmon was never a patient. No, never. Just her husband. What can you tell me about Mr. Harmon? Well, really, all I know is he came in to see Dr. Clayton a few times. Over a year ago, I guess. Then after... After he saw what was happening between Mrs. Harmon and Dr. Clayton, he stopped coming in. I sent a copy of his medical history to another doctor. But Dr. Clayton had been seeing Mrs. Harmon all this time. It's awful to say this now, Mr. Dollar. Doctor's dead. I'm no moralist. We're all human. It's happened before. Married people have been attracted by others. I'm tired, Mr. Dollar. Sure. Do you have any idea why I was called in today? At first, I didn't. I... Well, of course, it happened. The police told me about Mr. Harmon's threats. But I don't understand what you're trying to do. The police want Mr. Harmon, and what does it all mean? It means the wrong man was killed. Mr. Dollar. I should have tumbled to it right away, but your husband fit the part too well. Now, look here. I've been through quite enough today with the police looking for Ben. I don't have... You and Clayton. I was going to be the star witness when the state tried him for shooting your husband. Whatever I said as a material witness would back up his self-defense plea and get him off on a justifiable homicide. Isn't that it? I tell you, I won't... And you and the doctor would sail to France and live happily ever after. What's the matter? Wouldn't your husband give you a divorce? You won't listen. Go ahead. If you say it's that way, Mr. Dollar, and you know everything, I know you know everything, then it must be that way. Yeah, only it got fouled up. Your husband did shoot your doctor boyfriend after all. Get out of here. Get out of my house. You can't prove anything. You're right, Mrs. Harmon. I can't prove anything. Not a thing. They catch your husband, they'll put him away for it. But you have something to live with for the rest of your life. Or maybe you didn't really love your doctor after all. Get out! Get out! Leave me alone! Leave me alone! Well, 
That's it, Sergeant. I want to know if people can really get by with this kind of thing in our courts of law. If and when you pick up Benjamin Harmon, will he have any kind of defense? Oh, we'll get him, Dollar. The others, I can't answer. What you just told me is really a thing. I don't see how any lawyer can do much for a guy who threatens another man's life and finally guns him down, do you? Supposing I could prove that Harmon was being set up as a patsy, that the doctor was really supposed to gun him down and plead self-defense. Up to the judge and the jury. When we get Harmon, he'll be arraigned and indicted on first-degree murder charges. Don't worry about that. And if it goes that far, it generally means he'll get the works. After all, we're pretty sure he shot and killed the doctor. Hang up, Dollar. Huh? You still there, Dollar? Hang up or I'll blow your head off. Benjamin Harmon wasn't kidding. He was blazing mad. He had a gun, and I knew he wasn't afraid to use it. I was across the street when you left my place a little while ago. Fixing up another deal, were you? I don't know what you're talking about, Harmon. I followed you here so we could have this talk. And we're going to have it, you and I. You ought to put that gun away and let him take you. They'll shoot you down if they see you. Nobody's going to shoot me down, not yet. Now, where's your office? Hartford, Connecticut. I mean here. Where do you practice here? Come on. I don't practice anything here. My office is in Hartford. This apartment belongs to a friend of mine. I'm standing in for him here while he's out of town. Where's his office? New York Mutual Liability. I mean his law office. I want to get down there and see how much... Hold on now. I'm not a lawyer. My friend's not a lawyer. We're insurance investigators. Where's the office? I tell you, we... Listen. Clayton called me this morning and said a lawyer named Dollar was on his way over to talk to me about divorcing Florence. If you hadn't started swinging that gun butt around, I'd have told you why I was there. I think I know why Clayton called you and told you that, but I don't... You and he were trying to pull something to take my wife away from me. I know that much. You're wrong, Harmon. I didn't know anything about that. Nobody takes my wife away from me. Now, that's the kind of temper that got you in all the trouble you're in. Look, you can shoot me here and I'll be number two. But they'll get you real easy here. You know I didn't kill Clayton? How do I know you didn't kill him? You threatened him. Half a dozen people heard you threaten him. I have an idea why you did it, and you might have been right, but murder for any reason... Shut up! You're in on it somewhere. You know who did kill him, and you're going to clear me or I'll rip it out of you, Dollar. I'll rip it out of you! Are you crazy? You... Oh. 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 All right. Here. Try this. Go on. I'm tired of fooling with you. Now get on your you. feet. Punch. Well, you got one point in your favor. This gun hasn't been fired. Do you have another one? No. No. Here, take another drink. Now, you have a chance to talk to me right now. I don't think the police will be interested in much you have to say. I wanted to kill Clayton, but I didn't. I didn't. Nobody will believe that. I know I've got a temper, and I've tried to control it, but I didn't kill him. I'm not impressed with that. I want facts. Where were you when Clayton was shot? How do I know? I didn't know what time he was shot. Say between five and six today. I was out getting mad. Fried. Where? Who saw you? No. After... After we met, I was so sore. I jumped in the car and went out and bought myself a jug. I know it sounds crazy, but I spent most of the time just sitting in the car down to the docks, just drinking and thinking and getting mad. I don't know what it was. I don't know when I walked over to the saloon, phoned Clayton. I told him I was on Alessandro Street and to come on down. I wanted to have a showdown. You mean you wanted him to come down so you could kill him? Maybe I did have it on my mind. I don't know. I waited an hour or so, but he never showed up. When I called back at his office, nobody answered. So I climbed back in my car, and that's where I heard about my being wanted for killing him. It was on the newscast. I didn't do it, Dollar. I swear I didn't. The others I knew about, and I didn't kill them. What others? Florence always had other friends. I guess I don't love her anymore, but I don't know. Maybe I hate her for all of it. When a man doesn't let part of his life walk away from him, I wouldn't give her a divorce. 
If I had let her get away with it, it would have been too much for me to hold. Even though... Yes. Even though you didn't love her and you knew she didn't love you? Yes. That sounds stupid. Maybe. I loved her once. She loved me the way two people only love at certain times. Hell, no sense yet. I'm not well, darling. Clayton gave me a year. Another doctor, 18 months. Finished anemia. But the two of them could have waited at least till I was dead, couldn't they? Couldn't they? No. <laughs> I found some sleeping pills in your medicine cabinet, and I fed him a couple with some hot cocoa. He dropped off to sleep in your bed while I made some phone calls, confirming what he just told me. Expense account item five, taxi fare. Four dollars and five cents back to Oak Street, to Oakdale House. Special rates for nurses. I thought you'd be back. I'm glad it's you. I think somehow you're the kind of man who understands things. I'll be a good listener. Go ahead. When I first started as his nurse, I fell in love with him. I guess it's an old story. Terribly old and corny. But then he met her. I heard him tell you all those lies today about treating Mrs. Harmon. I was out in the hall... Didn't have any idea exactly what he intended to do until I heard him call Mr. Harmon. Right after you left, he told him you were a lawyer. He knew Harmon was upset enough to attack me. Doctor was very good about knowing what people would do. I was here when Mr. Harmon called him tonight. Doctor took the call and wrote it down on the pad. I saw him put the gun inside his coat and I knew he was going down there to shoot Mr. Harmon. So I followed him. He was walking around in the dark looking for Mr. Harmon with a gun in his hand. I ran up to him and pleaded with him not to be crazy that she wasn't worth it. Then he said he was going to kill me, too. We struggled and the gun went off. I don't know how many times. Then I came back here and pretended I'd been down at the drugstore. I see. What's your first name? Jane. Jane... Dr. Clayton made all sorts of elaborate plans so he'd have a self-defense plea. But you don't have to go to all that trouble. You can prove self-defense. He had the gun. He was going to use it on you. I beg your pardon? I can help you, Jane. It'll go second degree or manslaughter, suspended. You didn't mean to shoot him, but he meant to shoot you. No. You're nice. But I can't get off. What? I guess they haven't found her yet. I killed Mrs. Harmon an hour ago. Expense account item six, same as one, transportation back to Hartford. I didn't spend any other money, Chet. I didn't meet your girl and I didn't see the musical. I didn't go any place. I just sat in your office and looked at the walls for the next three days. I'm leaving this where you'll see it when you come in tomorrow morning. Settle up and don't call me for a long time. A long, long time, if you call at all. Expense account total, $56.35. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and is written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. John Lund can currently be seen in the Universal International picture, Just Across the Street. Featured in tonight's cast were Victor Perrin, Virginia Gregg, Joseph Kearns, John McIntyre, and Jeanette Nolan. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. 
Every Sunday, CBS Radio's Bob Trout brings you a timely weekend roundup of world news. As a special eyewitness feature, an overseas CBS Radio News correspondent flies in to give you an up-to-the-minute account of developments on his beat. Don't miss Bob Trout's World News Roundup Sundays on the CBS Radio Network. John Lund as Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Shelley Thomas in Federal. You're up early today. I've already been at my desk for two hours. How'd you like to work on one for me? What's it about? In cold, hard claim cash, it comes to exactly $12,482.16. That's interesting. What does it mean? Somebody's been filching a lot of merchandise over in Toledo, and it's beginning to hurt. Could you get over there and have a look around? Sure. Well, it sounds like a police job to me. Well, I don't expect any miracles, Johnny. I just want a good factual report on the whole business for my clients. See you in an hour. John Lund in the transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Federal Insurance and Claims Adjusters, 2044 Appalachian Drive, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Costain matter. Expense account item one, $49.15. Plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to Toledo. En route, I read over the details concerning the case. 37 stolen merchandise claims have been filed and paid off in what looked like a first-class shoplifting epidemic in Toledo. I parked my two bags at the Commodore Perry Hotel and went over to the main police station. A Lieutenant Sturgis was in charge. Sit down, sit down. Thanks. Federal Insurance and Claims Justice, huh? That's right. You're here to find out what we've been doing about all this shoplifting, is that it? Well, we represent the insurance companies who've had to pay off on these theft claims. Yeah, sure, I see. Well, uh, where do you want to start? Well, let me see. How about this mommy dress shop, Lieutenant? Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, let's see. Uh, February 10th. Proprietor, Mrs. Bancroft, registered a complaint with us that a dress and a coat were missing from the storex. She's... Yeah. Well, we went over there and talked to her about it, made out the report as another shoplifting job, and put a description of the coat and the dress in the hot sheet. Mm-hmm. Dress wholesaled at $113. Coat had a fur trim. Went at $395. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Looked a little better than most shoplifting jobs to us. We had it in mind when we got another complaint three days later from a place over on Oak Avenue. That'd be, uh, Milady's Shoppy? Yeah. Uh, Negligee and a silk robe. Yeah, we covered that one, too. Both of them came to $286. Yeah, same thing as a mommy. Clerks hadn't seen anyone, didn't know anything. The week of the 15th, we had two more complaints. On the 23rd, three complaints. They've been coming in regular ever since. I think the last one was three days ago. Always the best stores, always expensive merchandise. We rounded up every known shoplifter in our files, and we've had our store personnel at all of our lineups. No one's been able to make an identification so far. First, we thought it was a plain expert shoplifting done by a well-organized gang. Looks that way. Not so much anymore. Do you notice on your list there that all of these items are for a woman? Yeah. Uh, dresses, coats, blouses, cosmetics, millinery, costume jewelry, and so on. Now, what we didn't pick up until about a month ago is that all of the articles of clothing that have been taken are for a woman who wears a size 10 dress. Hmm. That is a funny one. Yeah, and it rules out a gang right away. There's pattern to it, but... I'm going to have someone else tell you about that. Yes, Lieutenant? 
Let's see if Sergeant Bidler's in. Right. 99 times out of 100, a shoplifter will take anything he or she can get her hands on, regardless of cost, size, color, or anything else. So we don't think this is the work of an old-timer, either. You mean somebody's just gathering up a nice wardrobe at my insurance company's expense? Something like that. If any of these stolen articles have been sold or disposed of, we'd have a lead by now. The stuff has been on the hot sheet for months. We've covered pawn shops, second-hand store. Yes? Sergeant Bidor on two. Right. Hello, Sergeant. How's it going? Fine, thanks, Lieutenant. Now, there's a man in my office named Dollar. I'm sending him down to see you. Women in the department reacted a little differently than the men to all this. How's that, Sergeant? Well, when they went over the stolen property sheets, they were first impressed, of course, by the fact that all of the clothing was for someone who wore a size 10. The other thing, though, was the good taste. Well, a lot of thieves have good taste, I suppose. <laughs> this one seems to have not only good taste, but a pretty exclusive taste. You mean the expensive places that have been robbed? Well, that, but even more. You see here. Uh-huh. On March 4th. One green suede coat missing from Toll's apparel shop and here on the 13th. A brown organdy dress from the Commodore and here. Cocoa-colored sports coat. Yeah? Hats and gloves in green and brown, beige, sometimes yellow. No other colors. Well, what does it mean? Any woman who restricts herself to these particular colors in dressing, green, brown, beige, cocoa, yellow, must have a very definite coloring of her own. We think a redhead with green eyes. Well, you know best about that. But uh, why green eyes? Couldn't they be blue or brown? <laughs> yes, they could be. But there's been a particular emphasis on green in the coats and dresses that have been stolen. And besides that, there's the cosmetics. Did you cover Jaegers? Jaegers? Um, let me see. No. Well, Jaegers is a very plush cosmetic store here. Nothing but perfume and makeup. They reported... March 2nd, a whole box of green eyeshadow had been stolen from one of their counters. And green eyeshadow only goes with green eyes? Yes, whereas blue eyeshadow would fit a person with either blue or brown eyes. Now, at the same time the eyeshadow was taken, several tubes of lipstick and rouge were also stolen. Both of those items contained orange tinting. That gives us another reason for thinking the eyes are green. I'm convinced. <laughs> a redhead with green eyes. Oh, and it's a short hair, too. It is? <laughs> look at my hair. I am, Sergeant. With a short hairdo like mine, I'd look rather ridiculous in a big picture hat that requires a hair frame. But a small hat, one with a tight contour, would be all right. Hey, I'm coming around. The case millinery story. <laughs> yes. Four hats. Total value, $185? Yes, those hats that were taken from cases were small, especially designed for a woman with a short hairdo. We think that some of the costume jewelry that's been stolen ties in with the clothes, too. Uh-huh. Well, how does it stand right now? We've had our troubles on this one. It's impossible to tie up the manpower it would require to cover every dress and apparel shop in town, not to mention the department stores. Sure, sure. We're doing the next best thing. No store has been taken a second time, so we've spotted a dozen policewomen from my department and as many stores around town that still hasn't been hit. And they're posing as clerks. How long has this been going on? Since Monday. Maybe we'll get a lead this way. Yeah. Sergeant, this is just a wild one, but suppose a red-headed woman with green eyes isn't doing it after all. Suppose somebody's doing it for her. We've thought of that, and it looks like a possibility. None of the personnel we've questioned in any of these stores has been able to say definitely whether or not they saw anyone with red hair on the premises or around the shop to fit the time incidents of the particular robbery. I see. And there's another thing we're working on, too, beauty shops. Oh? She's a redhead, and she's got all of these expensive clothes. It's a good bet she keeps herself up. You know, has her hair and nails done regularly. Yeah. We've covered about 50 different beauty salons in town, the best ones told them the kind of woman we're looking for and given them an idea of what she'll be wearing. Well, if she's still in town, something should break pretty soon. I'd like to go over the original complaints, if it's possible. Main filings on the second floor. Ask for Sergeant Kelly and he'll give you what you want. I'll do that. Thanks a lot. After a full day and a half of studying the crime reports... 
I wholeheartedly agreed with Lieutenant Sturgis and Sergeant Beidler. Since none of the stolen articles had appeared in any of the usual places for disposal, I was convinced it was not the work of an organized gang or of a previous offender. All clothing that had been taken was the same size and a small variety of colors. And as Sergeant Beidler had pointed out, suited only to a certain type of woman with definite physical characteristics. Red hair, green eyes. Johnny Dollar. I think we've got something here. What? The lead on one of the coats. I met Lieutenant Sturgis in the police garage, and we drove over to Toll's apparel shop on West Oak Street. One of the clerks there had phoned in and reported she'd seen a woman wearing a green suede coat that had been stolen from the store a month before. The clerk's name was Alice Emerson. I'm sure it was the coat. Well, how can you be sure of that, Mrs. Emerson? Well, it was the only one like it in the entire store. Uh -huh. And as far as I know, in Toledo, it, it had a gathering at the back and gold buttons. I just knew that coat the minute I saw it on her. I just knew it. Oh, uh, this was about a half an hour ago, you say? Yes, I was on my lunch hour, and I was eating at the Westgate. The cafeteria? Yes. She was about three people ahead of me in the line. I didn't remember at first that the coat had been from us, but when I sat down to lunch, I recalled it. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. I really didn't know what to do exactly. Then I thought, well, I'd better make sure it is the coat, you know. I wouldn't want to make trouble for uh, what, anyone. What did you do? Well, she had a table over by the wall eating her lunch alone. So I finished my lunch and I walked over near her and I took a good look at the coat. <laughs> it was our coat, all right. The one that was taken from that rack over there. I was going right out on the street and call a policeman, but I guess she got a little suspicious of me looking at her the way I did and she got up and left. What did she look like, Mrs. Emerson? Oh, she was a nice-looking woman. About my size, 30 or so. Very nice. What color was her hair? Dark. Very dark. Dark? Black, you mean? Or dark brown. I don't know which. Did you happen to notice the color of her eyes? No, no, I didn't, but she wore glasses. Horn-rimmed. You're certain it's the same coat? Oh, I'm positive. Have you ever seen a woman before? No, never. At least I don't think I have. Nothing familiar about her at all? No. Did you happen to notice which direction she went in when she left the cafeteria? No, I, I don't know where she went. She just got into a taxi cab. I went with Lieutenant Sturgis to the offices of the taxi cab company that covered Metropolitan Toledo. There we began checking the way bills as they came in. Since less than an hour had elapsed from the time Mrs. Emerson called in, we didn't have to go through too many of them. At the intersection of Oak and Westgate, which was right in front of the cafeteria, cab number 418 had carried a fare to a hotel apartment house called the Colonial on the east side of town, Yondota Street. We spoke with the driver of the cab on the phone when he checked into the office. He remembered the fare. A woman in a green suede coat. Try that. Yeah. Hello, can I help you? Police. Oh? Now, sometime in the last hour, a cab brought a woman to this address. We'd like to talk to her. She's about 5'4", uh, about 30, dark hair, wearing a green suede coat. You know her? Well, now let's see. Wore horn rim glasses? Well, I've got 175 apartments here. Uh, wait, a, a green suede coat? Yeah. Well, Miss Jones. Jones, huh? Yes, Lillian Jones. She just checked in two days ago. Alone? Yes. What apartment is she in? The 1429. Shall I ring her? No, no, never mind. We'll just go on up. From the description we gave the desk clerk at the Colonial Apartments, he identified our suspect as Lillian Jones, apartment 1429. She'd come in approximately 20 minutes before we'd arrived. As far as the clerk knew, she was still in her apartment. We took the self-service elevator up to the 14th floor. Now, it'll be down this way. Hey, wait. 
Fourteen ten, then it goes to twenty one. Yeah. Oh, the corridor. Oh yeah. Lillian Jones? What do you want? Police. I'd like to talk to you. Oh, that's a mess. May we come in? We can talk here. It'll be easier inside. Here's all right for me. Let's go inside, Miss Jones. Okay. What's this all about? A woman who works at Cole's apparel shop saw you in the Westgate cafeteria at lunchtime today. She said you were wearing a coat that was stolen from them. She's a liar. I don't even know where Toll's apparel shop is. She was pretty certain about it. I've been here all day. I had my lunch here. Anybody with you? What do you mean? Did you eat alone? Sure, I ate alone. Miss Jones... We can get the woman from Toes to come over here and identify you. Say, listen. And we can get the cab driver who brought you here to identify you, too. It all be lying. I've been here all day. You prove it? Sure, I can prove it. Clerk downstairs said you just came in about 20 minutes ago. He's lying, too. It's a green suede coat. You have a green suede coat? No. Listen, you just get out of there. Where's the coat, Miss Jones? I don't know what coat you're talking about. A green suede coat. Now, what'd you do with it? I don't have a green suede coat. Do you have any objection to our looking around? You bet I have. All right, we'll get a search warrant. I'm afraid you'll have to come with us, Miss Jones. I'm not going anywhere with anybody. Get out of here. Get out of my apartment. I'll make plenty of trouble for the both of you. Come on, Miss Jones. Lillian Jones had a record of one previous arrest two years before. The charge, grand theft. She'd been released for lack of evidence. Her profession was listed as a domestic... The sales lady from Toll's apparel shop appeared and positively identified her as the woman she had spotted in the Westgate cafeteria wearing the stolen coat. The cab driver who'd driven her from the intersection of Westgate and Oak to the Colonial Apartments was called in. He also identified her. She still refused to admit anything, maintaining that she hadn't left her apartment all day. Lieutenant Sturgis took a detail of men to her place to search the premises. I stayed with Sergeant Beidler while she questioned Lillian Jones. Why won't you tell us what you did with the coat, Lillian? I don't know what coat you're talking about. Honest, I don't. Mrs. Emerson saw you wearing it at the cafeteria today. The cab driver saw you wearing it. The clerk at your apartment desk saw you wearing They're it. They're all liars. I don't own a green suede coat. You people have no right to hold me like this and ask me all these questions. I haven't done anything. What did you do with the coat? There isn't any coat. Where'd you hide it? I want a lawyer. Can I call a lawyer? Tell us about the coat. You stole it from Toll's apparel shop on March 4th. Isn't that right? I don't know anything about Toll's apparel shop. I told you. It's on Oak Street. I'll drop in and say hello sometime. What about the other thing? What other thing? You know what we're talking about, Lillian. Why don't you get it off your chest? We'll find out sooner or later. <gasps> Who are you working with? I want a lawyer. Where is it hidden? I want a lawyer. You can make a statement now and save yourself a lot of trouble. I want a lawyer. We continue to question Lillian Jones regarding the green swipe coat. She denied ever having such a coat in her possession. However, at 3.45 that afternoon, Lieutenant Sturgis returned with his detail of men. They had found the coat, stuffed into a clothes hamper. I took it over to the shop, and the people there positively identified it as the one stolen on March 4th. Yeah? Yeah, it had their label and one of their stock tags in the pocket. Well, that should do it. Well, I don't know what we've uncovered here, though. There wasn't anything else in the apartment that fit any of the other thefts. Yeah? Well, you can hold her on this. Oh, sure. I'll have her booked in right away. Lillian Jones was charged with grand theft. Before she was taken to the main jail, she admitted that she had stolen the coat. But not from the apparel shop. From the home of a family by the name of Costain. She said she'd been employed there for two weeks as a domestic servant. Mr. Costain was a civil engineer with offices in downtown Toledo. 
They informed us that he'd already left for his home. So we drove out there to interview him. It was a large, 12-room place on the edge of town. A servant took us into the living room. A few moments later, a tall, gray-haired man in his early 50s made an appearance. I'm Mr. Costain. I'm Lieutenant Sturgis, Mr. Costain. This is Mr. Dollar. How do you do? Police? That's right. They hate to bother you around dinner time like this. Quite all right. Sit down, please. Thanks. Uh, We're holding a woman downtown named Lillian Jones, Mr. Costain. I understand you employed her at one time. Lillian Jones? Oh, the maid, yes. Is she in trouble? We're just checking her story. I see. She was in possession of a green suede coat at the time we took her in, Mr. Costain. Mm-hmm. She insists that she took the coat from your home. Why would she say a thing like that? Well, we don't know. We thought maybe you could clear that up. <laughs> I have no idea what she's talking about. I fired her last Tuesday, I believe it was. That was the last I saw of the woman. Was she very angry when you fired her? Not particularly. It's just that she didn't work out here very well. I gave her two weeks' pay, told her to go. It's a green suede coat with gold buttons down the front. Well, I don't know where she got it, I'm sure, but I know she didn't get it here. Funny she'd tell us she stole it from here? Yes, it is, but I don't know why. Is uh, Mrs. Costain at home? Mrs. Costain passed away last February. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have a daughter? No. Well, we have to check into all these things, you know. Oh, I understand. I wish I could help you. Well, you can if you will, Mr. Costain. How's that? Would you mind dropping into my office tomorrow and taking a look at the coat? I don't know what good that would do, but I'll be glad to do it. You just might recognize it. Perhaps it belonged to Mrs. Costain. Possibly. Although I don't remember it. Room 212 in the main building. All right, Lieutenant. I'll be there in the morning. Bye. Sorry to have bothered you, but not at all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Did you see it? The color print on the piano? Yeah. A red-headed woman with green eyes. A check in the neighborhood revealed that the Costains had been living in Toledo less than a year. Before that, they'd lived in Detroit. Financially, they were in the upper income bracket. The house was completely paid for. There were two expensive late model cars in the garage. The Office of Vital Statistics informed us that Mrs. Costain had died on February 6th of a heart condition. It also noted that her hair had been red, her eyes green. Lieutenant Sturgis, robbery. Oh, yes, of course. I see. What, are you going to be home? Fine. I'm with Costain. Yeah? Yeah, he just changed his story. He said he did know that Lillian Jones stole that coat when she left the house. You give any reason for not admitting it when we were there? No, just wants to see us. I'm afraid I've caused you some trouble on this. Oh, we don't quite understand why you didn't tell us about it last night. It's rather simple, probably rather silly. I have a devil of a time keeping servants here for some reason. If a notice got in the paper I'd accused one of them of theft, well, I'd have a difficult time getting another one there that way. That coat's worth over $600, Mr. Costain. Yes, I know. It belonged to my wife. And you let it go like that? Oh, I'm insured for personal loss. Did you report this to your insurance broker? Oh, yes. Did you file a claim? Yes. What's your broker's name? Mr. Levant. He has offices in the Metropolitan Building. When did you report the loss? On Wednesday. You mind if I call him and check this? I don't see why that's necessary. I've just told you what I did about the matter. Oh, we're still puzzled, Mr. Costain. That coat was reported stolen from Toll's apparel shop last March 4th. Hmm. That's absurd, of course. Mrs. Costain bought that coat for herself a week or so before her illness. Did she handle it or did you? What do you mean? Well, did she pay for it, or, or were you billed? I... I suppose I was billed. I don't recall. Are you insinuating that Mrs. Costain might have stolen that coat? No, Mr. Costain. Your wife was already dead when that coat was stolen. Oh, no. You're wrong. What do you mean? Edna's not dead. She'll come back. And when she does... When she does, I'll have all these things for her. The things I denied her before. 
denied her. Yes. I always told Edna she was too extravagant, that she didn't need all those expensive things. Well, you, you could have bought them. Why did you steal them? I always denied her the things she loved. When Edna went away, I don't know what came over me. I mean, the loneliness seemed too much somehow. And I'd go out during the day from my office and wander through the stores, stores that she used to love very much. And whenever I had the opportunity, I stole the thing she always wanted. What did you do with them? They're in Edna's bedroom, hanging in her wardrobe. Would you like to see them? Expense account item two, $75.25, board and room while in Toledo. Item three, $62, miscellaneous. Item four, $41.10, plane fare back to Hartford. Expense account total, $227.50. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Milton Charles. Featured in tonight's cast were Hal March, Hi Everback, Edgar Barrier, Virginia Gregg, Mary Lansing, and Peggy Weber. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> This is Charles Lyon, inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. It's time now for John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Dan Mates. You left word for me to call? Oh, Lieutenant, I've been trying to see you on this La Tourette thing. What's your connection, Dollar? I'm investigating for the National Underwriters. Oh. Did you know Thompson? Yeah. Too bad. I'll uh, be tied up till after lunch. Want to get together then? Anything I can do in the meantime? No, thanks. But enjoy the weather, Dollar. I don't think you'll enjoy the case. I'll see you in my office about two. Right, Lieutenant. John Lund in the transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, National Underwriters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the La Tourette matter. Expense account item one, $97.50. Airfare and incidentals between Hartford and Denver. at 6.30 in the morning with a cold, sun-filled dawn. I reacquainted myself with the Mile High City at the airport restaurant where I drank coffee and waited for my luggage. I'd been there once before on a case in 1947, but the Denver I saw this time was a great deal different. Bigger, filled out, bustling. Towns like people change. 
I arranged to rent a car from the Avis people and drove on into the city itself. There I checked in at the Cosmopolitan, showered and shaved, and waited until 9 o'clock before I rang Bessie Thompson's room. Who? Johnny Dollar, Bessie. Oh, you're here? Yeah, as a matter of fact, in the same hotel. Same case Tommy was working on? Yeah. Be careful, Johnny. Everybody seems to die who has anything to do with it. Why don't I buy you some ham and eggs? Why not? Expense account item two. Four dollars and... No. No, I guess not. This one was on me. Buying breakfast for the widow of the man who died on the case I was taking over. It was a difficult meal. I buried him here. Yeah? I would have taken his body back to Hartford with the expenses and all. Besides, it doesn't really make any difference where you're buried. The ground was frozen here, too. I hear they have to use jackhammers. What happens now, Bessie? I haven't anything to stay around here for. I guess I'll go home. Try and get a plane out sometime today. Maybe that'll be better. I'm 32 now. I'm still attractive. I suppose some man will come along. Even men. Bessie, what is this? You tell me what it is. The coroner said that Tommy might have been drunk. That he wanted out on the highway and that the driver of the car that hit him could have done it and not even known it. I know Tommy drank, but not like that. Or did he? What do you mean? You were with him for three weeks in Omaha last year. When he was away from home, from me, Johnny, was he... I mean, did he drink a lot and get around? I never saw him do anything like that, Bessie. Honest? Honest. Don't lie to me now. He was in love with you, Bessie, and he didn't care who knew it. Don't torment yourself with thoughts like that. We're awful that way, aren't we? I mean, women. I think you're wonderful that way, too. Thanks. Tommy was murdered, Johnny. It couldn't have been a hit-and-run accident. Bessie, I... And they aren't doing anything about it. They haven't found out a thing. Oh, easy, honey. They're working on it. You know that. It's all tied in with that Machuette man. Tommy found out something and he was killed for finding it out. Bessie, I'll have to tell you right now. What reports Tommy sent in on Machuette don't make him responsible in any way. Then why are you here? Just to wrap up the details. I see. There'd have to be something more than what we have now. Then there is something more. Tommy phoned long distance the night before he was killed. He said he thought he'd be coming home in a couple of days. Did he say anything about the case? No, but he was coming home. That meant he had it about finished. He sent in a report the day before he was killed. There was nothing. But the police didn't find any report for that day in his room. How did he get out to that place on the Golden Road? Who was he with? Johnny, he was killed. He had something on someone in this case and he was killed. If he was, we'll find it out. All right. Where is he buried? Crown Hill Cemetery. I'll send some flowers out there. Get the man who ran him down. He'd like that a whole lot better. Yeah, I guess he would. I suppose I was trying to tell her in the gentlest way I knew that men do go out to taverns and drink. But occasionally they do drink too much, and that it was entirely possible that Tommy Thompson had been killed as reported, and not for any information or investigating connected with Frank Lotterette. When I met and talked with Lieutenant Mapes at 2 o'clock, he confirmed this. Here's the report from our arson man. Uh-huh. And this is from Homicide. Uh-huh. You can take those copies with you if you like. I had them made up for you. Thank you very much, Lieutenant. The fire was reported by a passerby about 2 o'clock last Wednesday morning. By the time the trucks got there, the whole bookstore was in flames. When they broke in, they found Mrs. Lotterette's body. She'd suffocated in the smoke. Her husband said she'd been there working on the books. Mm -hmm. There was no evidence that her death was anything but accidental. And in the opinion of our arson man, the fire was caused by her cigarette. She fell asleep working in the office and the place caught fire. But uh, your man Thompson probably sent you all this, didn't he? Yeah, the fire policy had to be investigated. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as Thompson's death goes, we're looking for a hit-and-run artist. The people who operate the tavern out there said he absolutely was not in there that night. Mm Mm-hmm. At any rate, we'll have to go on that assumption because we haven't been able to dig up anyone who can say he was there that night. 
The tavern people could be lying. Thompson could have gone in there, gotten himself loaded, and walked out in front of a car. They'd be in license trouble if that happened. Yeah, sure. On the other hand, we'll just have to assume Thompson wasn't in that tavern at all. Then what was he doing out on the Golden Road? I don't know. You know how he got there? I haven't found that out either. Still checking the cab company. He might have been with someone? Well, he might have. I don't know that either, Dollar. I suppose you've wondered if it could be connected with La Tourette. Oh, yes. I've, I've wondered. When a man in the same business dies like that, you're bound to wonder. But wondering about things is one of our hazards, Dollar. Well, you have it all right there. Since La Tourette stands to collect about $80,000 fire damages and 17000 on his wife's death, he's been gone into twice now. Your man Thompson did a lot of it, and we did a lot of it. Yeah. Now, the night of the fire, La Tourette was bowling over to a place on uh, Glen Arm. Seventeen witnesses saw him there. He's in good financial shape, doesn't know anybody a dime. The neighbors tell us he's always had a nice home life. He has a boy who plays football in one of our high schools. So, why look at La Tourette anymore? Yeah, but... But your man Thompson was killed looking into it. Is that it? That's it, Lieutenant. Thompson's wife's in town. She buried him yesterday, and she's pretty broken up. Sure she is. I talked to her at the funeral. Her husband died hard and cold out on a lonely road, and they, we say he was drunk and got in front of a car. But in spite of the questions we were just tossing around about how he got out there on the Golden Road and what he was doing there, it still looks like a hit and run on a drunk. And that had seemed to have about ended? No, no, I should say not. We want to find the bird who ran Thompson down. And if there isn't enough in those reports to satisfy you that the fire was an accident, that Mrs. La Tourette's death was an accident, and that Thompson's death was what we say it is, then just sound your horn. I'm around all day, and I'm open to any kind of suggestion. Okay? That sounds fair enough, Lieutenant. I might give you a ring. Right. I spent the rest of the day in my hotel room going over the bulky envelope of police reports. I compared them with information Thompson had forwarded to the office before he'd been killed. No matter how you looked at it, the whole business was a story of tragedy, of violence and death. Mapes was right. I wasn't enjoying the case, and I was anxious to close it. It was dark by the time I got out to Park Hill and found the La Tourette home. Through the drawn shades of the living room, I saw the figure of a man. He didn't move when I used the doorbell. Hey. Hello in there. Hello? Who is it? My name's Dollar, Mr. La Tourette. He won't be back until tomorrow. I wonder if I could leave some papers for him to sign. Leave him at the door. I'll get them later. There was something about the voice, the strain and shakiness in it that worried me. I didn't leave the papers outside the door. I merely tried the knob. All right. Give me if you have to. Hey, what is this? Why the shotgun? Get in. You get inside and close the door. I'll kill you. Okay. Move right over there, mister. Right over there. All right, you can stop. Where's Mr. Lazarette? Oh. You'll get the same thing if you do anything funny at all. Why? You'll be asking that from now to the day I die. Now get your hands up. Up. They're up, Sonny. Look, he might still be alive. You could call a doctor He's and... He's dead. I made sure. I don't know who you are or why you did this, but you'll never get away with it. They'll catch you. Who cares? You better give me that shotgun. Don't try to get close to me now. Who are you? I'm an insurance investigator. My name is Dollar. Mr. Dollar, I don't quite know what to do about you. Give me the gun. Oh, no. Oh, no. This little baby's got more work to do tonight. Yes, sir, just a little more work. Why did you kill him? He killed a man and a woman. I guess that gives me a right to turn around and kill him. What man? What woman? Somebody you probably know. A man named Thompson. He ran over him the other night. Oh? Sure. He ran him down with a car because Mr. Thompson found out about a woman. 
His lady love. His lady love. Oh, he had one, a real pretty lady. Who <laughs> helped him burn my mother to death in a fire so they could be together. I'll see that they get together real soon. Your mother? Your name is Lotteret? <laughs> That's it. Bruce Lotteret. That's my old man lying there. <laughs> We'll return to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Bruce Lotterette was young and he was obviously out of his head with fear. But in spite of it, he held on to the shotgun. Turn around. Look, Bruce, this won't do you any good. You can't get away with a thing like this. Turn around now, turn around, go on! If you're going to shoot me the way you did him, you're going to have to work on it a little harder. I won't turn around and die that way. I don't want to shoot you! You haven't done anything to me now! I told you to turn around and do it! He didn't do anything to you either, but you shot him. He killed my mother! He couldn't have killed her. The police checked him. The police don't know about Evelyn. Nobody knows about Evelyn but me. She burned the store down and he might as well have done it. Evelyn? Evelyn who? I'm going to kill her too. And I'll shoot you if you don't stop right where you are. I don't want to, but I will. That's better. Now stay there. Bruce. Bruce! 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 Operator. Give me the police. Hurry. I gave a license number and the description of the car over the phone along with the other information on Bruce Latourette. Several prowl cars arrived, but there was nothing that could be done for Frank Latourette. I waited for Lieutenant Mapes. We sure pitched this one wrong. Oh. Yeah, everybody did. Huh? 8.15. I thought they'd pick up that kid by now. APB's been out since you phoned. Shouldn't be too hard to spot. He wants to kill somebody named Evelyn. And he looked pretty determined. I never saw such a thing in my life. You suppose he's dreamed all this? I don't know him well enough. Lotred might have had a woman who helped him burn down the store and kill his wife. He might have had to kill Thompson when Thompson found out about it. Uh, that's the part that makes it no dream. Dollar, if we don't have that kid in our hands pretty soon, we'll be standing in another room someplace looking at another corpse tonight. Yeah, I know. How could we miss it? Who's Evelyn? Why didn't any of these people in the neighborhood know anything about it when we questioned around? I don't know. Let's see. Farrell and Hayes, Thorg, Weiner. Come on, Looney. Let's talk to these neighbors again. Okay. Boy, what I'd give for one gossipy old lady who knew everybody's business. You mean who knew somebody named Evelyn? Yeah, I guess that's what I mean. <laughs> An hour of questioning in the neighborhood revealed no one who had any knowledge of Frank Lotterette's association with a woman whose first name was Evelyn. Bruce Lotterette seemed to have completely disappeared somewhere within the city. However, at 10.15, a young girl walked into police headquarters and asked to see Lieutenant Mapes. I was in the office when she was ushered in. What's your name, miss? Uh, Dari P. Kelly. This is Mr. Dollar. I'm Lieutenant Mapes. How do you do? At the desk, they said you had some information about Bruce Lotterette. Is that right? What will you do to him? Try and stop him from killing another person. He's already killed his father. Yes, I know. I heard he got a newscast at 9 o'clock. Want to sit down? Thank you. You know Bruce? Yes, we we go to school together. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I, I don't know exactly how to tell you this. It, it isn't easy, I mean. I've heard Bruce talk about it ever since his mother was killed in a fire last week. I 
Well, maybe I shouldn't have come down here at all. Well, if it'll help us stop him from killing someone else, you did the right thing. Do you know where Bruce is, Dorothy? No, honest, I don't know that. I'd tell you if I knew. What has Bruce been talking about, Dorothy? Well, he he was pretty upset about his mother's death and took it pretty hard. Yeah, sure. He, he was out of school all last week, and then when he came back this week, we had lunch together one day. He hardly ate anything, just sort of sat there staring out, you know? Mm-hmm. Did he say anything? Not at first. He used to talk to me all the time. I, I mean, we're pretty good friends. Oh, gosh, if my mother knew I was mixed uh, up in we'll, this... And... We'll talk to your mother, Dorothy. Go on. Well, Bruce was sitting there, and all of a sudden he said, they killed her. I thought he was crazy. I said, who killed her? And he said that his father and somebody named Evelyn killed her. He said that Evelyn set fire to the store and that his mother couldn't get out. He said his father had been seeing Evelyn for a long time. Mm-hmm. And he also said something about telling all this to a man named Thompson and that Thompson was killed too. Did he tell you who Evelyn was? No, sir. Did he say where she lived? No. Did he mention her last name? Gosh, I don't remember. I, I think he just called her Evelyn. Nothing else about her? No, sir. Oh, wait. What? I, she teaches skiing. What? Well, he, he said he met her once with his father when he was skiing. She's a ski instructor somewhere. Does that help you any? It might. It did help. Three quarters of an hour later, the owner of a sporting goods store remembered a woman named Evelyn Warder, who had skiing classes on weekends. He located an address for her in North Denver, and I drove out there with Lieutenant Mates. She was a tall, plain-looking woman in her early 30s. What is it? Miss Evelyn Warder? Yes. Police. I'd like to talk to you for a minute. What about? Uh, may we come in? Yes. Do you know a man named Frank Lotterette? Uh, no, why? His son shot him to death tonight. Do you know him? Miss Warder? No. Why are you here telling me this? Don't you know? No, I don't know. I have no idea. I was there right after Mr. Lotterette was killed. His son said he was going to kill a woman named Evelyn. He's still loose. What are you doing, talking to everyone named Evelyn? You going down? If you didn't know Lotterette, you don't have anything to worry about. If you're lying to us, you're liable to get killed. He came by because we thought you might be the one he's after. We don't have a lot of time. I don't know anyone named Lotterette. And you're okay. Sorry to have bothered you. That's all right. Good night. Good night. Good night. The pouting mouth, the plain face, the tall, ungainly person of Evelyn Water didn't fit the role of a homebreaker or murderess. But we sat in the car across the street from our house. Mapes put in a call for two more cars to come out. It really didn't get sunny all day today. And this is a pretty lousy night. Nothing to say? Nope. Sure you don't. You could be in a nice warm hotel room getting your head full of sleep right now. I can do that any time. Right now I want to be around when somebody talks about a fire my company has an $80,000 claim on. And the murder? And Tommy's murder. Oh, the whole thing... Tommy's wife this morning wondering if he played around with other women. A kid standing there shaking and crying and killing and out to do more killing. I'd like to sleep. I don't think I could. Wonder where that kid went to. Should have had him by now. If he stuck with the car at all. How could he walk around town carrying a shotgun without being a little conspicuous? Yeah. This could be the wrong, Evelyn. It's the only one we've got a line on. Yeah. Dollar, this stinks. What? That's the right Evelyn in there, and if that kid isn't picked up, he'll be around to kill her tonight. Yeah. So let's go in and give her the business. She said... Hey, across the street. What? That's the car. The kids? Yeah. Let's go. How'd he get here without... Over there. Yeah. Come on. Bruce! Not direct. This place is covered. You'll never get away alive. Yeah. You okay? Shoot in the dark. That isn't going to do you any good, Bruce. Let me try. Sure. Bruce, this is Johnny Dollar. Remember? Hey, you police breakfast. Keep down or I'll kill somebody. I don't want to kill anybody, but her. I will if you try to stop me. 
And they don't want to kill you, Bruce. Put down the gun. I'm going to get her! The law will take care of her if what you say is true. I want to take care of her! Evelyn! Evelyn! This is Bruce on arrest! You killed my mother! We're going to have to do it, Johnny. Wait. Bruce! She isn't there! Get away from here! Get away from here! Get away from here! Upstairs window. Yeah. She wasn't here, huh? Making himself a perfect target. One more chance, Roderick. Throw the gun down. Okay, boys. Well, that did it. Yeah. I'll get an ambush. Why is they let me get her? Take it easy. They'll get her. They did get her. She was taken down and charged with suspicion of murder and arson. Bruce LaTourette was removed to the emergency hospital and died there three hours later. I was in his office when Lieutenant Mapes had a stenographer take a confession from Evelyn Water. All right, Miss Warder. I met Frank three years ago skiing. He asked me to have dinner with him one night in town. Later, he'd see me every now and then. It was his idea. Killing his wife? That? No, that was mine. You figured out how to do it? Yes, why? You mind telling us about it? I knew she worked on the books in the store at night. I had a key to the store. I just went in there and saw she was sleeping and started to fire. How? Waste basket. I knew the spoke and that little office would do the rest. Had you ever met her before? Oh, no. You never talked to her at all? No. Did he? I mean, about a divorce? He said he did, but I know he didn't. He didn't want a divorce here for me. So you killed her? I guess I did. The insurance man, Thompson? Yes. I guess the boy told him about us. He followed us out to the place on the Golden Road. I told Frank we'd have to get rid of him. And we did. Who was driving, Evelyn? I was. Your car? Yes. You killed them both, then? Mrs. LaTourette and Thompson? You don't think Frank could have the nerve to do anything like that, do you? I don't know why I went for him. I really didn't, I guess. Here's money. But no nerve. Okay, Evelyn. Anything else? What happens to me? That's up to the court, Evelyn. Expense account item three, twelve dollars, hotel and board. Item four, twelve dollars and fifty cents, car rental. Item five, same as item one, plane fare back home. Expense account total, two hundred and nineteen dollars and fifty cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. John Lund can currently be seen in the Universal International picture just across the street. Featured in tonight's cast were John McIntyre, Jeanette Nolan, Sammy Hill, Virginia Gregg, and Eddie Firestone. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> This is Dan Coverly inviting you to join us next week at this time when John Lund returns as yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Sunday nights at the Star's Address, distinguished drama is always your fare when Lionel Barrymore narrates your Sunday night playhouse. Each week, this fine program turns the spotlight on a little-known or unsung hero of American history, bringing you the highlights of his career in brilliant original dramatizations. Don't forget, this Sunday, on most of these same stations, Sunday Night Playhouse, starring Lionel Barrymore. now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS Radio Network. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Roger Stern, Dollar. Oh, hello, Mr. Stern. What can I do for you? We insure Mr. James Forbes. He was killed last night. It looks like an accident, but there's always the chance it might not be. Can you take the job? Sure. How about the details? Well, come on down to the office as soon as you can, and I'll give you what we've got. I'll catch the first train up. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund and another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will too. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Intercontinental Indemnity and Bonding Corporation, New York City. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the James Forbes matter. Expense account item one, $13.95, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. After receiving from you the details regarding the death of James Forbes, I registered at the Madison Hotel and went directly to the 5th Precinct Police Station and interviewed Lieutenant Arthur Parkhill, who was handling the case. Well, there really isn't much more to tell, Mr. Dollar, other than what you know. You're convinced it was an accident? I'm convinced he fell over the edge of a 110-foot cliff, but it looks like an accident. Certainly doesn't mean the case is closed, but so far there's no motive for murder. There's a wife. Yeah. Mr. Forbes had quite a bit of money. That's an understatement. Mr. Forbes was loaded. And Mrs. Forbes gets everything, including a half-million-dollar insurance policy. Look, that's the first thing we considered, but just because her husband's got money and a great big fat insurance policy... Now, wait a minute. I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job. And we've checked the wife. Checked her good. The way it looks, she liked being married. She was in love with her husband. When he went over the cliff, she was in the house. Four servants can swear to it. He just fell over the cliff. According to everything we can find out, he took long walks every night along the cliffs by the ocean. Last night, it was unusually foggy. Certainly possible he got too close to the edge, missed his footing, and did a high dive. How about suicide? Uh-uh. At least there's no reason we can come up with. 
Good health, business doing better than it ever has. Textiles, isn't it? Yeah, biggest in the country. There's absolutely nothing that indicates suicide, especially no suicide note, and there usually is. Uh-huh. The Forbes estate is out on the island, isn't it? Yeah. Going to take a run-up? Yeah, I thought I might. Well, thanks for your help. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you, Mr. Dollar. Let me know if you come across anything. Expense account item two, 75 cents. Cab fare to a garage where I rented a car and drove out to the island. The Forbes mansion stood in the middle of a lot of acreage along the shore at the northeastern tip. Yes? I'd like to see Mrs. Forbes, please. I'm afraid Mrs. Forbes is seeing no one. Tell her Mr. Dollar is here. I believe Mr. Stern from my company called Mrs. Forbes and told her I was coming out. Uh, Mr. Dollar? That's right. If you'll wait a moment. Sure. Take your time. Mrs. Forbes will see you, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Mrs. Forbes was expecting you, but neglected to tell me. Mr. Dollar, ma'am. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I'm Mrs. Forbes. How do you do? Won't you sit down? Thank you. Mr. Stern called, said you were coming out. He seemed to think it was necessary. Yes, routine. Unfortunately, in a matter like this... I understand. Better to get it over with. I suppose so. Just a few questions. What time did Mr. Forbes leave the house last night? Right after dinner, around nine. I understand he was in the habit of taking walks. Yes. Last night was the same as any other night. Yes. He seemed uh, all right? He was fine. Wonderful spirits. Who found him? The police. Did you call them? Yes, after he'd been gone longer than usual, I began to worry. By 12 o'clock, I sent William, my butler, out in the car to look for him. When William returned, I had him call the police. They didn't find him until morning. You're convinced it was an accident? My husband didn't commit suicide, Mr. Dollar. Did he have any enemies? No. No one killed him, Mr. Dollar. Now, if you don't mind, I really don't feel too well. Of course. There's just one more thing. Yes? I'd like to take a look at the place, the, the spot. I'll have William show you. Thanks. I'm sorry I can't be of more help, Mr. Dollar, but there's really nothing to help you with. My husband was killed in an accident. He wasn't murdered, and he didn't commit suicide. My husband was a fine and wonderful man. I loved him very much. Of course. I'll call William and have him show you the way down to the cliffs. It's been nice meeting you. This is a terrible thing, William. Yes, sir. How long have you been with the Forbes? Uh, ten years, sir. Theirs was a good marriage. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, about another hundred yards, sir. Uh, you can stop here. Right over here, sir. They found Mr. Forbes right down there, sir. Hmm. Long drop. Uh, yes, sir. Well, I guess under the right circumstances, it'd be pretty easy to miss your footing along here. It was very foggy last night. Yeah. Well, come on. I'll drive you back. Uh, uh, Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Uh, Mr. Dollar, I don't know quite how to say this. I've nothing ready to go on except, well, uh, I'm not convinced that Mr. Forbes' death was an accident. Why aren't you? It's hard to say. Until this morning, until some time after they found him, I didn't think it could be anything else. <clears throat> when the police questioned me, I didn't even consider another possibility. But Mr. Forbes has been taking walks at night, every night ever since I came to work. He's walked in all kinds of weather. He knew those cliffs from one end of, to the other. Well, people take showers in the same shower year after year, and still a certain percentage of them slip and break their necks. It's not just the walks and the fact that Mr. Forbes was so familiar with these cliffs. It's a lot of little things that have happened over the past two or three months. Nothing really definite. Uh, uh, telephone calls. What kind of telephone calls? Several times Mrs. Forbes has made calls. Several times I happened to overhear part of the conversations. They were... 
affectionate. Affectionate? Yes, I, I thought she was talking to Mr. Forbes, but several times I discovered through dinner conversations between Mr. and Mrs. Forbes that she hadn't spoken to him during the day that he'd been out of the city. Well, it, it's really awfully hard to explain. Just how affectionate were these calls? Quite affectionate. You think Mrs. Forbes has been playing around? I don't know, sir. But in the last few months, when Mr. Forbes left, she'd informed me she was going to town to visit with friends. And she'd very seldom return until the day before Mr. Forbes was supposed to be back from his trip. Why, on one of these occasions, Mrs. Weatherwax, the woman Mrs. Forbes was supposed to be visiting, came to the house calling on Mrs. Forbes. Well, from her conversation, I gathered she hadn't seen Mrs. Forbes for some time. Did you say anything about her? <laughs> to whom? To Mr. Forbes? Certainly not. I didn't think that much about it at the time. Hmm. Anything else? Uh, no, sir. But I suddenly felt that I must tell someone. Uh, uh, sir, if Mrs. Forbes should find out, she'd surely dismiss me, and I couldn't blame her. I won't say anything. Uh, thank you, sir. Well, come on. We'd better start back. I do hope I haven't started something I'll be sorry for. Do me a favor. Well, certainly. If Mrs. Forbes gets any more of those phone calls, see if you can find out who's on the other end of the line. I'll try. You can reach me at the Madison Hotel. Yes, sir. I drove William back to the house, then headed for the city. It was close to five o'clock when I got back to my hotel and called Lieutenant Parkhill. I told him about my conversation with the butler, and he was interested. He agreed to do some more checking on Mrs. Forbes' friends, especially the men. Expense account item three, seven dollars and fifty cents, dinner. After which I took a short walk, then returned to my hotel to get a good night's sleep. I was just turning off the light when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. This is William, Mr. Dollar, the Forbes butler. Oh, yes, William. Uh, Mrs. Forbes received a phone call about half an hour ago. You find out who he is? Uh, no, sir. Well, that's not going to help much. Uh, I thought you could discover his identity. How could I do that? Uh, Mrs. Forbes just left the house. I overheard her agree to meet the party in the city. Where in the city? Well, I don't know, but I thought you could intercept Mrs. Forbes as she comes off the George Washington Bridge. William. You have the soul of a Sherlock. Yes, sir. Uh, Mrs. Forbes is driving the gray Cadillac sedan. License number 6A31593. Friends... No matter what kind of work you do, it's a real help to chew delicious Wrigley Spearmint gum right while you're working. When you're warm or tired, for instance, the lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor is really refreshing. It helps keep your mouth and throat feeling cool and moist. Chewing on that smooth, good-tasting piece of Wrigley Spearmint makes the time pass more pleasantly, too. It seems to make your work go smoother and easier. Keep a package or two of Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum handy all the time. Enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint while you're working and at other times. That's Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. It took me five minutes to get back into my clothes and make it down to my car. Twenty minutes after that, I was parking at the city side entrance of the Washington Bridge, waiting for Mrs. Forbes to show up in her gray Cadillac. I waited about a half hour. She came off the bridge doing a little better than the speed limit and turned south. I started tailing her. I stayed about a block behind, and Mrs. Forbes led me across town. Suddenly, at the corner of 41st and 5th, she pulled up to the curb and a man stepped up to the car, quickly opened the door and climbed in. They drove away and I continued to follow. 
I followed for about another hour while Mrs. Forbes just drove around, obviously headed for no place in particular, just talking things over with her passenger. About 11.30, she made a left turn, cut back across town, and pulled up in front of an address on 108th Street. Her passenger got out, said something, threw her a kiss, and went into the building. After Mrs. Forbes had driven out of sight, I went down to the building the man had entered and looked through the glass door. He was going into an apartment at the end of the hall. I checked the apartment number, 1D. The nameplate on the mailbox outside was Roger Phillips. Now, I don't know Roger Phillips, Dollar. Name's familiar, though. I'll check on it. Where are you? In a drugstore in the corner. Hey. What? Cab just pulled up in front. Of the drugstore? No, no. 953 East. I can see it through the... Hold it. What? I'll call you later, Lieutenant. My man just came out. He's getting into the cab. Goodbye. The cab was two blocks away and turning left by the time I was able to follow. It led me across town to the waterfront in a small, tired saloon named the Blue Toad. I watched while my man paid off his driver, then I followed him into the dive. The Blue Toad was one room, a few tables and a bar. The customers were off the waterfront, seamen, stevedores, and bums with saltwater faces and an occasional tattoo. The air smelled like stale beer, live bait, and bad tobacco. I watched my man cut his way through the heavy blue haze and sit down. Another man sat at the table, a short man with a dark face. I found a table near the door, gave my order to a waiter with a crusty apron, and relaxed to see what was going to happen. Hello. Huh? Oh. You alone? Oh. Yeah, but uh, I'm... Uh... Buy me a drink, huh? Sure. Well, what will it be? Champagne. Huh. Doesn't that get a laugh? Was it supposed to? Well, if I was a nice-looking guy, wearing a nice-looking suit, and I just walked into this dump, and a dame like me ordered champagne, I... Oh, forget it. I was just trying to start a conversation. You started it. I work on a percentage. Buy me a scotch and I'll leave you alone. Relax. I'm not expecting anybody. Thanks. You got any influence with the waiter? I ordered a drink ten minutes ago. He's probably out in the alley. It's not well. About this time of night, he can't stand the smoke and goes out to stock up on fresh air. He'll be right back. What's your name? Jane. Yours should be, um, Mike. Or Bill. Yeah, you look kind of like a Mike. Why? I don't know. Feeling you get when you look at some people. Some people look like certain names. It's Johnny. Johnny? Doesn't fit? I guess so. Who are you watching, Johnny? What makes you think I'm watching somebody? Because you are. You've been watching those two guys in the back. Okay. Cop? Uh-uh. The good-looking one just passed him me a bundle of money. You know the little dark guy? Forget it, huh? Tell me about Timmy. Tell me about Johnny. I'm not a cop. Nope. A cop would know all about Timmy. The good-looking one's leaving. I'm interested in Timmy. In Timmy or the money he just got? Both. You're not a stick-up man, Johnny. Not a bit. I'd like to help, but Timmy finds out about things. Timmy's a bad boy. Hasn't got a friend in the world. <laughs> Not even me. You leaving? Yeah. Oh, here. Buy some champagne. Thanks. Bye, Johnny. Outside, the air was fresh and clean. I got into my car, lit a cigarette, and waited for the dark little man named Timmy to come out. In about five minutes, he did. He crossed the street and climbed into a car. He drove west, and I followed. About ten blocks later, I stopped and watched Timmy park in an all-night garage, then crossed to a hotel called the Bayview. He went in. I found a phone and called Lieutenant Parkhill. Jimmy? About five feet nine, dark complexion, dresses a little too sharp. Hmm. Jimmy Collins. Now, what about him? Bad boy. Yeah, so I've heard. Assassin. 
but nobody's been able to prove it. I didn't even know he was in town. He shouldn't be. Why not? Oh, it was an old rap. Forgery. Huh. You find anything on Roger Phillips? Oh, uh, yeah. Socialite playboy. Makes the columns about once or twice a week. Never very flattering. Does he know Mrs. Forbes? Oh, he might. Runs around in that circle. He's been in town for about a year now. He comes from... What's the matter? Hmm. Just gonna say he comes from Cleveland. Yeah? Just remembered. So does Timmy Collins. Did you check on Phillips in Cleveland? Now the kickback hasn't come in yet. Won't get it till tomorrow morning. Only thing we've got on him here is what I've already told you. What are you going to do about Timmy? Let him alone for a while. Stake out the hotel, see what he's up to. What are you going to do? Go back to my hotel and get some sleep. I'm bushed. And I'll talk to you in the morning. Yeah. Expense account item four, $2.65. Breakfast the next morning with Lieutenant Parkhill at a waffle shop across the street from the precinct. Roger Phillips skipped Cleveland owing a lot of money. The Cleveland report gives him a clean police record, but one thing's pretty interesting. Most of the money he owed was for gambling debts. Owed it to Timmy Collins. Huh. Unless we've wandered too far out in left field, I got a hunch Timmy killed Forbes. Met him on that lonely road by the cliffs and gave him a shove. Yeah, I have the same hunch. Mrs. Forbes falls for Phillips, and together they plan to eliminate the husband. Phillips makes a deal with Timmy, maybe agrees to give him a big interest on the debt when he marries Mrs. Forbes and gets his hands into all that money. Does Phillips have enough money to pay for a job like that? Well, if he doesn't, he probably borrowed it from Mrs. Forbes. It was a big stack of bills. Why don't you check with Mrs. Forbes' banks and see if she withdrew a large amount in the last couple of days? All yeah, right. Oh, want some more coffee? No, I think I'll make a call on Roger Phillips. Maybe I can force this thing out in the open. What are you going to tell him? Enough to scare him, get him into action. When people get frightened, they get careless. Yeah, but they can get dangerous, too. You watch yourself. Oh, like a hawk. <laughs> Roger Phillips was still sleeping when I knocked on the door. I kept pounding till he opened it and squinted at me through puffy eyes. I introduced myself and he showed me into a well-furnished small apartment. He put on some coffee, lit a cigarette, and sat down on the couch. Well, it's a little early for me, uh, Mr. Uh, Dollar. Yeah. Sit down. The coffee won't take long. You're an insurance investigator. That's right. Well, I don't understand it. What do you want to talk to me about? Mrs. Forbes. Mrs. Forbes? You know her, don't you? Mrs. Forbes. Well, I know one Mrs. Forbes, a casual... I'm not going to play with you, Phillips. I'm talking about the Mrs. Forbes who picked you up last night and gave you a large amount of money. Look, I, I don't know what this is all about. I think you do. I said I didn't. I was in my apartment all last night. Nobody picked me up and certainly nobody gave me any money. You went to a dump called the Blue Toad and you met a man named Get Timmy. out of here. You're in big trouble, friend. I know all about Cleveland and Timmy Collins and Mrs. Forbes. And I think when Mrs. Forbes finds out about the deal you made with Timmy, she'll tell me everything. We'll see each other again. Oh, uh, your coffee's boiling. Well, I'd given him the bait. A lot of hunches, but from his reaction, I was sure I'd scored. I went downstairs, crossed the street to the drugstore, waited five minutes to give Roger enough time to make his calls, then I slid into the phone booth and made a call of my own. Yes, sir. Mr. Forbes' residence. William, this is Mr. Dollar. Oh, oh yes, sir, Mr. Dollar. I, I was just going to call you, sir. Did Mrs. Forbes just receive a call? Yes, sir, just a moment ago. It was from the same man. She's going to meet him. Meet him? Where? By the cliffs. <laughs> Phillips had taken the bait. Only two people could implicate him in Forbes' murder, Mrs. Forbes and Timmy, and he'd called Mrs. Forbes to meet him by the cliffs. I put in another call to Lieutenant Parkhill. Yeah, that's right, Johnny. The stakeout has a tap on Timmy's phone. Phillips just called him, said to pick him up as soon as he could. Phillips told Timmy there was trouble, that some guy named Dollar had found out about the whole setup. <laughs> Shame on you. We want to stop a couple killings. We better get right out there. Couple of killings. Sure. Phillips lets Timmy take care of Mrs. Forbes, then he takes care of Timmy. It's the only way he can protect himself. 
I'll pick you up in five minutes. Oh, by the way, uh, I checked with the bank. Mrs. Forbes made a withdrawal day before yesterday. Ten thousand dollars. The lieutenant was as good as his word. In five minutes, he pulled his squad car up in front of the drugstore, and I got in. Now, you want to wait for Timmy to pick up Phillips and then tail him? Now, we know where they're going. Better if we get there ahead of time. Right. The drive was fast. We swung off the main road on the island and headed up the private one to the Forbes estate at about 2.30 in the afternoon. Halfway to the house, we spotted Mrs. Forbes walking along the road by the cliffs. We stopped. She looked startled as we got out. Hello, Mrs. Forbes. Good afternoon, Mr. Dollar. You've met Lieutenant Parkhill. Mm -hmm. Yes, hello, Lieutenant. I was just taking a walk. To meet Roger Phillips. I beg your pardon. Oh, we know all about it, Mrs. Forbes. All about what, Lieutenant? Your husband's death. Who killed him? Why he was killed. I'm afraid I don't understand. My husband was... Roger Phillips will be along any minute. The man he paid to kill your husband will be with him. I think he intends to kill you. This is the most ridiculous... Mrs. Forbes. Roger Phillips left Cleveland owing a large gambling debt to a hoodlum named Timmy Collins. Last night you picked up Mr. Phillips and gave him $10,000, which he in turn gave to Collins. And we think he made another deal with Timmy. After he married you, he could pay off his gambling debt with interest. Might as well tell us about it, Mrs. Forbes. He doesn't care about you. You and Timmy are the only ones that can implicate him. And he's on his way here right now to see that you don't. I don't believe you. Well, then find out for yourself. We'll duck the car behind those trees and give you plenty of protection when he gets here. Find out for yourself. Parkhill drove the car off the road behind the trees, stayed hidden, and waited for Phillips and Timmy. Mrs. Forbes stood quietly looking out to sea, her hands at her sides, bunched into small fists. She stood like that, not moving, even as the car came down the road, heading right for her. She turned and saw the car bearing down on her and picking up speed, and then she knew we weren't lying. But still, she didn't move, and the lieutenant and I went to work. The car was about 50 yards away when we stepped into the road. Timmy was driving and saw us the same instant Phillips did and tried to put on the brakes as we raised our guns. <laughs> Oh, what a mess. Yeah. I'm sorry it worked out that way. He was going to kill me, wasn't he? He sure was. You want to tell us about it? Oh, yeah. It doesn't make much difference now, does it? No. I'm afraid it doesn't. <laughs> Expense account item five, twenty-five dollars and eighty-eight cents, car rental and gas. Expense account items six and seven, ninety-three dollars and seventy-five cents, hotel bill, train fare, and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, one hundred and forty-eight dollars and forty-eight cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley's Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Always keep some handy for refreshing taste 
plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Larry Thor, Jack Moyles, Bob Griffin, Mary Jane Croft, and Jean Howell. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood John Lund